human atmosphere or how to make the aura visible with chemical screens. Walter John Keelner. London, 1911, Revman Limited. Forward. The perception of the human atmosphere or aura solely with the help of material means immediately calls this physical phenomenon into question. From the first moment of observing the human aura, I decided to investigate the subject outside of all occultism, and in order to remain open-minded, I did not read any books on aura until the auras of a large number of patients, more than 60, were examined by me. Since all descriptions and references to aura that could be found were all without exception in occult works, they provided little help for physical research. So I decided not to make any judgments about the early works on aura. This decision puts me in a specific position, expressed in the non-recognition of authoritative sources, which on the one hand is an advantage, and on the other hand is a disadvantage. The title of the book, The Human Atmosphere, is the happy inspiration of a friend, and is particularly appropriate to the subject because the title conveys a clear idea to the reader, while the term aura, despite its definition as any subtle, invisible emission, miasma, or the evaporation of a substance like the scent of flowers, etc. Webster's Dictionary is a hackneyed term, and at the same time people with little knowledge of the occult. The word aura has, however, been retained for brevity and convenience, while the word atmosphere will be misleading when used alone, but when it is combined with the word human it is better understood. After having said the desire to be completely free from the occult, it may seem strange that the expression etheric double is used. This name was borrowed from the theosophical books, since no other term has yet been invented. Walter D. Keelner. 218, Ladbroke Grove, London. 1911G. Chapter I. Aura of a Healthy Person. Hardly one in 10,000 people knows that he is surrounded by a kind of haze, inseparably connected with the body, regardless of whether he is standing or awake, hot or cold, which, although invisible under normal circumstances, can be visible when these conditions are favorable. This haze, the prototype of the halo or halo, constantly depicted around the saints, was visible by some people with especially fine eyes, who came to be called clairvoyants. This cloud, or atmosphere, or, as it is usually called, aura, is the theme of this treatise, since this cloud can be made visible through double glass screens filled with a special solution. We immediately declare that we do not in any way pretend to be clairvoyant, and we are not occultists either. We especially want to convince our readers. Since only a few have the ability to see the aura, and ordinary people do not have the opportunity to confirm or deny this, then all sorts of deceptions can take place. This has been the case until now, and this topic has always been viewed with suspicion, but now the method we have developed for observing the human aura is no more quackery than when looking at microbes with a microscope. The main difference is that some people consider themselves to be able to see the aura, since they have abnormal vision, but no one has taken the liberty of claiming that they have the ability to see an object one thousandth of a millimeter long without any instruments. There can be not the slightest doubt about the reality of the existence of the aura that envelopes human beings, and it will not be long before this fact becomes generally recognized, when anyone with normal vision can see it. It would be really strange if the aura did not change depending on the conditions, and we firmly believe that studying its changes will show how important they will be for diagnosing diseases. We must ask our readers for leniency for a few personal comments. Everything that this book claims to be fact is true. But we know that enthusiasm and imagination tend to lead astray from the true research path, and therefore, as far as possible, we have tried not to exaggerate random phenomena. In one part of our book, this is the most difficult, because so much depends on subjective vision. However, it will be fair to add that vision is our most perfect sense, and therefore, perhaps we are able to distinguish objects at more than an average level, and we can get consequences that other observers did not pay attention to. One might think that some conclusions are too dogmatic, and perhaps this is correct, 
since they are based on such a small number of experiments. But what speaks in our favor that they were made public as working hypotheses to aid in future observations. The invention of a screen capable of making an aura visible was by no means accidental. When we read about the phosphorescent effect of N-rays on calcium sulfide 1, we have been experimenting with the mechanical energies of certain emanations of the body for some time, and have come to the conclusion that we have found two more energies besides thermal and that these energies act in the infrared part of the spectrum. This was the impetus for our experiments, and in early 1908 we suggested that certain dyes might help us. After studying the properties of various dyes, we experimented on several of them, but focused on one, which in this treatise will be called spectroronine to spectroronine. He is probably the most suitable. We had to wait for a while before we could get it, and one day it occurred to us that this substance could make some of the above energies visible. And if it turns out as we expected, then it will be a human aura. We had previously heard about this phenomenon, but up to this point we had never had the intention of investigating it, since we believed that it was not in our natural strength. When we got the chemical, we made glass screens and coated them with colloid and gelatin painted in it, but all this turned out to be completely useless due to immediate decomposition. Then we tried a celluloid solution called Xaponovi varnish. This gave the best result, but after a few hours it also lost its color. Then, alcohol solutions of various concentrations were used to work with glass screens. It would seem that they completely satisfied our requirements, but after a while a color change was noticed, even if they were stored in the dark. As a rule, only two screens are needed, one containing a weak alcoholic solution of the spectroronine dye, three and the second, the same, but less diluted. Four, we tried other solutions of various concentrations, without or with the addition of other dyes, but they were used for the purpose of setting up the experiment under different conditions. These screens are not needed for normal operation. However, another type of screen will be useful for identifying individual parts of the aura, which will be described below. As soon as the screen was ready for work, we looked through it at each other and immediately saw a grayish cloud around the head and hands. We considered that it could not be anything other than an aura. A few minutes later, we were surprised to find that we continued to see the aura without the screen. This ability did not last long. However, we were able to get it again after looking through the screen at the light for several seconds. It is interesting to note that the ability to see an aura without a screen is by no means exceptional and usually only lasts a short time. During this period, every free moment was used to conduct various experiments with the screen to perceive the aura. Unfortunately, we discovered that dyes are harmful to our eyes. After the experiments, they were so sick that we had to stop working for several days. Because of this, we strongly recommend that all experimenters look through the spectroronine screen intermittently. Obviously, the influence of spectroronine is accumulating, and therefore we gradually gain the ability to observe the aura without a screen. Ultimately, our eyes became so adapted that under the right conditions we could do without a screen. However, we considered it necessary to look at light through a colored screen before observing, and even then we sometimes found that the aura was better seen through the screen. In other cases, the change brings good results, although the conditions should be similar to these two cases. An aura can only be clearly detected when certain conditions are met. The light shouldn't be too bright. The required amount must be determined for each experiment, and depends on whether the screen is used or not. On preliminary examination, the observer must get used to the darkness. Light is needed diffused, coming from one side and illuminating the patient evenly from all sides. Of course, it is most convenient when the observer stands with his back to the darkened window and the patient is facing him. An alternative method can be used if the room is large enough open and the only one that can be used in the patient's home. This method is to have a folding portable X-shaped dark tent similar to those used for photography, 
except that it should be made of black material instead of the usual yellow material, and the front curtains should be removed. The tent is set up with its back to the window, and the patient stands inside so that he is evenly illuminated. All windows in the room, as well as the back of the tent, should be completely darkened, which is achieved by setting the darkening curtains to the desired position. The main obstacle to such an attitude is that the observer must look against the light, which is not very convenient for viewing all parts of the aura, and which is especially not suitable for observations associated with additional aura colors, as described below. It is sometimes possible to place the tent with the open side in front of the window in the patient's home. When this is done, the inspection appears to be much easier. At the same time, it is important to have a black background behind the tent. Most of our research was done in a small room with one window. This window was located at the top and was equipped with the usual blackout shades, which were operated from below. They were made of black serge. 5. The serge fabric allows a significant amount of light to pass through the windows, which is sufficient except on very dark days. The amount of light can also be adjusted by closing the curtains. The two shades are very convenient as a small gap of light can be left between them to brighten the room a bit when the patient is viewed through a dark crimson screen and also when complementary colors are used. Opposite the window, at a distance of approximately two and a half meters, a portable crossbar is installed, on which is hung a black and white cloth for the background, either of which can be used as needed. A white background is required for some observations, which will be described below. These are all the measures that are required for the job. There is one more point to bear in mind, namely that the patient should stand about 30 centimeters from the background material so that shadows on the background material cannot produce any optical illusions and thus distort the observation. Trouble of this kind may well occur if the observer is just beginning to become familiar with the work. While the patient is in the proper position, the observer takes a dark screen and looks through it at the light for half a minute or longer. This procedure will affect his vision for a long time, so he will not have to repeat this action often. However, repetition can be done as soon as the need arises. Then the room darkens and adjusts the light. The observer stands with his back to the window and opposite the patient, and looks at him through a pale screen. The observer should immediately see or, if he is not used to this work, after a few seconds a faint cloud enveloping the patient, which has different characteristics depending on the health and individual characteristics of the patient. If the observer has already learned to see the aura without the help of the screen, then usually he will see it with faint shades of blue tones. At the beginning of the examination, it is desirable that the patient first face the observer and the light. The aura around the head will be best seen when the subject is standing or sitting with arms extended to the sides. The width of the aura can be roughly determined by estimating the distance that the aura extends to the sides of the shoulders. It is necessary to compare the distance of the aura on the sides, because in case of illness on one side the aura will be narrower than on the other. In this position, the patient should pay attention to the general shape of the aura, because when the arms are lowered, the shape of the aura is often different from the position when the arms are raised to the sides. During long-term examination, the patient can put his hands behind the neck so that the observer can examine the person's aura from the armpit down along the torso, to the thighs, and further to the legs. This is the most suitable position to determine the shape and size of the aura. It is necessary to determine whether the aura follows the contour of the body, how wide is the aura at the places of narrowing of the body, and how far the aura goes down to the bottom of the body, and where it narrows, in order to finally end. To achieve such a visibility of the aura is not possible in an ordinary way, but only with the help of screens. Sometimes the aura can be divided into two or, very rarely, into three distinct parts. But the precise definition of these divisions is best deferred until a later stage of examination. Once all the information regarding the shape of the aura has been obtained, the patient should stand sideways so that his aura can be examined from the front and back. If any suspicion arises of unequal illumination of the aura, this should be, 
in addition to the previous examination, immediately eliminated by turning the patient completely to ensure that the aura is illuminated equally in all positions. If so, it means that a lot of bugs have been fixed. The aura envelopes the entire human body, but due to the subtlety of its structure and its transparency, it can be seen in places. Therefore, when the observer wishes to investigate the aura, originating from one place, he must turn the patient at different angles so that the silhouette of this place is viewed against the background. In general, if the shape of the aura is the only thing required, then it can be established when the patient first stands in front of the observer, and then sideways, and no other position is required. The description of the further process of examining the aura should be postponed for now. Examination of many people in good health reveals not only individual differences, as expected, but also the existence of gender-specific auras. Men, regardless of age, have similar characteristics of the aura, if you do not take into account individual characteristics, since no two people are alike. This is exactly the case in women, because their auras undergo a great change in shape at some time in their lives. In childhood, the aura of girls coincides almost completely with the aura of boys. In adolescence, from 12 to 13 years old to 18 to 20 years old, the aura of a teenage girl gradually changes from a masculine type to that of an adult woman. Examination of the men reveals an aura equally enveloping the head and extending approximately 5 centimeters further than the width of the shoulders. When a man stands in front of the observer, and with his arms raised to the sides, the aura will be narrower near his body than around his head. In this place, the aura usually does not exceed more than 10 to 12 centimeters in width, or, roughly speaking, 1 15th of his height. When the man turns sideways, it can be seen that from the side of the back his aura is as wide as from the sides of the body when he was standing in front. The aura has the same size in front. If you look at the bottom of the body, then in almost all cases it can be established that the aura has almost the same width as that of the body, and only sometimes the aura at the legs narrows slightly. The aura around the arms is slightly wider than around the legs. A girl aged 12 or 13 has the same aura as boys. However, the structure of her aura is usually more subtle than that of the male. Therefore, sometimes in girls it is difficult to distinguish the edge of the auric cloud. In a similar manner, but not to the same extent, the auras of young boys can also be subtle. And this subtlety of the structure of children's auras hinders observation. When studying the aura of an adult woman, a characteristic change is already clearly visible. If a woman is facing the observer with her hands up, the dissimilarity is immediately noticeable. On the sides of the torso, the woman's aura is much wider than that of men, and it expands to the level of the waist, where the width of the aura reaches its greatest size. From the waist, the aura goes down, and at the mid-thigh level, it narrows, and then follows the contour of the legs and feet. When a woman is standing sideways, it can be seen that her aura is much wider in the back of her body than in the front. The widest part of the aura is often observed at the level of the seat. As it descends towards the legs, the aura narrows and follows the contour of the legs. In front of the torso, the aura follows the contour of the body, being slightly wider in the chest and abdomen. In these places, the auric fog is more pronounced, which obviously depends on the functional activity of the glands, since this is most obvious during pregnancy and lactation, but sometimes the same is seen just before or after the monthly female cycles. When the adolescence aura is fully developed, further maturation does not produce any change in the aura, and only the disease can make its own adjustments. Figures 9 to 13 show auras of women in full health. Among the displayed auras of healthy women, you can see many cases different from the above examples. The differences lie in the different widths near the body, as well as where the aura narrows at the bottom of the body when the aura follows the contours of the legs. In the back of the body of women, changes in the width of the aura are most frequent and varied. The differences in auras are mainly due to the different widths of the aura and the place of its narrowing at the bottom of the body. 
In one person, the outer edge of the auric cloud is clearly visible from the level of the shoulders to the seat, and from there down along the contour of the body. In another person, the aura is clearly visible only at the seat, from where it descends to the middle of the thigh, or to the ground. Sometimes the aura extends from head to toe without following the contours of the body at all. We consider the form of such an aura to be the most perfect. Any deviation from this perfect form is due to insufficient development. The greatest width of the aura in women is around the waist, there it reaches the size of 20 to 25 centimeters. The average width of the female aura is usually within 15 to 17 centimeters. But in some rare cases, it can reach 30 or more centimeters. See Fig. 9, 11, 18. As a girl approaches the age of puberty, her aura begins to change, which lasts for 4 to 6 years, after which the aura takes on the final form of an adult woman. The change in aura does not usually begin before the onset of a woman's menstrual cycle, but never before the body has begun to develop. Exceptions are sometimes encountered. For example, a 14-year-old girl, case 9, figs. 7 and 8, had the above transitional aura, but did not have a period for 6 months after the examination. The youngest girl who showed an increase in aura was 13 and a half years old, she was a well-developed child for her age, but suffered from epileptic seizures. Six months earlier, she had an undefined aura. Three other girls of 14, one of 15, four girls of 16, one of 17, and one, 19 years old, had auras in a transitional state, while two other girls, 18 years old, had already fully formed their auras. One short, weak girl, almost 17 years old, who had never had a period, retained a completely childish form of an aura, which, however, was clearly visible. On the other hand, a tall, well-built young woman, 25 years old, who had a dystrophic uterus and only four menses in her life, three years ago, had a very different aura, much larger than the average aura. Another woman, 42 years old, whose both ovaries had been removed 16 years ago, had a distinct aura, the width of which was medium on the sides of the torso, and the back and front of the torso was especially wide. While two other girls of 18 have already fully formed their auras. One short, weak girl, almost 17 years old, who had never had a period, retained a completely childish form of an aura, which, however, was clearly visible. On the other hand, a tall, well-built young woman, 25 years old, who had a dystrophic uterus and only four menses in her life, three years ago, had a very different aura, much larger than the average aura. Another woman, 42 years old, whose both ovaries had been removed 16 years ago, had a distinct aura, the width of which was medium on the sides of the torso, and the back and front of the torso was especially wide while two other girls of 18 have already fully formed their auras. One short, weak girl, almost 17 years old, who had never had a period, retained a completely childish form of an aura, which, however, was clearly visible. On the other hand, a tall, well-built young woman, 25 years old, who had a dystrophic uterus and only four menses in her life, three years ago, had a very different aura, much larger than the average aura. Another woman, 42 years old, whose both ovaries had been removed 16 years ago, had a distinct aura, the width of which was medium on the sides of the torso, and the back and front of the torso was especially wide. Having never had menstruation, she retained a completely childish form of the aura, which, however, was clearly visible. On the other hand, a tall, well-built young woman, 25 years old, who had a dystrophic uterus and only four menses in her life, three years ago, had a very different aura, much larger than the average aura. Another woman, 42 years old, whose both ovaries had been removed 16 years ago, had a distinct aura, the width of which was medium on the sides of the torso, and the back and front of the torso was especially wide. 
Having never had menstruation, she retained a completely childish form of the aura, which, however, was clearly visible. On the other hand, a tall, well-built young woman, 25 years old, who had a dystrophic uterus and only four menses in her life, three years ago, had a very different aura, much larger than the average aura. Another woman, 42 years old, whose both ovaries had been removed 16 years ago, had a distinct aura, the width of which was medium on the sides of the torso, and the back and front of the torso was especially wide. Possessed a very distinct aura, much larger than the average aura. Another woman, 42 years old, whose both ovaries had been removed 16 years ago, had a distinct aura, the width of which was medium on the sides of the torso, and the back and front of the torso was especially wide. Possessed a very different aura, much larger than the average aura. Another woman, 42 years old, whose both ovaries had been removed 16 years ago, had a distinct aura, the width of which was medium on the sides of the torso, and the back and front of the torso was especially wide. There can be no doubt about the expansion of the female aura during adolescence, but the reasons for this fact remain unclear. Whether the expansion of the aura is due to the functional maturation of the sexual organs, or there are some other factors, remains unclear. But much can be confidently stated, as will be shown below. For example, women's monthly cycles have a noticeable effect on the aura, while during early pregnancy, changes in the aura are very small. During the later period of pregnancy, there is a large expansion of the aura in front of the chest and lower abdomen, but these changes are temporary. This topic will be discussed later. For the sake of simplicity and to avoid unnecessary repetition in the above description, the aura was considered as if it were a simple phenomenon, while in reality the aura is a complex phenomenon. Its elements will be fully considered below, but for now it will suffice to say that the aura can be divided into three parts. First from the body comes a narrow translucent layer, which has a dark shade, which very often smoothly passes into the second layer of the aura. The first layer of the aura resembles a dark strip, no thicker than one centimeter. This layer surrounds the entire body, without any change in size in any part of the body. This layer will be called the etheric double. The second layer is the inner aura. This is the densest part of it and it varies relatively little in width. Behind the torso, in front, on the sides, in both men and women, this layer follows the contour of the body. This layer is located only behind the etheric double, but very often it seems as if this second layer is almost touching the body. The third layer, or outer aura, begins at the outer edge of the inner aura. The third layer of the aura is very variable in size. Until now, the outer edge of this third layer of the aura has been shown with a dashed line in order to depict the outline of the aura. When the aura is observed through the pale blue spectro auronine screen, all parts of the aura appear to be mixed together, and only near the body is the densest part of the aura noted. However, if you take a carmine screen, then each of the layers will be very different. And if you look through the same carmine screen, but with a rather dense layer of solution, then the external aura will not be visible. What follows are descriptions of typical auras of people in good health. Descriptions start from early infancy and continue through seniority. Men first, then women. Case 1. A. A lovely, healthy baby at the age of 15 hours. Was examined when he was laid on a black cloth spread over his mother's bed. Despite the unfavorable circumstances, his aura was clearly visible. The color of the aura was gray with a tint of yellow. As far as could be seen, the aura followed the outline of the body. This is the smallest child whose aura we have examined, and it is interesting to note that both the mother and the nurse were able to see the cloud around him if they looked through our screen. When this child reached the age of four months, he was examined again under more suitable conditions, the infant was placed on a sofa covered with black cloth. The child's aura had the same shape, following the contour of the body, being about three centimeters wide, except for the part of the aura around the head, 
where the aura was wider. The color of the aura changed to dark blue-gray. Case 2, B, healthy male infant, 4 months old, was examined by placing it on a black cloth, like the background behind it. Its aura was easily detected, being bluish-gray in color. An outer aura was seen approximately 3 centimeters wide around his body and limbs, but on the sides of his head, the aura was slightly wider than the width of his shoulders. When examined through a dark carmine screen, the inner aura was clearly visible and was 2 to 3 centimeters wide, showing a distinct streak. Fig. 1. Aura of a healthy boy. Fig. 2. Aura of a healthy boy. Case 3. Fig. 1 and 2. C. A strong and healthy boy of 5 who has never had any serious illness. When he stood facing the observer, his outer aura around his head was about 15 centimeters. Down to the body, the aura narrowed by about 2 centimeters, and then around the hips and legs, the aura narrowed even more. One could clearly distinguish the inner aura, which was almost 5 centimeters wide near the head and torso, and 3 centimeters around the legs. When the boy stood sideways, it was seen that the outer aura was 5 centimeters wide in the front and 4 centimeters in the back, and it decreased slightly downward. Behind the torso, the outer aura was 6 centimeters wide, and in the area of the legs it decreased slightly, where also the inner aura decreased by 1 centimeter. The color of the aura was blue-gray. It must be said. Case 4. D. A boy of 14 years old, quite tall for his age absolutely healthy. His aura was clearly visible, and had a bluish-gray color. When he stood in front of the observer, his outer aura around his head was about 18 centimeters wide, and near his body, about 10 centimeters, and below, about 9 centimeters. The inner aura was 5 centimeters wide all over the body. The etheric double was clearly visible, and had a width of about 3 to 4 millimeters. When the boy stood sideways, the outer aura from the shoulders to the seat was about 8 centimeters, which was quite a lot for men. In front, the aura was 7 centimeters wide, invariably following down to the feet. Fig. 3. The aura of a healthy, slender man. Fig. 4. The aura of a healthy, slender man. Case 5. Fig. 3 and 4. E. Well-developed male, 33 years old. He had a harmonious constitution and good health. His aura was blue with a touch of gray. An outer aura surrounded his head at a distance that was slightly more than the width of his shoulders. Near his torso, arms, legs, the outer aura was about 13 centimeters wide. The inner aura was extremely well marked and was approximately 8 centimeters wide. The streak of the inner aura was remarkably easy to see. When the man stood sideways, the inner aura was the same width in front as in the back, but the outer aura was slightly narrower in front. The etheric twin was clearly defined at a width of approximately 6 millimeters. The whole aura in its structure was unusually coarse. Case 6, F. A one-week-old girl was examined while she was lying on a bed on a black cloth. The external conditions were extremely unfavorable, but with little difficulty, the aura was still seen as a greenish mist that followed the outline of the body. The width of the aura was very narrow, but around the head the aura increased slightly, as expected. When this baby reached the age of four months, the same age compared to Boye. From case one, she was examined a second time under better conditions. This time the girl's aura was also very difficult to see. Around her entire body, the aura was about one and a half centimeters wide, and a little more in the head area. The most interesting thing was that the color of the aura changed from greenish, observed at a week of age, to gray. K7 G, a fragile, excitable girl, four years old, was rather young for her years, but was completely healthy. This girl was observed in January 1910. 
She had a very extensive aura for her age and body size. The outer aura was 8 centimeters wide all over her body, except for the encirclement around her head, where her aura extended to almost 13 centimeters. The inner aura strip was also clearly visible, and it was about 7 centimeters wide. The color of the aura was blue. Fig. 5. Aura of a healthy girl. Fig. 6. Aura of a healthy girl. Case 8. Fig. 5 and 6. H. A strong, healthy girl, 7 years old, has never had any disease. The color of her aura was blue. When she stood facing the observer, her outer aura around her head was 22 centimeters. Near her torso, the outer aura was 8 centimeters, gradually tapering towards the lower extremities. When she stood sideways, her outer aura was 5 centimeters in front and 8 centimeters in the back at its widest point. Decreasing to the feet, the outer aura narrowed to 5 centimeters. The inner aura was 5 centimeters around the head and torso, and about 3 centimeters at the legs. The aura did not detect any rays. Fig. 7. Healthy girl, transitional aura. Fig. 8. Healthy girl, transitional aura. Case 9. Fig. 7 and 8. I. This example is extremely interesting, since we were allowed to examine this girl from time to time, and thus the opportunity was presented to follow the growth of her aura during the various periods of her youth. In October 1908 she was examined for the first time. On first examination, this girl was 13 years old and in good health. She developed rapidly, but did not yet have her monthly cycles. Her aura was the same as that of most young girls, about 5 centimeters wide all over her torso, except for the head, where the aura was slightly wider. The color of the aura was blue. After 8 months, this girl has become a small, well-built, full-grown woman, but she has not yet had her period. Her aura has now entered a transitional state. The aura around the head was slightly wider than around the shoulders. Near her torso, the aura was about 10 centimeters wide, and around her thighs and legs, about 8 centimeters. When it became sideways, the aura showed a width of about 8 centimeters behind, and in front, no more than 5 centimeters. March 1910 she grew up a little and became a beautiful girl. At this age of 14 and a half, she was completely healthy. Her first monthly cycle only started a month ago. The aura has increased. The width of the aura was now about 13 centimeters from the head to the hips. When the girl stood facing the observer, the width of the aura was 13 centimeters, narrowing down to 8 centimeters. When it became sideways, the front of the aura was about 8 centimeters wide, while in the back, in the widest part, the aura was about 10 centimeters wide. Going down to the feet, the aura decreased to 8 centimeters. The inner aura was 5 centimeters wide all over the body. The inner aura was easily seen as a distinct streak. The etheric double was also clearly visible. This case is instructive, as the girl retained a childlike aura six months after her physical development began, visible in the external changes in her body. And the aura, in turn, began to develop 12 months before the monthly cycles began. This case is a good example of slowing down the aura change when the aura passes from a child to an adult. Fig. 9. Healthy woman, average aura. Fig. 10. Healthy woman, average aura. Case 10, Fig. 9 and 10. K, a 26-year-old woman, B.S. mother. Her aura was quite average like that of women of her age. When she stood facing the observer, her external aura around her head was 20 centimeters, and when she stretched her arms out to the sides, the external aura near the body was the same size as around the head. In the area of the thighs, the aura began to narrow, 
and in the area of the legs it was about 8 centimeters wide. The inner aura had a constant width of 8 centimeters throughout the body. The inner aura was clearly visible in the form of a clear strip. On the right side of the head, the aura was brighter and shaped as if it were a wide, faint beam. It started from the shoulders and went up to just above the head. When the woman stood sideways, the outer aura in front was 8 centimeters, while in the back of the body the aura reached 10 centimeters at its widest part. The color of the aura was gray with a slight blue tint. Fig. 11. Healthy woman, very good aura. Fig. 12. Healthy woman, very good aura. Case 11, Fig. 11 and 12. L. A well-built woman of 30, was always full of strength and health, had a natural disposition and a kind character. Her aura was blue, one of the most beautiful shades we have observed in our entire practice. When she stood facing the observer, her aura was oval in shape. The outer aura around the head and body reached 30 centimeters, gradually decreasing towards the legs, where at the level of the ankles the aura was 13 centimeters wide. The absolute edge of the aura was difficult to determine. There was such an impression that behind the visible end of the external aura there was still a layer of auric fog that was imperceptible to our eyes. We do not think that this was an optical illusion, because this effect was observed by us in other cases as well. We call these cases the ultra-outer aura. When she stood sideways, her outer aura was about 13 centimeters from top to bottom. In the back of the body, the outer aura at shoulder level was about 13 centimeters wide, then it expanded in the lumbar region to 20 centimeters, and at the ankles the aura was about 10 centimeters. The inner aura was the same width all over the body, 8 centimeters. The etheric double was about 6 millimeters wide. Dot fig. 13. Aura of a healthy woman. Case 12, fig. 13. M, married woman, 25 years of age. The shape of her aura was quite common for a woman of her age. She had, however, two rays going up and down from each shoulder. The beam on the left side radiated near the armpit and continued downward. The color of her aura was gray-blue. There was also a small ray coming from a small fibroadenoid tumor on the chest. The inner aura was about 8 centimeters wide all over the body. Since heredity plays a very important role in determining the qualities of many elements of the human body, it would be extremely strange if heredity was not reflected in the characteristics of the aura. This piece of research will, of course, require long and numerous observations before this question can be accurately clarified. But even the few cases of observations of two or more individuals from the same family, which we have already studied, show that this assumption is quite true. It is quite easy to compare the auras of adults with one another when these people are of the same sex. But difficulties begin when a comparison has to be made between a man and a woman, since the masculine aura is very dissimilar to the feminine. And for the same reason, comparisons between the aura of a woman and the aura of a child are difficult. In fact, the only method is. For this purpose, it will be necessary to introduce some standards. The patient's height has no effect on the width of the aura. Therefore, it is impossible to introduce a standard linking a person's height and the breadth of his aura. In addition, it must be remembered that children, in proportion to their height, have relatively wider auras than adults. These deviations must be taken into account, although in these cases you can find similar deviations in other members of the family. After we did not find a clear relationship between the patient's height and the width of his aura, we were left with one available way to obtain the required standard, although it is not very optimal. We decided to arbitrarily set the boundaries of the average aura parameters, and take any deviations from this value as incorrect. Taking this principle as a standard, all auras can be divided into three divisions, broad aura, medium aura, and narrow aura. The standard parameters for the female aura will lie within 20 to 25 centimeters, measuring the aura at its widest part near the torso. 
The standard for men can be taken in the range from 8 to 12 centimeters, and for children, from 6 to 8 centimeters. Since the auras of teenage girls change every month, they need to be considered in particular, as there is no hard and fast rule here. The above standards for the sizes of auras were determined purely empirically, and not by theoretical reasoning. Although this rule seems very simple, in practice it was not easy to decide which aura to classify where. One example. Suppose the woman had a slightly larger aura near her torso than the standard aura. But in the area of the thighs and legs, the aura is below average, in fact, being a hysterical type of aura. Where should this aura be placed? This example should be considered based on the characteristics of the aura. The next two tables contain case studies of people who were members of the same family. The first table contains cases where families from two generations are presented together. Six the second table brings together one generation. That is, the same people are included in both tables, but they are grouped differently. Since character is one of the inherited traits, it becomes almost clear that young children did inherit their parental auras. There are only small changes in the inherited aura in various parameters, which will be kept more or less unchanged throughout their life, if the disease does not make its own changes. Because of what has been said above about heredity, it might be expected that the auras of mobile and intelligent, young, and trained children are broader than those of dull and phlegmatic children. The latter are in the minority. With adults, the situation is the same, but a little more subtle. Auras envelop both the most intelligent people and the most expressionless, dull, poorly educated people. The aura of the latter is simply impossible to see around their bodies, but only a small auric cloud surrounds their heads. And this case is more common among men than women. The auras surrounding women are much more volatile. The most beautiful auras will invariably be found in those people who are naturally intelligent and a little easily excitable, but who have no tendency to neurotic complaints. It may be interesting to note that so far we have observed the largest aura in one normal, healthy woman who was naturally quiet but by no means phlegmatic. In the above descriptions of auras, perfect health is implied, and you also need to remember that. The outer aura is only one part of the question, and the next part of this question, the structure of the aura, is much harder to describe, although it is probably the most important part. It is almost always found that the inner aura is most clearly visible and has the greatest width in those people of both sexes who are in good and good health. But this part of the aura is slightly smaller in weak people, which shows that the internal aura is determined by the physical condition, and not by mental abilities, which are the main prerequisites for the size of the external aura. It is fair to assume that the external aura of men has a coarser structure than that of women. But it should be taken into account that the subtlety and transparency of the aura is considered a higher type of aura than the aura with the rough and dark structure. It will be shown later that the more gray tones are present in the color of the aura, the more joyless and mentally depressed its owner is. Education is the factor that should, in theory, have a huge impact on the aura as an aura-enhancing agent. But the changes in the aura caused by an increase in the level of education are so subtle that they cannot be reliably and immediately noted with the help of our existing research tools. It is extremely likely that these changes will have a beneficial effect through heredity. The influence of heredity and character on the aura is one of the most interesting parts of this study. And at the same time, you do not need to be a prophet to foresee that a rich harvest will be reaped in this direction in the future. Notes, edit. 1. N-rays were discovered by the French physicist at the University of Nancy René Blondelot in 1903. Blondelot found that paper plates coated with calcium sulfide begin to shine if they are brought to certain parts of the body in the dark approximate. Translator. 2. Some friends, who carefully studied the issue, advised to give the real name to the dye we used. We ourselves wish it, only now it is too late to change the term spectroboronine throughout the text, since the book is in print. The real name of the dye is dicyanin. The 
blue dye found in the book simply contains the dicyanide solution, and the red dye contains carmine. These four screens, two for each dye, in different concentrations, approximate. Four is the only thing that is necessary for normal observation of the aura. Obviously, it is difficult to produce thin flat cuvettes, since we could not find anyone in the UK or America to make them, but finally we managed to find a foreign company that could design them. 3. This screen with a low concentration of blue solution of the sensitizer cyan and below is called Kilner Light Screen Approximate. Translator. 4. This screen with a strong concentration of blue solution of the sensitizer dicyanine is referred to below as Kilner Dark Screen Approximate. Translator. 5. Surge, English Surge, will ensue fabric. In this case, we are talking about the curtains on the windows of the room in which the examinations of the aura were carried out approximate. Translator. 6. And in one family, even three. 7. Her aura could be considered wide if she were not too narrow in the hips and legs. Her daughter's aura is slightly below the broad aura. 8. The outer aura of each of these two sisters is wider on the right than on the left. 9. Not wider than usual for her age. 10. Have had one or two epileptic seizures, but not in the past two years. 11. May have a broad aura after two or three years. See attachment. Keelner. Human atmosphere. Chapter 2. Etheric double. Chapter 2. Etheric double. Now is the time to pay attention to the structure of the aura. There is no doubt that the structure of the aura is a complex phenomenon. There are three layers of aura, not including the rather deceiving ultra aura that will be mentioned a little later. As mentioned above, we named these three layers of the aura as follows, the etheric double, the inner aura, the outer aura. Etheric double. When we observed the aura directly, one feature attracted our attention, which was initially regarded as an optical illusion, but upon further investigation it turned out that this phenomenon is a reality. The etheric double, visible through various screens, is a dark stripe adjacent to the outline of the body, separating it from the auric cloud. The etheric double is typically 2 to 5 millimeters wide, rarely more, and the same width is stable around the entire body. The width of the etheric double changes not only in different people, but also in the same person under altered conditions. Sometimes this change is so clear that it can be seen with a simple glance. On the other hand, a very careful study is necessary to determine the etheric double, while a dedicated screen is not often required. In some cases, there is a difficulty in recognizing the etheric double, namely when the inner aura almost touches the body. Even then, final observations with color filters will reveal a difference in the overall structure of the aura. In these experiments we used red, blue, and green filters from Ratten and Wainwright 1, which are used in color photography. In addition to these filters, a yellow filter was also used. The blue filter is too dark and can be replaced with a lighter blue filter. The red filter absorbs the entire spectrum from D2 and to the left, passing only red, orange and yellow. The blue filter transmits the spectrum starting only from G, while the green filter absorbs the entire spectrum, except for the part that lies slightly to the left of D to a place that is approximately halfway between F and G. The yellow filter absorbs the blue and violet colors. All of these results were obtained with a small pocket spectroscope, and only crudely, but still accurate enough for our purpose. For the following experiments, any part of the body can be used, but the most comfortable one is an arm or a hand, since the study takes a long time, longer than the patient wants to remain undressed. While the patient is settling in a comfortable position, it will be desirable for the observer to look at the light through the dark spectronine screen for a minute so that, if possible, he can feel the aura without the intervention of the light screen. The inability to observe the aura without a bright screen does not prevent the observer from performing the following experiments. 
but he should not expect to see details to the same extent if he were able to see without a screen. Of course, for these experiments it will be necessary to select the person whose etheric counterpart has the largest dimensions. But when the below experiments are done, there is no need to repeat them, because there is little help in diagnosing the patient. Experiment 1. In the course of this experiment, the observer, through a blue light filter, examines the patient's hand and hand, which is located in front of a black background. He will see the etheric double as a dark streak that does not have any grooves or granulation. This strip will be in contact with the body and will be quite distinct from the adjacent aura. Experiment 2. It is necessary to replace the black background with white, and adjust the lighting so that the etheric double appears as a dark line. Experiment 3. Instead of a blue filter, you need to take a green one. Against a black background, the ethereal double will be seen as a dark line, but not as clearly as when the blue filter was used. The aura is also visible, but not as distinct. Experiment 4. When the same screens are used, but with a white background and dimmed light, the etheric double is dark in color. Experiment 5. If you use a yellow filter against a black or white background, then the etheric double will still have a dark color. Experiment 6. When investigations are carried out using a dark red light filter, the etheric double is seen as a dark band around the body. With this filter, the ethereal double is seen more clearly than when other color filters are used. Sometimes, instead of an even dark strip, a zigzag, finely granular formation appears. In any case, the etheric double and the inner aura are very different from each other in structure and color, which will be described in the next chapter. Experiment 7. When the etheric double is viewed against a white background through a dark carmine screen, the etheric double will retain its dark hue. When viewed through a light carmine screen with properly adjusted lighting, the ethereal double will have a pink color, quite different from the carmine hue that colors the whole picture when viewed against a white background. When the etheric double is carefully examined, small colored streaks will be seen. The use of color filters was absolutely necessary to detect some elements of the aura, as well as to clarify some of the signs of the aura. A few words about the effect of filters on different colors will be appropriate, although at first glance they may seem elementary. Since all colors behave in exactly the same way as red light, only it will be considered in detail. First, when viewed through a dark red filter, all white objects appear red, red objects appear lighter, and all other colors appear darker. This can be clearly seen by placing a sheet of white paper and a sheet of black paper next to each other in normal daylight, with a strip of moderate red paper between them. When looking at these sheets through a dark red filter, it will be seen that the red paper has lost almost all of its color, but the contrast between it and the black paper will be preserved, and even increase, while the white paper will have a red color. In most cases, an object is capable of absorbing only a limited amount of light, which leads to the fact that, along with the reflection of its own colored rays, there is also a reflection of white light. The hue of the reflected color depends on the proportion of these colored rays to the white light mixed with them. If the white light that is reflected by a colored object has the same rays that are absorbed by that object, then the object will have a darker hue. This is about using color filters. The dark red filter has limited daylight transmission, i.e. it will absorb the west spectrum, except for the red rays that reach the observer's eye. These rays are also limited in their power. In the above experiment, the white paper actually reflects all daylight falling on it. This beam also contains red rays. They are the only rays that are not absorbed by the red filter. Therefore, White paper, when viewed through a red filter, appears in an intense red color. Red paper, if not too dark, reflects red rays mixed with a large proportion of other rays that are absorbed by the red filter. If you look through a dark red filter at red and white papers, they will appear similar, because additional rays emitted by white paper, absorbed by a dark red filter. 
If the dark red filter is replaced with a light red one, then all red rays will be transmitted with the addition of a large number of other rays of the spectrum. It should be borne in mind that this light red filter will act in the same way in dim light as a dark red filter does in bright light. When choosing light filters for studying the aura, this fact should be kept in mind. If these experiments are repeated at different times, the result will not be the same due to the different shades and intensity of the incident light, but the principle will remain the same. Another experiment can be done. Look at hot red hot coal, either in the dark or in the light, through a red filter of any shade. It will be noticed that the red color of the coal is enhanced because it is self-luminous, so that its own radiation is added to the incident white light. As already mentioned, when looking through a red filter, all objects, except for red ones, will appear either dark or black. If the red filter is not too deep to absorb the entire spectrum of colored rays reflected by an object, then that object will not appear completely dark, but will change its color to red. From these experiments, it can be concluded that the etheric double is very transparent, and surrounds the entire body, directly adjacent to it. When observations are made under favorable circumstances, a striated structure with very thin lines of a deeper shade than the apparently homogeneous space is clearly visible. It is very likely that the entire ethereal double derives its hue from these colored furrowed lines. The ethereal counterpart has a beautiful pink color, which of course contains more blue than carmine. It is extremely difficult to see how pink can be seen against a white background when viewed through a carmine screen. We have not found any other explanation for this phenomenon, except if the etheric double is a self-luminous object, emitting a very weak glow, which is invisible under normal circumstances. To date, no signs or changes in the etheric double have been found that could help in the diagnosis of the disease. The long time, which is associated with the difficulty of finding the etheric double, is better spent on other methods of studying the aura, since the patient will naturally object to a very long medical examination. Notes, edit. 1. The company Ratten and Wainwright was founded by Frederick Charles Luther Ratten, Ratten, Frederick Charles Luther, 1840 to 1926, in 1878 in London, which was one of the earliest. Ratten and Wainwright manufactured and sold colloidal glass and dry gelatin plates for cameras as display material. Cameras were also produced for a short time. In 1906, Ratten, together with another scientist named Ekmes, invented panchromatic plates as photo filters that allow a well-defined short region of light waves to pass through. Thanks to this invention, Ratten and Wainwright became the world's leading manufacturer of photo filters, bought in 1912 by the American George Eastman. George Eastman, 1854 to 1932, founder of the now world-famous Kodak Company. This company to this day has retained the names, characteristics, and numbering of photo filters produced at the beginning of the last century by the company Ratten and Wainwright, which are called Kodak Ratten Gelatin Filters Approximate. Translator 2. We are talking about Fraunhofer lines, dark absorption lines in the solar spectrum, which were discovered by the German physicist Joseph von Fraunhofer in 1814. The nine thickest absorption lines of the solar spectrum were labeled with the letters from A to K. The figure shows all the main lines approximate. Translator Human Atmosphere Chapter 3 Internal and External Auras Chapter 3 Inner and Outer Auras The aura begins behind the etheric double. For some time we believed that the aura was indivisible, although the layer of the aura close to the body had a clearly denser structure compared to the outer layer of the aura. After experimenting for some time, we have found a way to define two different layers of the aura through the use of different screens and filters other than those containing spectranine. We call these two layers the inner and outer aura. The new screens made a great addition to our experiences, opening up a new field of observation during illness, and providing an explanation for some of the phenomena that at first we could not understand. The most useful screens, besides the usual spectranine, are dark carmine, hereafter referred to as a, light.
Light carmine, here and after referred to as B, and pale blue, here and after referred to as C. They are especially valuable for a person who can observe the aura without the aid of any kind of screen. After the patient has been examined with the spectroanine screen, his aura can be examined through the C screen. Screen C clearly shows the separation of the two auras. With this screen, the inner aura will appear denser and more granular, allowing the outer edge to be identified. But its general structure will be hard to see. And the outer aura stands out clearly, and its extreme border can be distinguished with good accuracy, which will make it possible to determine its size and shape. Screen B can be used when the external aura is reduced or completely erased. This screen is applied depending on the amount of light used. All factors must be arranged so that the outer and inner auras can be seen through the C screen. At this stage of observation, the structure of the inner aura may sometimes differ, but only slightly. The final step is to look at the aura through the dark carmine screen A. If necessary, you can apply a slightly lighter shade of this screen. At first, it seemed to us that screen A hides the inner aura, completely leaving the outer aura. However, after repeated experiments, it was found that this error is due to incorrect adjustment of the light. One should be especially wary of this error, having previously determined the width of the inner aura using the screens B and C. The inner aura, as seen through the dark carmine screen, is usually about 5 to 10 centimeters wide, depending on the age and personality of the patient. Although there are cases when a wider inner aura is encountered, the state of the border of the aura layers depends on the state of health, which can be seen through the carmine screen. As a rule, the breadth of the aura is practically the same from head to body, being sometimes, but not always, a little narrower at the feet. Sometimes in men and women, the aura has local extensions, characterized by a rough structure. These places are quite different from the general picture. The most common position for this expansion in women is the waist, if it is facing the observer, and in men, behind the seat. In fact, these granular enlargements indicate a pathology, which will be described below. In women, there is often an increase in the front of the breast and abdomen, which will be explained in the chapter on pregnancy. As a rule, the inner aura smoothly follows the contour of the body, touching its border with the etheric double. The outer edge of the inner aura can vary, to the point of becoming crooked, with large jags. The structure of the inner aura is clearly granular, but these granules are arranged in such a way that they look striped. In addition, they are extremely beautiful. These stripes run at right angles to the body, parallel to each other. It was never noticed that they had any color. They gather in bunches, having the longest stripes in the center and the shortest on the outside, with a rounded edge. The extreme tufts are concentrated together, and their shape folds into a jagged pattern. In some cases, the striped structure of the inner aura is noticed without the slightest difficulty, while in other cases it can only be detected by low light and choosing a suitable screen. The contour of the internal aura of a healthy patient can always be determined, but when the patient is unwell, it is sometimes very difficult to do this. Whenever the inner aura invades the etheric double, it almost disappears. This fact again pushes us to the question whether the granules of the inner aura penetrate into the etheric double, despite their invisibility, or there are some forces that keep the granules of the inner aura at some distance from the body in order to leave the etheric double free of any granules, which makes it very transparent. In the last part of the previous chapter, this issue was addressed when the patient was in good health. The conclusion reached was that the etheric double did not contain any ordinary matter. Poor health changes the state of the etheric double, and then it seems that the granular substance of the inner aura actually invades the etheric double. This will be discussed in more detail below. The outer aura begins where the inner aura ends. The external aura spreads around the whole body at a variable distance. The external aura has absolutely no strictly defined contour, i.e. its boundaries are gradually coming to naught, although this transition, as a rule, is quite clearly defined. 
This statement, however, may sometimes be inaccurate, since under very favorable circumstances, an extremely faint auric fog can be seen that extends beyond the aura for a very long distance, which gives the impression that we are aware of its presence, but not quite able to distinguish it. This very elusive part of the aura is most likely a continuation of the external aura. Whenever she was seen, the outline of the outer aura was more vague than usual. These cases were observed only in those patients which had an unusually broad aura. It may be that this phenomenon indicates a component of the aura that is too subtle to be often visible. In any case, we have termed this phenomenon as the ultra-external aura. The size and shape of the outer aura has already been fully described in the first chapter. It is seen as a rarefied cloud of matter that can be illuminated. The external aura is by no means a luminescent phenomenon. Soon after we began our observations, rays and bright spots were seen emanating from various parts of the body. These phenomena often appear as suddenly as they suddenly disappear, while other local features of the aura may remain visible during the entire time of our examination. Usually they arise in one part of the aura, which becomes brighter and denser as a result. Most often, these rays are colorless, but sometimes they can have different shades. As far as is known, these specific formations do not have any diagnostic value, but indirectly they are very important. First, spots that appear inside and outside the aura, which are then completely detached from the body. In this case, they often resemble bright spots. Second, rays passing from one part of the body to another. Third, rays emanating directly from the body and going into space. The first group consists of light spots that stand out against the background of the surrounding aura that envelopes these spots. Typically, these spots are close to the body, but not touching it. Usually these spots have an oblong shape, the longitudinal axis of which is parallel to the body length. Their sides can usually be seen quite clearly, but their ends often fade gradually into the surrounding aura. Usually the spots remain visible throughout the entire observation of the aura, but sometimes they suddenly disappear. If it were not for this feature, these spots would be attributed to changes in the internal aura. For a long time, the origin of these spots was a big mystery, but when it was established that these spotted formations lie entirely within the inner aura, then some of the difficulties disappeared. It has been found that the long sides of these elongated spots tend to line up exactly with the edges of the inner aura, while the sharp ends of these spots tend to become less bright. The isolation of these spots is explained by the fact that they are changes of the internal aura, limited from the proximal side by the etheric double, and from the distal side, by the external aura. When the dark carmine screen A is applied, this part of the inner aura appears to completely lose its striped structure, and instead appears granular. These granules in some cases look much rougher than the entire aura, and the brightness is often commensurate with the granule size. When the stain is short-lived, the granules are usually fine, but if the stain exists for a longer period of time, then there is a tendency for the granules to go into coarser forms. Since these granules must be mentioned when considering the aura in sickness, it will be convenient to divide them into fine, medium, and coarse. The constancy of these spots during the entire observation at first glance indicates the possibility of their long-term existence, but more often than not they are nothing more than a sign of a small local change. Until recently, no layers were noticed in these spots. But in case number 40, the aura of a pregnant woman whose fetus was dead showed thin layers in the aura area in front of the breast, while in the upper part of the enlarged abdomen, the internal aura was roughly striped, and in the lower abdomen there was an unusual pathological granular spot. All these spots never have color. The rays of the second group are the brightest of all, and can be observed in any part of the body, passing from one part of the body to any other, provided that these two parts are located close enough to each other, and there is not too large an angle between them. For example, when the hand is retracted a certain distance from the body, one or more rays can connect the hand and the body. In this case, 
they seem to flow from the body to the arm, and not vice versa, because the rays are perpendicular to the body, and they pass to the arm at different angles. Another good example, when the patient holds his hands at the hips and spreads the elbows to the sides at the sides, in this case, rays may appear from the armpit to the wrist. A similar effect can be obtained if one person holds their hand a short distance from any part of the other person's body. In this case, rays will pass between the hand of one person and the body of another. Once, when we conducted such an experiment, the beam emitted from one person's hand to another's hand first had a bright yellow color, and then within a few seconds changed to a light ruby color. The rays of the third group go at right angles from the body into space without any deflection. Often they are distinguishable only within the visual range of the external aura, but these rays are brighter than the aura itself. However, it is surprising to see them in a situation where ultra aura is supposed to be. In this case, the rays extend beyond the outer aura, so it is impossible to establish the exact boundaries of the end of the ray, since it is not known how far the ultra aura extends, for the rays gradually disappear into invisible expanses. If there are two rays, they are almost always parallel to each other, and rarely fan-shaped. After some passage from the body, the rays become pointed, the ends of which gradually fade. This is especially evident in the example where the rays are coming out of the fingertips. The perpendicular to the body is, obviously, the natural direction of the rays, but as a result of extraneous influences, the rays can be deflected, taking any angle with respect to the surface of the body. But never in any case have we seen the bending of the rays. It is very easy to observe this phenomenon on the fingers, where the rays emanate from the fingertips in the direction of the extension of the fingers, and this will be so as long as there is no attractive object nearby. But if you hold the other hand at a distance of about 15 to 20 centimeters from the fingertips, then the rays emanating from these fingers connect with the moving hand. In this case, all the rays connecting the two hands will be parallel to each other, and their total angle will change depending on the mutual movement of the two hands. But there will be not the slightest sign of any bending. Exactly the same behavior of the rays is observed. The size of the beam can vary greatly, depending to a large extent on where it comes from. For example, the rays emanating from the shoulders are almost always wide, while the rays emitted from the fingertips rarely exceed one and a half times the diameter of a finger. According to experimental data, rays can come from any part of the body. It has never been possible to see how the rays directly connect the observer and the patient. This is due to the extreme transparency of these rays, making them invisible against the pale background of human skin due to poor contrast. This difficulty can be easily avoided by using the usual black background, against which the silhouettes of the rays become visible. Even though the rays passing directly from the patient to the observer are invisible, they nevertheless betray their presence by changing the complex color bands of the aura, which will be described below. In addition to the usual bluish gray, red, and yellow, subtle white beams were seen. It is somewhat surprising that the rays can have all the colors of the rainbow. These rays have a striking feature, namely, these rays reduce the density or brightness of the outer aura. Thus, it seems that these rays are the result of the same aura. Since the structure of these rays resembles the structure of the inner aura, we concluded that this type of rays has the same source as the aura, the human body. In other words, these rays are nothing more than ray-like branches of the innermost aura. The aura has never been detected in complete darkness, which proves that ordinary visual perception is not able to perceive the aura as an autonomous luminescent phenomenon. The visibility of the aura is noted, as is the case with other non-luminescent bodies, only when the light emanating from some extraneous source is reflected. Best results were obtained with appropriately dim daylight. We have tried, but without much success, to determine if the aura is more clearly visible through different color filters. The aura is visible through red, yellow, green, and blue filters, of course with matching hues. One very valuable detail, however, becomes more apparent when a red filter is used, namely, 
the stripes of the inner aura are more clearly visible. Another effect of the same red filter is that it sometimes gives the inner aura a purer red tint than a carmine screen. For the same purpose, we turn to the help of photography, hoping by means of various color panchromatic filters, as well as infrared and ultraviolet filters, to obtain a little more information about the aura than with our usual methods. Unfortunately, the results were negative due to the different conditions required for the different light filters. However, we tend to think that the change in the visibility of the aura lies outside the normal visible spectrum. And this view is reinforced by the fact that the aura would long ago have been recognized by many people who have ordinary vision if the aura's emissions were within the visible spectrum. Instead, it is generally accepted. One might suggest that the auric cloud, which is indeed fog-like in structure, is some form of vapor. This assumption is very erroneous for the following reasons. The aura remains constant regardless of the body temperature of the person. If the auric fog were vapor emanating from the body, then this vapor would rise up in the cool air, which is not observed. Any force of wind would be able to change the shape of the steam. And in the case of auric fog, no, even the strongest draft is able to change the shape of the auric cloud. Its structure is so exquisitely beautiful that comparing an auric cloud with ordinary fog is like comparing a beautiful cambric to the roughest canvas. After all the various aspects of the aura have been considered, it is impossible to draw other conclusions like the following. First, the aura is an integral part of the body that can be viewed in the same light as the skin. If this were not so, then every time something touched the body, the aura would be compressed, and after removing the cause of the contraction, it would return to its previous position. But no such effect was observed, as far as we could investigate. In addition, it would be difficult to imagine where the auric rays come from if not from the body itself. All of the above does not mean that it is as easy to see the aura of a magnet as a human aura. To get results in this business, you need to carefully choose a background that should be completely smooth and black. The lighting should be diffused, and it is better that the magnet is not in front of the light source. It is reasonable to assume that the visible auric cloud of a magnet will closely follow the lines of force of its magnetic field, but as far as has been observed to date, this assumption is not supported. Although it is very likely that this discrepancy will disappear if the auric fog of the magnet could be more clearly perceived. Before starting the observation, the experimenter will find that it is necessary to look at light through the dark spectronine screen twice as long as before looking at the human aura. The magnets used were in the shape of a 15 cm horseshoe, which lost most of their power, and 20 cm rods, which were smeared with black all the time. These permanent magnets were chosen in preference to the electromagnet, as the latter are difficult to maintain and therefore not quite suitable for our purposes. When the horseshoe magnets were examined, the poles of which were short-circuited with metal reinforcement, a uniform auric fog, approximately one centimeter wide, was visible around the entire magnet. The center of the magnet also seemed to be covered with an auric mist. When the metal reinforcement was removed, then a large change in the aura of the magnet was observed. The auric fog still remained around the entire magnet, but it became denser near the poles, at a distance of about 2.5 centimeters from them. A similar change in the aura of the magnet occurred in its center, there the auric cloud became much denser. At the same time, rays emanated directly from the poles into space, often visible up to several centimeters in length. The auric rays emanating from the south pole of the magnet expanded slightly, while those auric rays emanating from the opposite north pole of the magnet became slightly fan-shaped. These two types of beams were connected at a distance of about 4 centimeters from the poles, at a distance of about 2.5 centimeters from them. A similar change in the aura of the magnet occurred in its center, there the auric cloud became much denser. At the same time, rays emanated directly from the poles into space, often visible up to several centimeters in length. The auric rays emanating from the south pole of the magnet expanded slightly, while those auric rays emanating from the opposite north pole of the magnet became slightly fan-shaped. 
These two types of beams were connected at a distance of about 4 centimeters from the poles. At a distance of about 2.5 centimeters from them. A similar change in the aura of the magnet occurred in its center, there the auric cloud became much denser. At the same time, rays emanated directly from the poles into space, often visible up to several centimeters in length. The auric rays emanating from the south pole of the magnet expanded slightly, while those auric rays emanating from the opposite north pole of the magnet became slightly fan-shaped. These two types of beams were connected at a distance of about 4 centimeters from the poles. Those emanating from the south pole of the magnet expanded slightly, while those auric rays that emanated from the opposite north pole of the magnet became slightly fan-shaped. These two types of beams were connected at a distance of about 4 centimeters from the poles. Those emanating from the south pole of the magnet expanded slightly, while those auric rays that emanated from the opposite north pole of the magnet became slightly fan-shaped. These two types of rays were connected at a distance of about 4 centimeters from the poles. When the bar magnet is examined in the same way, an auric cloud will be seen along its entire length, which at the poles becomes wider and denser. The auric rays emanating from one pole of the magnet do not connect with the rays emanating from the other pole, since they are rather far from each other. It has also been observed that the rays emanating from the south pole of the bar magnet are almost straight, while the auric rays emanating from the north pole are distinctly fan-shaped. This is evidently because the rays emitted from the sharp corners of the square poles of the magnet travel at different angles compared to those emitted from a flat surface. If a tin nail is placed next to the pole of the magnet, with the head from the pole, then the auric fog will be brighter near the tip of the nail, but more concentrated near the head of the nail. The auric fog of the magnet has a bluish color and can be enhanced by applying a very light blue filter without gray tints. During the examination by the above method of the aura of a radioactive crystal of uranium nitrate, which measured 3 cm in length and about 2 cm in its widest part, an auric cloud was noticed around it. The auric mist was most concentrated on the smaller end of the crystal. The color of the aura was yellow, and was more clearly seen through the light yellow filter, while the blue filter reduced or erased the contours of the auric cloud, according to the depth of its color. It is very interesting to note that when the uranium nitrate crystal was placed near the magnet, there was a mutual attraction of the auric cloud surrounding the two bodies, each of which seemed to extend further towards the neighboring object than when they were apart. Moreover, these two auric clouds could be seen quite easily owing to their different colors. When the crystal and magnet were at a close distance, their auric clouds penetrated each other, and in the area where the auras were mixed, the color gradually disappeared. Whether this colorless tone is too weak to be perceived, or whether the color of the mixed aura actually disappears, we could not determine. Almost everyone knows about the glowing mist around the tip of an electrified body. Therefore, there is no need to say that this phenomenon is not related to the subject of this conversation about the auras of various objects. If the poles of a galvanic battery are open, then these poles are in a similar electrostatic state, but most people cannot distinguish any fog around them. This auric fog will become visible when research is done in the same way as with magnets. As expected, an auric fog surrounds any electrical conductor that connects to the two poles of an electrical battery. If one wire is connected to a zinc element and the other wire to a carbon one, and these two wires are arranged so that they are parallel to each other at a distance of approximately 5 centimeters. If an insulator is placed between these wires, the auric cloud will no longer extend over the entire space between the conductors, but will concentrate around the two wires. The auric fog of galvanic batteries has a bluish tint, which can be enhanced by a light blue screen. The structure of the auric fog of galvanic batteries is much coarser in its granularity than the auric fog of the uranium nitrate crystal, which in turn has a coarser aura than the aura of magnets. It would be inappropriate to enumerate a large number of experiments made only for the sake of proving that fog exists around some objects in which there is energy hidden from our ordinary perception, but which, however, under favorable conditions can be noticed through the impact on the environment. In the case of magnets,
According to conventional wisdom, a magnetic field arises from a specific orientation of molecules, which is called polarization. The auric fog of galvanic batteries depends on the chemical reactions taking place inside the battery. The auric cloud of a radioactive uranium nitrate crystal is apparently due to the decay of atoms. It is safe to say that the force that forms the human aura is quite different from the above three forces. It can also be firmly asserted that not the same force is involved in the creation of external and internal auras. Obviously, there is a great similarity between all these auric clouds, because they are mutually attracted, and also have a common property, which is that neither the north nor south poles of a magnet, nor the negative or positive poles of a galvanic battery. The force or forces that produce the human aura probably have their origin in the body itself. We cannot suppose that these two auras internal and external are a consequence of only one force, since we must remember, firstly, that the internal aura has a stripe-layered structure. Its boundaries are well marked, and it must also be remembered that rays emanate from it. Secondly, the outer aura is completely foggy, with a poorly defined outer edge, the visible nearest edge of which coincides with the outermost border of the inner aura. And we must take into account that it has never been noticed that the rays come out from the external aura. This opinion is supported by the fact that the outer edge of the inner aura is mobile, showing that the intensity of the force producing the inner aura is also variable. Therefore, if we assume that the external aura is the result of the internal aura, then the external aura must also have movable boundaries. But such a phenomenon is not actually observed. Another circumstance pointing to the same conclusion is that the external aura becomes much larger around a body in women at puberty than in men who do not have an increase in the internal aura during puberty. We came to the conclusion that there must be two forces. The first force that generates the inner aura, we assigned number one and called it auric force, or in short, 1AF. Another force that produces an external aura, we also called it auric force, but with number 2, which is shortly 2 AF. If in reality there is only one force, and these two auras internal and external are only different manifestations of this one force, it will nevertheless be beneficial for practical purposes to consider the object as if two forces are present. 1 AF appears to act very strongly within the prescribed area of the inner aura, and to some extent under the influence of psychic desires, which can cause significant changes in the outline of the inner aura. That is, the radiation that generates an internal aura is produced subconsciously through the internal forces of a person. This assumption solves a problem that puzzled us greatly when experimenting with the mechanical forces of N-rays. The difficulty was due to the fact that sometimes there was a large deflection of our instrument, and too often, even if the N-rays had to go through all kinds of obstacles. At other times, under exactly the same physical conditions, the results were negative. Now, it can be easily understood that the deflection of the instrument needle took place whenever one of these N-rays fell on the recording instrument. We stopped experimenting with N-rays, concluding that, despite interesting experiments, there was no prospect for diagnostic purposes, as we initially hoped for. The aura of the person was directly seen, which we completely succeeded. And then we decided that the best results could be obtained with what was visible, and not with what remained invisible in the case of N-rays. The second auric force, 2AF, is of course more mobile and has a wider range of action than the first auric force, 1AF. And as far as has been determined, 2AF is completely independent of the person's psychic desires. Various health conditions, either general or focal, affect these forces, and indirectly, the state of the aura, changing it, but not necessarily to the same extent. With a local disease, usually the layers of the inner aura at the site of the disease disappear, and an opaque and dense mass appears in its place, which has a different shape in relation to the neighboring parts of the aura. This mass can have a rather rough appearance, very different from the wonderful aura of health. From time to time, this place of illness may appear to be completely devoid of an inner aura. Whenever local diseases are rooted within the trunk, 
the inner aura may be correspondingly narrower on one side of the body than on the other. And when this happens, it is always accompanied by a change in structure in the inner aura and often a bad impure color change, which will be mentioned later. The outer aura, which is caused by the second auric force 2AF, auric force, changes much less than the inner aura. The color of the external aura may change, but as a rule, the main change in the external aura occurs in width, which may decrease or increase, but will never completely disappear. A change in the state of health in the body of a person can cause a change in the shape of the external aura, which in some cases is a valuable diagnostic indicator. The outer aura can become narrower, while the inner aura maintains its normal width. But the reverse process does not occur, since the outer aura never retains the same size if the inner aura narrows. The body, as already mentioned above, has the ability to produce auric rays, which, like the aura itself itself, have specific properties of response to external influences. For example, if one person holds his hand at a short distance from any part of the patient's body, then in almost every case an auric ray can be seen between his hand and the patient. Usually, in this case, the change in the aura of both people is first noticeable. Their auras become brighter at the point of contact through the auric ray. Noteworthy is the fact that these rays can be obtained more easily between sharp points than between flat surfaces. For example, if a person holds one extended finger near the patient's body, then an auric ray will soon appear between the finger and the body, which at first will be more noticeable near the finger than near the body. Subsequently, this auric ray can acquire the same strength along its entire length. In another case, when the same person holds the same finger at the same distance, but opposite some protruding part of the patient's body, such as the nose, chin, elbow, or finger, then it will be noted that the auric rays will be more quickly generated, and often will more vivid. Thus, the auric potential, if we can use such an expression, is greater on sharp parts of the body than on a flat surface. If a person places his bare hand parallel to the patient's body, then both auras will become brighter and often, but not always, mixed, thereby indicating that there is a mutual attractive force between the two auras. In all these cases, the distance between the visible auras of the patients and the experimenters was at least 5 centimeters. It is also extremely important that the thoughts of these two people are as calm as possible so that their psychic desires are not reflected in their auras. To demonstrate that the aura is strongly influenced by the power of desire, it makes sense to conduct the following experiment. One person holds a finger of his hand against the patient's body at a distance slightly greater than in previous experiments. This person should strongly desire that the auric ray travel from the end of his finger to the patient's body. Soon this will happen. But as soon as the experimenter thinks to interrupt this process, the auric ray will immediately disappear, connecting the experimenter's palate and the patient's body. How does the spectranine screen allow you to see the aura? It is very important to answer this question. Apparently, the aura affects some of the most sensitive parts of the eye, the excitability of which is increased with the help of the screen. This version can be considered in more detail. The following statement can be regarded as an axiom, if a certain substance emits a force that produces vibrations in the ether, harmonious to the frequency and wavelength of a certain part of the visible light spectrum, then this substance is autoluminescent. It does not matter if this force is self-generating, as in a radioactive crystal, or if this force is acquired on the side, as in the case of luminescent calcium sulfide. Of course, this statement is true for those waves that are invisible to the ordinary eye, but which can be seen by people gifted with some specific abilities, or who have acquired these abilities with the help of technical devices. Karl Reichenbach, in his researches upon magnetism, cites the example of more than 50 sensitive people who could see in complete darkness a faint glow emanating from magnets, crystals, etc. If all these people were not deceivers, and there is no reason to suppose so, they must have had very sensitive vision, which allowed them to sense very weak light. In this case, we can talk about the observation of phenomena that are invisible in ordinary situations.
Personally, we think that these observations are plausible because we believe that the forces emanating from magnets, crystals, etc., produce vibrations that almost, but not quite, correspond to the frequency and wavelength of visible light, and lie slightly outside the visible spectrum. Possibly, but this is only a guess at the present time, that these fluctuations can be located within the lavender gray color range. The same can be said for the human aura. There are a large number of people who, on the basis of their developed sensitivity, have observed unusual auric phenomena. A strong argument in favor of clairvoyance is the fact that clairvoyants have normal visual abilities, not above average. We asked one clairvoyant if his abilities were related to sharp physical vision. He kindly informed us that those people with unusual clairvoyant abilities have normal physical vision. From these facts, we can conclude that individuals who can see the human aura, fog around magnets, etc., do so not with keen physical eyes, but through the ability to see rays that are not part of the normal visible spectrum. If this is not the case, then what is this ability? All our experiments point to the fact that in order to see the aura, you only need to have a dim light. Weak light is needed in order to see the aura, which is extinguished by ordinary bright light. But still the main factor is the direct eye of the observer. For this reason, the adaptation of the observer's eyes to darkness plays an essential role. The perception of light is due to the sensitivity of the retinal cones and rods. And for some reasons that needlessly be quoted here, it is generally believed that the most effective action of the cones is in bright light, while they are nearly dormant in dim light. On the other hand, sticks are more sensitive in low light. Without going into the details of their very complex structure, it is only necessary to say that this process occurs through rhodopsin. This substance is obtained in some incomprehensible way from the melanin of the pigmented cells of the retina, and it is so unstable that light continuously changes its chromatic qualities, which act differently in different parts of the spectrum. It was found that yellow-green rays are the most active and red ones are least effective on rhodopsin. Under green light, rhodopsin turns purple, violet and then colorless. Once the retina has become accustomed to dim light, the red part of the spectrum is perceived in the least amount, while the maximum intensity of perception moves to the green spectrum, and the area of the blue spectrum becomes brighter. And accordingly the purple color becomes more visible. If you look at a colored object in very low light, then at first it appears gray, and only after some time of observation does this object acquire color. In our opinion, this property of vision to a qualitative and quantitative change in the perception of the violet color allows people to see the aura. If you observe the aura through the spectronine screen without previous eye preparation, the majority of people will be unable to see anything, and only a few will notice the aura more or less clearly. But if you first look at the light through the dark spectronine screen for a short time, and then at the aura, then almost all people will be able to see the aura, some immediately, and the rest within a minute. And if those people who are able to see the aura without preliminary preparation, nevertheless look at the light through the dark spectronine screen for some time, then after that they will be able to see the aura without the help of any screen. This ability will be temporary, because after one or two minutes they will exclaim, we do not see anything. But, any person who constantly uses these screens will find that the effect becomes cumulative, which gives the ability to see the aura at any time without the interference of any screen, if the external environment is favorable. However, he will find it useful to look at the light for a few seconds through a dark spectronine screen for a few seconds before starting any serious observation, as he will then discern the aura more easily and distinctly. This ability is acquired without any damage to ordinary vision. And so to speak, the eyes acquire the habit of perceiving the aura. This phenomenon defies any reasonable explanation. Surprisingly, the author noticed that when he had not used the screens for a week or two due to being on vacation, he could not observe the aura as clearly as before the vacation. But this ability comes back again in a very short time. This indicates the fact that the cumulative effect of the spectronin shield is not completely permanent. 
The above experiments show that the spectronin screen has some specific effect on the eyes. The only part that is obviously affected is the violet area of perception, which increases in both quantity and quality. Unfortunately, the spectrum of the spectronin screen, as seen with the handheld spectroscope, does not help much to understand the effect of this screen, except that the spectrum of the brightest part of the spectronin screen lies in the yellowish-green region. While the orange and bright yellow are largely degrees are missing. Red is unchanged, while blue and purple are slightly reduced. The following remarks are completely hypothetical and without evidence, but we cannot offer any other explanation, and we ask our readers to refrain if they disagree with us. We do not think that the increase in the eye's sensitivity in the violet region alone is sufficient to explain the perception of the aura, although it is quite possible that there is some increase in the eye's sensitivity in the visual violet spectrum. It is more likely that there is some change in the eye's receptivity, which is caused by the use of the spectronin screen, and that this change allows the person to feel the emanations of the aura that lie outside the visible spectrum. This explanation is not so impossible when you remember that under certain conditions some people cannot distinguish the color of gray lavender. Human Atmosphere Chapter 4 Composite Aura Colors Chapter 4 Compound Aura Colors Soon after the discovery of the aura, a friend of ours drew our attention to the fact that if you look closely at the light, and then glance at some colored object, then the object will have a different color from different people. Having made sure that this feature of light perception really takes place, we thought that it could help in diagnosing the aura, but for this, our research should be carried out according to a certain method. We began to gaze intently at the gas lighting, not thinking that such a crude method would be satisfactory, but it was nevertheless useful to study this method, which could help us in future experiments. We noticed that the resulting phantom was not monochromatic, as the main body was of one color, but was surrounded by another piece of a different color. The inconvenience of working with two or more colors at the same time was a big challenge because there was a constant rapid, one after the other, change in the colors of the spectrum, with an effect caused by eye movements forced to rush to two sides. As a result, no precise results could be obtained. We assumed that at least some benefit could be obtained from this method if monochromatic light was used. After a lot of experimentation, we came to the conclusion that colored paper served our purpose better than anything else. That at least some benefit can be obtained from this method if monochromatic light is used. After a lot of experimentation, we came to the conclusion that colored paper served our purpose better than anything else. That at least some benefit can be obtained from this method if monochromatic light is used. After a lot of experimentation, we came to the conclusion that colored paper served our purpose better than anything else. This chapter will be completely devoted to the problem of the composite color of the aura. It is difficult to name this property of the aura in another way. We have observed the following phenomena. When monochromatic light is used, the hue of the color becomes either lighter or darker under certain conditions. This is a very difficult and difficult topic to understand, but we will try to provide the necessary explanations. Some of the theories may seem far-fetched or even unscientific, but they are presented for lack of better hypotheses. Since the subject is completely dependent on light perception, some preliminary remarks are required. It is common knowledge that there are three sets of light sensing nerves in the eyes, and that all perceived colors are the result of stimulation of one, two, or all three optic nerves. Usually they are unequally stimulated. True physiological primary colors are those that can only stimulate one kind of optic nerve. One of the methods for self-determination of one's own primary colors is pressing on the eyelid of the closed eye, then, as a rule, Small yellow dots will be visible throughout the field of view. In this case, in addition, small circles of blue color will be observed, as well as red dots of medium size relative to yellow and blue circles dots. Yellow is the most abundant color, followed by blue. When all the optic nerves are equally excited, the object appears white, and when unevenly, it is colored. 
We have always assumed that each person has his own primary colors and accordingly sees a colored object differently than another person, but due to general education, each person calls the same color by the same name. For example, let two people, A and B, look at an ordinary yellow object. This color stimulates only one kind of optic nerve in person A, and will be pure yellow for him. On the other hand, in person B, not only the optic nerves responsible for the yellow color, but also those optic nerves that are responsible for the blue color, could be excited to a small extent. Thus, a little blue is mixed with yellow, and the result is a yellow color with a greenish tint. But since both people A and B taught that this color is called yellow, whenever they see it, they both call it the same word, yellow. However, if A saw it through B's eyes, he would define it to be a greenish yellow color, while B, looking through A's eyes, would give the color a different name. And yet everyone would be right. We come to the conclusion that each person sees the world around him in his own shades, different from the light perception of other people. There is no need to go into this theory, but according to it, the primary colors currently are red, yellow and blue. Twenty years ago, purple took the place of blue. We do not propose to consider other theories, since this theory is also completely suitable for our purpose. They will both call it the same word, yellow. However, if A saw it through B's eyes, he would define it to be a greenish yellow color, while B, looking through A's eyes, would give the color a different name. And yet everyone would be right. We come to the conclusion that each person sees the world around him in his own shades, different from the light perception of other people. There is no need to go into this theory, but according to it, the primary colors currently are red, yellow and blue. Twenty years ago, purple took the place of blue. We do not propose to consider other theories, since this theory is also completely suitable for our purpose. They will both call it the same word, yellow. However, if A saw it through B's eyes, he would define it to be a greenish yellow color, while B, looking through A's eyes, would give the color a different name. And yet everyone would be right. We come to the conclusion that each person sees the world around him in his own shades, different from the light perception of other people. There is no need to go into this theory, but according to it, the primary colors currently are red, yellow and blue. Twenty years ago, purple took the place of blue. We do not propose to consider other theories, since this theory is also completely suitable for our purpose. And yet everyone would be right. We come to the conclusion that each person sees the world around him in his own shades, different from the light perception of other people. There is no need to go into this theory, but according to it, the primary colors currently are red, yellow and blue. Twenty years ago, purple took the place of blue. We do not propose to consider other theories, since this theory is also completely suitable for our purpose. And yet everyone would be right. We come to the conclusion that each person sees the world around him in his own shades, different from the light perception of other people. There is no need to go into this theory, but according to it, the primary colors currently are red, yellow and blue. Twenty years ago, purple took the place of blue. We do not propose to consider other theories, since this theory is also completely suitable for our purpose. Putting aside all theories for the time being, we find that when one set of optic nerves is completely depleted, the observer becomes partial color blind. If the optic nerves responsible for the perception of red are depleted, then the person will be blind to red, although he will be able to see all other colors except red. In addition, he will see all colored objects containing an admixture of red, but from this entire spectrum, the red color will be removed. For example, purple will turn out to be a shade of blue. This partial color blindness causes the eyes to become hypersensitive to all colors and shades that do not contain red, as red tends to obscure a very faint shade of any color. The following experiment was conducted by several people and general results were obtained. 
When a light beam with a shade of a very faint carmine color falls from a special flashlight onto a white screen, this shade will be noticed. But if the same observer looks at the sunlight through a blue or red light filter for one minute, then for some time he will see the carmine shade of the same initial ray more clearly, or less clearly, depending on whether he looked through a blue or red light filter. Into the sunlight. Similar results will be obtained if the eyes are depleted by looking at a blue or yellow beam of light. As a result, the observer is temporarily blind to blue or yellow. If two types of optic nerves are excluded in light perception, then within a short time the observer will become a perfect monochromatic color blind person. Then this shade will be noticed. But if the same observer looks at the sunlight through a blue or red light filter for one minute, then for some time he will see the carmine shade of the same initial ray more clearly, or less clearly, depending on whether he looked through a blue or red light filter. Into the sunlight. Similar results will be obtained if the eyes are depleted by looking at a blue or yellow beam of light. As a result, the observer is temporarily blind to blue or yellow. If two types of optic nerves are excluded in light perception, then within a short time the observer will become a perfect monochromatic color blind person. Then this shade will be noticed. But if the same observer looks at the sunlight through a blue or red light filter for one minute, then for some time he will see the carmine shade of the same initial ray more clearly, or less clearly, depending on whether he looked through a blue or red light filter. Into the sunlight. Similar results will be obtained if the eyes are depleted by looking at a blue or yellow beam of light. As a result, the observer is temporarily blind to blue or yellow. If two types of optic nerves are excluded in light perception, then within a short time the observer will become a perfect monochromatic color blind person. Then for some time he will see the carmine shade of the same initial ray more clearly, or less clearly, depending on whether he was looking at the sunlight through a blue or red filter. Similar results will be obtained if the eyes are depleted by looking at a blue or yellow beam of light. As a result, the observer is temporarily blind to blue or yellow. If two types of optic nerves are excluded in light perception, then within a short time the observer will become a perfect monochromatic color blind person. Then for some time he will see the carmine shade of the same initial ray more clearly, or less clearly, depending on whether he was looking at the sunlight through a blue or red filter. Similar results will be obtained if the eyes are depleted by looking at a blue or yellow beam of light. As a result, the observer is temporarily blind to blue or yellow. If two types of optic nerves are excluded in light perception, then within a short time the observer will become a perfect monochromatic color blind person. By looking at a blue or yellow beam of light, as a result, the observer temporarily becomes blind to blue or yellow. If two types of optic nerves are excluded in light perception, then within a short time the observer will become a perfect monochromatic color blind person. By looking at a blue or yellow beam of light, as a result, the observer temporarily becomes blind to blue or yellow. If two types of optic nerves are excluded in light perception, then within a short time the observer will become a perfect monochromatic color blind person. However, this is not required for our study. In practice, it was found that it is almost impossible to cause blindness to red, blue, or yellow colors using this method. It is most likely that all of the optic nerves are partially excited, but only one species needs to be completely paralyzed, and this fact complicates the matter. However, the conclusion remains true that in this case, certain shades of the eye color were perceived incorrectly. Perhaps this fact can partially explain how it turns out that a person can see the human aura after looking at the light for a short time through a spectranine screen, i.e. his eyes become more sensitive to the extreme end of the visible spectrum, and probably even to vibrations outside the visible spectrum, which for a normal eye in a normal situation remains completely invisible. Everyone knows that if he stares intently at a colored object for a while, and then turns his gaze to a white background, he will see a residual image of the original object, similar in shape, but in a different shape. This secondary color will always be the same, determined by the hue of the object. It is called complementary to the real or primary color. If, for example, 
You gaze at a yellow object. The color of the virtual image will be blue, the exact hue of which is determined by the hue of the yellow used and, to some extent, by personal characteristics. When the observer has looked at an object for a long time, then according to the brightness of the light and the stability of the gaze, he will always see first a phantom image of the same shade, which will gradually lighten, and eventually become mixed with a red tint, i.e. purple or plum. In these cases, remember that the complementary color always includes a red tint, although it is initially masked by an intense blue. If the observer first sees purple or plum shades on the residual phantom image, then most likely his eyes are not completely saturated with the real yellow color of the primary object, or in other words, more white light dominates in the residual image than necessary. This suggests that it is necessary to understand all the variable shades observed in the residual phantom image. After a short time, the after image will disappear, but may come back with quite changed colors. For our purposes, these secondary changes can be neglected, because the use of complementary colors does not last long enough to be useful for experiments. But another fact must be taken into account, namely, when the background is not white, then the complementary color will not appear in its pure shade, but will blend in with the background shade. Since the colors of phantom images are completely subjective, they are named as the closest colors they resemble, and this is sufficient for all practical purposes. After a lot of experiments were done with what we call primary colors, we came to the conclusion that they didn't give as good results as blended colors. Numerous tests have shown that the following colors can be most useful in aura experiments. 1. Gamboge has a Prussian blue as a virtual, after color. That they don't give as good results as mixed colors. Numerous tests have shown that the following colors can be most useful in aura experiments. 1. Gamboge has a Prussian blue as a virtual, after color. That they don't give as good results as mixed colors. Numerous tests have shown that the following colors can be most useful in aura experiments. 1. Gamboge has a Prussian blue as a virtual, after color. 2. Light blue, Antwerp blue, mustard. 3. Carmine, transparent emerald green, emerald green. 4. Emerald green, carmine. However, the researcher must determine experimentally which color or colors suit him best. In practice, strips of dyed paper 8 cm long and 2 cm wide were used, which were glued to black cardboard. This is the maximum size that can be used comfortably as longer stripes do not give additional colors around the edges. When the patient is standing a few meters in front of the observer, these paper stripes will give virtual residual stripes of complementary colors that appear across the patient's aura. They will be slightly wider than the patient's body and the ends of the colored stripes projected onto the sides of the body will be compared to each other as well as directly to the aura area on the body. The perpendicular strip used will simultaneously cover, for example, most of the chest and abdomen, or, if the back is being examined, most of the spine. To study the patient in this way, it is necessary that he was placed in front of a white background opposite the light, and was illuminated evenly from head to toe so that the shadows cast on the background were the same on both sides. Typically, a little more light is required than when the aura itself is being viewed, but almost always the curtains will be drawn. When the patient is positioned correctly, the observer should gaze at one of the colored stripes, keeping his eyes firmly on it for 30 to 60 seconds or more, according to the brightness of the light. The higher the brightness of the strip, the better, therefore, you need to open the curtain so that the strip can be fully illuminated. As soon as the observer believes that his eyes are sufficiently blinded by the color of the paper strip, he turns to the patient and looks at some place in the middle part of the body until a transverse virtual color strip is visible, partially expanding against the background on both sides. This will allow the observer to see changes in the shades of the virtual stripe. Of course, the shades of the stripe outside the body can be compared to each other, but not to the part of the stripe on the body. The above method seems very simple, 
but it requires a significant amount of practice and skill in some details, seemingly trivial, but very helpful in the speed and convenience of the experiment. When looking at a colored strip, at first it is necessary not only to fix the eyes in its one specific place, but to keep them in the center of the strip all the time, since there is a great tendency to blur the image, which will greatly increase the length of time required for blinding. This requires a little effort, but soon the habit will become almost natural. If the center point on the colored strip is marked with a letter or number, the double goal will be achieved. First, a stationary object will be obtained for fixing the gaze. Secondly, at the beginning of the examination, the difficulty in fixing the eyes directed at a certain area of the patient's body will be removed, due to the predisposition of the virtual color strip to move from the line of sight, and therefore the eyes follow it, thus completely destroying the observation process. As soon as the habit of constantly holding the gaze at one point is acquired, the virtual color strip will remain relatively motionless, and if it moves a little, it will immediately return to the required position. Since such dexterity is acquired only by practice, it is necessary to train the eyes on inanimate objects, before proceeding to the study of the human aura. In the following description of the experiments, the yellow stripe with its dark blue virtual will be the implied color, unless otherwise indicated. For brevity, we will use the term CC, complementary colored, for the virtual color, and PC, primary color, will mean the color of the paper strip that is looked at before observing the aura. Naturally, there are small varieties of skin and tones on the patient's body, so the observer should note every minor color detail before starting the examination. With careful judgment and a little experience, most difficulties will disappear. In its simplest aspect, projected on a healthy body, it will have the same shape throughout, but after the necessary correction has been made due to deviations in skin color. Lateral widening of this strip is often observed, but this is not always the case. These extensions along the edges of the CC band, as expected, have a consistently different shade in the part that lies directly on the body, which is mainly due to the background color. When the expansion of the CC band when looking at a healthy person gives a color on one side different from the color on the other side, then this difference is rarely large. Variety in hue is the single most common cause of CC stripe discoloration that can occur due to imperfect lighting. However, any doubt can be dispelled by turning the patient, when, after correction, other shades change their position so that it will be possible to establish with certainty that the cause of the change in the color of the CC band is the patient's aura. There is another very good method, if there is an extension of the blue CC stripe, which has a darker color, then you need to closely look at the blue PC stripe, which gives a yellow CC stripe. Often, but not always, the latter will have a lighter shade where the blue CC stripe was darker, and vice versa. One of the major changes in the CC stripe projected across the body of a patient in poor health facing the observer is the observation that one side will be darker than the other. When this happens, the two shades of color may gradually blend into each other, or a sharp borderline may separate them. In the latter case, the division most often occurs at the midline of the body, but there are many exceptions, and the division line can run any distance to the right or left of the vertical center of the trunk. If the CC stripe, light on one side and dark on the other, continues outside the body, then the expansion on the light side will invariably acquire a lighter shade than the expansion of the dark part of the stripe. A darker CC band usually indicates the part of the body where the disease is present. There is a slightly different kind of manifestation of the CC stripe, when instead of a stripe across the body, only a spot is noticed, large or small, dark or light but always with a certain shade and completely surrounded by the natural color of the stripe. When this spot is large, sometimes a complete or partial contour of the diseased organ appears. Small spots, not exceeding 3 cm in diameter, do not show which organ is affected by the disease. Although small spots, as a rule, indicate a minor degree of disease or local health problems, almost always, 
Small spots indicate a spot that is sensitive or even painful. In these cases, when the color change of the CC band spot is small, the spot disappearance is often observed. Comparisons can be made with other parts of the SS strip, which have acquired lighter or darker shades. Sometimes the spots change in color so much, case 88, that it seems as if a different shade would be added, as, for example, the brown color in the CC band was replaced by blue, case 17. Four PC lanes were selected and each of them was found to have its own advantages. These benefits generally depend on some unclear patient-related cause. For routine observations, the yellow PC band is most useful, producing a blue CC band that is more sensitive than the yellow CC band. But the CC yellow stripe is especially valuable in controlling the CC blue stripe due to the fact that they are often interchangeable in cases where there is a local color change in the CC stripe. There are times when, for some unexplained reason, it is more convenient to work with the yellow CC stripe rather than the blue one. The most sensitive of all these bands is green, but, unfortunately, it does not undergo as many changes as blue, and its changes are less stable. Choosing the color of the CC stripes is not very important considering that sometimes, due to the individual characteristics of the patient, better results can be obtained with one color than with another. Unfortunately, there is no way to unequivocally determine which band will give the best results in a particular case. In the course of these experiments, the observer will find that his eyes very soon become fatigued, and since no volitional effort can overcome the fatigue of the eyes, he will be forced to end the examination of the aura or change the color of the stripe. The first option is more preferable, because in case of eye fatigue from one color cannot be effectively overcome by changing colors. Now there is one very difficult question to be answered, what is it that causes the CC stripe color change? As mentioned above, it is likely that the observer's eyes, after gazing intently at one of the PC bands, become hypersensitive to certain light waves, and acquire the ability to differentiate shades that are invisible in the normal state of the visual apparatus. In theory, we can assume that there are four agents that can change the color of the CC band. Firstly, this skin. Secondly, this is the density of the aura. Thirdly, it is a change in the structure of the aura. And finally, fourthly, the color of the aura. Each of these agents must be considered separately. Having done all sorts of studies on the different changes in CC stripes, it can be assumed that there may be skin tones that can only be distinguished under exceptional circumstances. We constantly try to find a case that would clarify this issue, but so far our searches have been unsuccessful. Therefore, we believe that discoloration of the CC band from skin color should be extremely rare, so rare as to be insignificant. One fact that supports the latter claim is that when the CC stripe is colorless from edge to edge of the body, its extensions outside the body will be lighter or darker than the CC stripe on the body. This change in the color of the CC band along its edges outside the body is in no way explained by the influence of the color of the skin of the body, therefore this influence can only be attributed to the aura. Fig. 24. Very irregular shape of the aura. Fig. 24. Very irregular shape of the aura. Another question. Is the density of the aura sufficient to produce color changes in the CC band? Everything points to a negative answer to this question. Since the aura is composed of highly discharged matter, we are using the word matter deliberately, it would first have to acquire an enormous density before it could make any noticeable change in the color of the CC band. One case, Fig. 24, clearly illustrates this fact. This woman, on lateral observation, showed a four times wider aura in the abdomen than in the chest. When she was facing the observer, no peculiarities were noticed, and even when the observer applied the colored stripes, the color of the aura on the chest was the same as on the belly. Usually you encounter similar cases during pregnancy, when a woman has an aura in front of the belly three or four times wider than in front of the chest. 
but in none of these cases did the enlarged areas of the aura have a special coloration different from the general color of the patient's aura. The first two agents, skin and aura density, were swept aside as candidates for the forces that can produce a change in the color of the CC stripes. The third and fourth agents remain, the structure and color of the aura, which can help to some extent in solving the problem. What can change in the structure of the aura for this change to cause a change in the color of the CC band? In the third chapter it was noted that the inner aura can lose its even contours and become intermittent. This condition also occurs in people in good health, but much more often this aura state is observed in sick people or in cases of local diseases. The details of these cases will be described below. When this part of the aura was examined through the Carmine screen, it was found that the inner aura became granular, but not as rough as in case 32. We assessed this state as medium granulation. In addition, women consistently had a dark spot in the lower lumbar and posterior regions associated with the blue and yellow CC stripes. This patch has changed in shade in such a way that it seems to depend on the level of local pain that the woman suffers during the woman's monthly cycles. With the help of the Carmine screen, you can easily determine the granulation of the inner aura, and this granulation will almost always be coarse if you additionally use a dark CC band, but if you choose light, then the granulation will be less coarse. It is possible to point out other cases proving that granulation of the inner aura is the cause of the color change of the CC bands, but we think. On examination of the aura of a 25-year-old woman who had been complaining of back pain for more than three years, a broad beam was seen extending from the outer left buttock to about 8 centimeters in length. When viewed through the Carmine screen, this beam looked roughly granular. When examining the same beam with different stripes, no change in shades of the CC stripes was found, even though different colors were used. This case shows that the altered aura structure did not affect the color of the CC stripes. A similar case occurred to us in a girl, case 23, in whose aura there was a ray emanating from the left breast. This beam was short and thick, and when examined through the Carmine screen, it looked roughly granular. When this ray was explored with stripes, then a light spot was found on the blue CC band in the region of the beam. While on the yellow CC stripe, this same spot looked darker than the rest of the CC stripe. In this case, there must have been some other reason than just aura granulation. To summarize the granulation, one, the most probable cause of a local change in the overall color of the CC band is the granulation of the aura. Only in rare cases does the granulation of the aura not change the color of the CC stripes. 2. When the color of the CC stripes changes its intensity, i.e. in some places it becomes less or more dense, dark, or light, this clearly indicates the granulation of the aura, as well as the fact that there is some other factor that causes the granulation itself. The fourth and final agent, namely the color of the aura, is the only one that can explain all the remaining cases. This can be problematic, see appendix, but in many cases it is entirely suitable, and in the remaining isolated cases it gives a good working hypothesis. Our theory is this, each aura has a different color, although these colors cannot be distinguished with the naked eye. But the aura color is intense enough to change the hue of the CC stripes. Clairvoyance statements that they can see auras in different colors, and that often the colors are localized, can serve as a confirmation of the alleged hypothesis. When the author examines the aura, he sees it as blue or blue mixed with more or less gray, or even gray directly. This constant color of auras is most likely due to the spectronine screen and its long period of action on the retina after looking at light through it. Sometimes, even after this preparation of the eyes with the spectronine screen, the author noticed that when using a light screen, the aura had a yellowish or greenish tint. This last shade is probably the result of mixing yellow and blue. The following phenomenon is a good confirmation of the above theory. A ray was seen emanating from the index finger of a healthy person. This beam had a lemon color at first, and then quickly changed to a light ruby red color. 
The beam was approximately 3 cm long and about 2 cm wide. This ray extended beyond the finger without any expansion or contraction, and it was evident that it was denser than the surrounding aura. There was a black background behind the beam, so this beam was seen under very favorable circumstances, see the previous chapter. Now, suppose this yellow ray came from the patient's finger towards the observer's body. In this case, it will be very poorly visible, because the surveillance background will be flesh-colored instead of black. In this case, the observer can see this, directed towards him, the ray only as a yellow spot, approximately 1 cm in diameter, surrounded and, most likely, intersecting with the external aura. After carefully examining every point, intensity, density, background, etc., we came to the conclusion that such a beam would be completely invisible to the naked eye, but it will be visible through CC stripes, and we have not the slightest doubt about this. When using the blue CC stripe, the observer will see the connecting rays coming from patient to observer as dark spots with a diameter of about 1 cm. In this particular case of the thumb ray, when the ray was first yellow and then red, we think it would look like a spot against the background of the blue or yellow CC stripes. If you look at this beam through a red filter, then this spot should have a red tint, but slightly lighter than the normal color of the stripes. It can be added that even if a specific yellow or red ray were visible to the naked eye, the color of the rays would be less bright than against the background of CC stripes. If in this and similar cases the rays extending beyond the aura remain parallel to each other, then the auric spot is sharply defined, but if the auric rays go at different angles, then the auric spot will be blurred and even with the help of CC bands it will be difficult to determine the boundaries of these spots. This theory also explains the reason why a spot with one stripe is observed dark, and with another stripe light. The next chapter will describe the breaks in the aura. They will provide a different explanation for the color shade variations of the CC stripes. Since the forces that cause the appearance of the aura usually act at right angles to the surface of the body, their local disappearance leads to the formation of breaks in the aura, in the form of cylindrical gaps. The longitudinal axis of which is perpendicular to the surface of the body, case 26. When the auric forces are temporarily inactive in one specific place, the neighboring areas of the aura take over a partial influence on the resulting energy hole, due to which, instead of a cylindrical gap, conical shapes appear. The sharp end of which is directed towards the surface of the body, cases 24 and 25. As you might imagine, the aura surrounding these conical breaks almost always has an altered structure. The following data are examples of CC band shape changes. First, one must first consider the adjacent areas of the auric rupture. If the structure of the aura surrounding the gap were unchanged, then, as our theory says, there would be no change in the color or density of the CC bands. In this case, practice confirms the theory. If we consider the cylindrical auric gap, especially if it is surrounded by dense and granular parts of the aura, then we can observe a change in the CC band, on which a dark spot will be visible at the place of the cylindrical gap, and this is true for all bands. Fig. 22. Aura of a boy with a conical break on the right side. Fig. 22. Aura of a boy with a conical break on the right side. Secondly, if the auric gap has a conical shape, which has clearly defined boundaries, then when observing this gap using the CC band, a blurry picture is obtained in which the edges of the gap mix into each other, and the boundaries of color sheets are blurred. It is self-evident that throughout this description, color changes will take place outside the body, but within the CC band. As will be shown later, aura defects can only become visible under favorable conditions, and one condition that is imperative is that the auric gap should be seen as a silhouette against a black background. For this purpose, the patient must be placed in such a position that the longitudinal axis of the auric rupture becomes parallel to the plane of the black background, since any deviation from this position will obscure the auric rupture partially or completely. 
If the patient turns with the cylindrical auric gap in the frontal position to the observer, making the auric gap invisible against the background of human skin color, then the observer can determine the location of this cylindrical auric gap with the help of SS strips. The spots of the CC band will differ from case to case according to the size of the given gap and the state of the adjacent aura. If the aura material around the cylindrical rupture is discharged, then the CC band will show a definite light spot. If the adjacent aura has become denser and more granular, then this place on the CC band will take on the appearance of a dark spot, which will be surrounded by a barely distinguishable dark line. This dark spot will be observed with CC stripes of all colors. If, under the same conditions, only a very small speck or nothing at all is observed at the site of the auric rupture with the help of CC bands, then the auric rupture has a conical shape. It is wise to tabulate all CC color changes caused by the aura. The first table will contain large color variations of the CC bands, and the second will contain local phenomena. This classification is, of course, artificial, but useful because this division can reflect changes in the aura affecting half of the body, and at the same time minor and minor causes. The Human Atmosphere Chapter V Aura in Illness Chapter V Aura in Case of Illness If the theory is correct that the sources of the aura are the forces generated by the human body, and also that the action of these forces on the ether is the reason for their appearance. Then it is quite natural to conclude about the difference in the strength of the aura in case of illness and in a healthy state. During an illness, taking into account the sex and age of a person, both auras, internal and external, and especially, ultra-external, will be similar in definition. Limits and are different depending on the individual's personality. It is difficult to imagine that any health disorder can occur without affecting the auric forces and the aura itself. In the case of partial discomfort, the change in aura is likely to be partial as well. If the patient suffers from any serious illness, then this will affect the entire aura. However, upon recovery, it will probably return to its original state again. Changes in the aura can be completely disproportionate to the disease barely distinguishable and inaccessible to the currently existing rough diagnostic methods. However, for sure, in the future, new methods will be invented that allow you to capture many shades of subtle violations. Currently, it is only possible to perceive changes in the shape and size of the aura, as well as in color and density. The aura of a healthy person is uniformly symmetrical if he is facing or with his back to the observer. The two cases mentioned below, on page 188 of the original 1911 edition, will be the exceptions that we had to face. In the lower part, front and back, of a person standing sideways, the aura was uneven. As long as the correct form of the aura is preserved, it is impossible to say without experience about its large or small size, because there are no such standards. They can appear when measurements are taken and the subsequent comparison of the aura of a person in a healthy state, but even in this case, it must be remembered that an obvious increase or decrease in size may be a consequence of a change in density. Since the visible part of the aura and its density are often associated with each other. Friend. For the time being, we will concentrate our attention on cases in which all or most of the aura is changed in size due to organic reasons. The first such example, which differs from healthy auras, will be the energy shell of girls and women suffering from hysteria. In hysteria, the aura will be symmetrical on both sides of the body, the subject is facing the observer, but already within the pubic region it suddenly reaches its minimum size, when, like in a healthy person, the aura gradually narrows at the mid-thigh level or even lower. Seen from the side. The aura from the front in such patients is normal or slightly wider, and from the back it is extensive, with a pronounced external protrusion in the lumbar region. It is at this point that the aura then sharply contracts to its minimum size. On lateral examination, the aura decreases at the same level and then descends downward with the same width. I will give only two examples, the rest, in the future, for certain reasons. Case 13 
in, young girl, 22 years old, dressmaker, well formed, slightly anemic, very nervous, complains of weakness and shortness of breath. She has a fluctuating heart rate, 80 to 90 beats per minute at rest, reaching 130 and higher with the slightest exertion, heart murmurs, then changing their localization, then completely disappearing. Suffers from a hysterical lump in the throat, globus hystericus, which she describes as starting from the navel. Sometimes she has fainting spells lasting about 15 minutes, in which she is fully aware of what is happening around her. After taking the tonic, she immediately felt better. The overall color of her aura was blue-gray. The inner aura is well marked with stripes, about two inches wide from the body. When she stood facing the observer, her outer aura extended two inches from shoulder width. When she put her hands on her head, the width of her outer aura was nine inches, while she sharply decreased towards the pubis to 2.5 inches, the same width was maintained around the hips and legs. In the lateral position, the size of her body aura was 3 inches, decreasing to 2.5. On the dorsal side, there was a pronounced outer protrusion measuring 7 inches in the lumbar region, dropping sharply to 2.5 just below the buttocks, the width remained constant to the very bottom. A ray of about 6 inches in length was seen emanating from the lower right rib, crossing the entire inner aura and disappearing into the outer. Another ray emanated from the lower dorsal vertebrae, measuring 3 and 6 inches in width and length, respectively. When she stood facing the observer, the inner aura on the left side of the body, at the level just below the mammary glands, up to the lowest rib, was rough in structure without any signs of stripes. When a blue compound stripe was used, located perpendicular to the bottom of the chest and abdomen, the aura was even everywhere, except for the suprapubic zone, where it was darker, indicating that the menstrual period was expected in four days. When the strip was used transversely, a dark spot was observed in the right lumbar region. The spot area was soft to the touch. At the level of the stomach, the aura was even, but its right side was lighter than the left. The difference in hue was not as pronounced as in the case when the internal aura was coarsely granulated locally. There were two spots at the level of the two upper vertebrae. This place was sensitive, there she often experienced pain. There was nothing more to note. More emotional, than they should, girls, who are often characterized by their relatives as slightly hysterical, although without severe seizures, tend to have some signs of the so-called hysterical aura. On the other hand, women who are not inherently hysterical but who experience a breakdown due to severe anxiety problems do not exhibit this type of aura. For a specific example, see the case of young woman number 35. But due to problems with severe anxiety, those experiencing a nervous breakdown do not exhibit this type of aura. For a specific example, see the case of young woman number 35 but due to problems with severe anxiety those experiencing a nervous breakdown do not exhibit this type of aura for a specific example see the case of young woman number 35 fig 14 the hysterical aura of the girl very broad aura for the child around the body compare with fig 25 Fig underscore 14. When examining children for the inheritance of the size of the aura, we encountered a phenomenon that can be called hysterical form, which is well illustrated by the above case. Case 14. Fig. 14 and 15. E. X, a girl of about 8 years old, examined in July 1910. She was very intelligent, but easily excitable, with neurotic pedigree on the part of both parents, see Table 1. Her aura was blue-gray. The width of the inner aura is approximately 1.5 inches across the entire body. On the left side of the body, up to the level of the hips, the aura was light, serving as a good example of ray number 1, CP. 84 of the original 1911 edition. After some time, this light diminished and the aura took on a natural state, 
although it assumed the presence of rays emanating from different parts of the body, but none of them was completely visible. The outer aura around the head was slightly larger than the width of the girl's shoulders. When she put her hands behind her neck, the auric fog was four inches wide on the sides of the body, becoming just under three inches below the pubic bone, from where it descended correctly. However, it was not easy to determine its exact width, since the edges of the aura did not have clear boundaries, especially in the area of the lower limbs. When the girl turned sideways, the aura was about three inches wide, but on the back, just below the shoulders, it bulged out, already six inches in the lumbar region and abruptly cut off in the area below the buttocks. The compound color stripe was uniform throughout the body. For a child her age, this represented an aura that was too broad, which is unusual considering that the rest of her family had a narrow aura. This aura also belongs to the category of hysterical as far as it is possible to discern it in children. When the girl turned sideways, the aura was about three inches wide, but on the back, just below the shoulders, it bulged out, already six inches in the lumbar region and abruptly cut off in the area below the buttocks. The compound color stripe was uniform throughout the body. For a child her age, this represented an aura that was too broad, which is unusual considering that the rest of her family had a narrow aura. This aura also belongs to the category of hysterical as far as it is possible to discern it in children. When the girl turned sideways, the aura was about three inches wide, but on the back, just below the shoulders, it bulged out, already six inches in the lumbar region and abruptly cut off in the area below the buttocks. The compound color stripe was uniform throughout the body. For a child her age, this represented an aura that was too broad, which is unusual considering that the rest of her family had a narrow aura. This aura also belongs to the category of hysterical as far as can be seen in children. That the rest of her family had a narrow aura. This aura also belongs to the category of hysterical as far as can be seen in children. That the rest of her family had a narrow aura. This aura also belongs to the category of hysterical as far as can be seen in children. Fig 15. Aura of a hysterical girl. Side view. Large ledge at the back. Compare with fig. 26. Fig underscore 15. The next medical condition to be considered is epilepsy. The epileptic aura has its own special contour, which differs from the hysterical type. The latter, as just described, is wide and symmetrical on both sides of the body if the patient is facing the observer, while the epileptic is unusually uneven. The unevenness goes from the very top of the head to the solace of the feet. It is caused by a one-sided contraction of the aura, and not an increase on the other hand. The narrowing is not easy. It is accompanied by a change in density. In all the ten cases we looked at, perhaps this is just a coincidence, the aura was deformed on the left side of the body. It is likely that further investigation will lead us to the discovery of a right-sided narrowing. It was found that in patients with other diseases, the aura took on the same contour as in the case of epilepsy. These examples will be considered further, but they in no way contradict studies of the aura in cases that are doubtful in the sense of the diagnosis. When a study of the aura of a patient with epilepsy was carried out, regardless of the time elapsed since the last epileptic seizure, the first thing that caught the eye was a pronounced unilateral increase in the width of the aura. Also, the aura in the head area on the right is usually one to two inches wider than the shoulder, and on the left does not extend beyond it, it can even be one to two inches shorter than the shoulder. Along the body and limbs, the aura is located on the left. A more detailed examination will show that both auras are affected, internal and external, and the left one is always narrower, especially around the head. In addition, it seems dimmer than usual, and the stripes are either very difficult to distinguish, or they are not at all. The outer aura hasn't changed much, except for its size. When the patient stands sideways, the aura in front and behind does not show abnormal signs, thus distinguishing from the hysterical type, having an extension in the lumbar region. 
Its color is usually gray, sometimes with a bluish tint. The age of our patients was from 12 to 45 years old, including four men and six women. Case 15. Fig. 16. KH. KH, a shoemaker, 23 years old, a sluggish young man, has been suffering from epilepsy since he was 12 years old. He hasn't had that many seizures in the past few years. The family history of his relatives is not encouraging. The shoemaker's mother and father are cousins. The young man is very nervous, see case 18, prone to prolonged depression at the slightest provocation. His mother is a strong, healthy woman of clearly phlegmatic temperament. The older brother also has epileptic seizures, and there have been few of them over the past few years. The brother is married and has four children. The older sister is married, no children, she seems healthy and strong, without any neurotic symptoms. It is very interesting to observe its aura, it is symmetrical on both sides, but in width it is already medium in size. The younger sister also suffers from epilepsy, see next case. Fig. 16. Epileptic aura of a man. The outer and inner auras narrow more to the left. Fig underscore 16. The patient was examined in November 1909 and has had only one seizure in the last two years. When he stood facing the observer, his ethereal counterpart was clearly visible. The twin was about one slash eighth of an inch wide. Above the head, the outer aura was six inches on the right and three inches on the left. The inner aura was three inches on the right and two on the left. The outer aura just above the body was 3.5 inches wide, tapering to 2.5 inches at the hips and legs. The inner aura is 2.5 inches wide around the body and 2 inches wide around the limbs. On the left side of the body, the width of the aura immediately around the body was 2.5 inches, and around the limbs was 2, and the inner aura was 2 and 1.5 inches, respectively. When he stood sideways the width of the outer aura at the front was 2.5 inches, the inner one was 2. The width of the outer aura on the back was 3.5 inches, and the inner aura was 2. The outer and inner aura was more similar than usual. The stripes could only be seen on the right side. In general, the aura was roughly granular, especially the inner one, on the left side. The blue compound auric belt was even throughout the body, but its right part around the head was darker than the left, this was an exception. The elongation of the aura on the side of the body had shades of opposite colors. K16. Fig. 17. BH, 18 year old girl, sister of a previous patient, dressmaker, plump, anemic, seemingly sluggish. In October 1908, without asking her mother, she sat down at the sewing machine and began work, after which she fainted several times. According to her stories, at first she felt hot and then thrown into the cold. Everything went on for about five minutes. Then she lost consciousness. If she had gone out into the fresh air at the very beginning of the seizure, it might have been prevented. Her story was evasive, and it was not possible to collect other information. Fig. 17. Epileptic aura of a woman. Fig underscore 17. The girl was examined in November 1908. She has a typical epileptic aura, since at that moment we were not yet able to separate the inner from the outer aura, no detailed research was carried out. At that time, we could only make a diagnosis, epilepsy. A few days later, the diagnosis was confirmed, she had a seizure over a cup of tea at her friend's house. During the next three months she had two types of seizures, Oat and Petit Mal. When she felt better, the seizure became more hysterical and was characterized by screaming and shaking of body parts that still remained under her control. Thereafter, seizures occurred every day, about an hour after waking up, the second seizure occurred in the late afternoon. For some time she visited the hospital for nervous diseases, but it did not benefit her. On November 23, 1909, 
she was prescribed 100 capsule of hyoscyamine sulfate to take in the morning. The treatment helped, because until January 30, 1910, she had only two attacks, one mild, on November 27, when she woke up because the curtains in the room were on fire. She immediately had a seizure. The second attack occurred on Christmas Day, after the holidays. She stopped taking her medication in December. In mid-December, she was examined. Her aura was well-defined, gray in color, without rays. When a dark carmine screen was applied, her aura seemed slightly altered, a more granular structure was found on the left than on the right. When she stood facing the observer, there were no stripes in the inner aura on the left, only their likeness on the right side. The width of the aura on the right was 3 inches, on the left it was only 2. The aura on the right of the head was 7.5 inches, on the left it was 5.5. When she raised her arms up, the outer aura was 9 inches on the right, tapering to 4 at the level of the lower extremities. Left, 7 and 3 inches, respectively. When she turned sideways, her external aura in front was 3 inches, internal, 2. Behind, external, 6, internal, 3. There were two compound stripes of yellow and blue uniform throughout the body, but their left side at the bottom of the body was much darker than the right. K17. Fig. 18 and 19. KH.T. Schoolboy, 13 years old. A friend of his told us that the student was having sleep seizures and that he asked his father to take the boy to a doctor. He came for examination in January 1910 and was deliberately not asked a single question before the examination. The boy had a distinct green-gray epileptic aura. When he was facing the observer, the outer aura was 6 inches and the inner aura was 3 inches to the right. On the left, the dimensions were 4 and 2 inches respectively. When he placed his hands on the back of his neck, the outer aura on the right was 4 inches, tapering half an inch towards the limbs. The inner aura was half an inch smaller than the outer. On the left side, the outer aura was 3 inches and the inner aura was about 2.5 inches around the body. Towards the lower extremities it became less than half an inch. When the subject stood sideways to the observer, the entire inner aura was 2.5 inches wide in front, and the outer aura was slightly larger. There was a similar inner aura on the back, while the outer protruded sharply by 6 inches at the waist and the rest was 3 inches. It should be noted that such protrusions in the aura behind men are rather rare. The blue compound stripe was evenly colored around the entire body, but lighter on the right side of the head than the left. We can say that it was rather strange to see the brown tint under the waist, especially on the left. This stripe was the same on both sides of the body, only the brown color was unevenly expressed. Later, the boy's father told us that the student was being treated for minor seizures, and that he had never had severe seizures. Auras in other cases of epilepsy are so similar in nature that there is no need to describe them in detail. However, it should be noted that the color of such auras is gray, one or two of them showed a faint blue tint. In none of the cases did the compound band show any changes characteristic of epilepsy. In only one case, in a patient who claims to have never had a seizure, we found two auras on one side of the body smaller than on the other. We decided that he had epilepsy even before his examination, and we still think so. Fig. 18. Epileptic aura of a boy. Fig underscore 18. Case 18, IH, a shoemaker by trade, 58 years old, father of the patients mentioned in cases 15 and 16. The shoemaker's father and uncle were exiled, the uncle until his death. The patient is very much afraid of the same fate. He becomes suddenly and unreasonably very sad. Attacks of depression last for several hours or days, sometimes for several weeks. However, this does not prevent him from continuing to work. He is also susceptible to panic attacks, shaking, attacks of terror, etc. His aura was examined in March 1910. 
It was gray in color, rough in structure, especially the inner one, on the left side of the body. When the patient was facing the observer, the outer aura around the head was 7 and the inner 2.5 on the right, the outer aura was 5 on the left and 2 inside, respectively. The outer aura along the body on the left was 2.5 inches, and the inner one is 2 inches wide. Although we had no idea what contour would be found in his aura during examination, afterwards we were able to conclude that the patient had disguised epileptic seizures. On the one hand, the general decrease in the external aura is not associated only with epilepsy. Also in other cases, we found a compressed internal aura. The aforementioned rather controversial example is an exception. Fig. 19. Epileptic aura of a boy standing sideways. Rear projection not typical for men. Fig underscore 19. Case 19, Andy, is quite interesting. In April 1907, when Andy was 22, she overworked working at school all day while preparing for exams at the same time. The patient did not sleep until almost early morning, when she had to get up. She drove home for the Easter holidays feeling unwell. Two days later she developed a high fever and had an attack of meningitis affecting both sides of the brain. She was so sick that the nurse even thought that the patient was dead. Having recovered physically, mentally, she was a different person for two years. If earlier she did not show selfishness, was diligent in her studies and compliant, now she has become stubborn, selfish, and incapable of mental concentration. It is interesting to note that Koenig's symptom was very well pronounced in her aura during her illness and remained slightly noticeable for a year and a half. In the next six months, it was no longer possible to find it. In September 1908, her aura was examined, bluish, well expressed, and when the patient was facing the observer, the left was larger than the right. The blue compound stripe stood out evenly along the entire body, but on the right it was darker than the left side. In June 1909, the patient's bodily health was good and her mental faculties were greatly improved. She stopped teaching and took up her homework. She also read a lot, but not hard literature. A new survey was carried out in November 1909. The same type of aura has been preserved, but its inequality has decreased. The ethereal double, just over 1 slash 8 inch wide, was clearly visible from both sides. When the patient was facing the viewer, her external aura around her head was 5 inches on the right and 7. On the sides along the body, the external aura on the right was 7 inches and 8 on the left. At the level of the hips and legs, there was a slight difference in size, about 4 inches. The size of the inner aura was approximately 3 inches and was uniform on both sides. When she turned sideways, there was an expansion of 3.5 inches in front and 4.5 in the back, and the inner aura was 2.5 inches front and back. It is very important to note that the inner aura was the same size on both sides. Whether her aura was the same right after her illness, of course, remains a mystery. This case is proved that the aura can shrink significantly during a temporary serious illness and that it can also be restored. This is an example of the recovery of the aura and consciousness, and the recovery of the latter preceded the auric one. Case 20. BT, unmarried woman. 37 years old, as another example of the unequal outer aura on both sides, although the inner aura was unchanged. The woman is in good health, except for a slight eczema on her face. Recently, her behavior has become strange, very extravagant, she purchased goods from stores at a cost that exceeded the financial capabilities of her mother. At the same time, her consciousness was not shaken to such an extent that she was not aware of the financial constraints, and, despite this, she became a real test for her relatives. In September 1908, the first examination of her aura was carried out. It showed that the aura on the left was two inches narrower than on the right. Due to the fact that this was one of the first cases of patient examination, we were unable to distinguish between the internal and external aura. In November 1909, 
A second survey was carried out. Her mental faculties remain the same. The inner aura, as far as can be seen, enveloped the body evenly over a width of 2.5 inches. When she stood facing the observer, the aura to the right of the head and along the right side was 10 inches, to the left it did not exceed 8 inches. The aura tapered evenly to 5 inches at the level of the lower extremities and was symmetrical. The distant border of the outer aura was 3 inches wide at the front and 7 inches at the back. The blue belt of a compound color had a dull, closer to ultramarine than blue, shade at the epigastric level. The right extension of the belt was lighter than the left. When she stood facing the observer, the aura to the right of the head and along the right side was 10 inches, to the left it did not exceed 8 inches. The aura tapered evenly to 5 inches at the level of the lower extremities and was symmetrical. The distant border of the outer aura was 3 inches wide at the front and 7 inches at the back. The blue belt of a compound color had a dull, closer to ultramarine than blue, shade at the epigastric level. The right extension of the belt was lighter than the left. When she stood facing the observer, the aura to the right of the head and along the right side was 10 inches, to the left it did not exceed 8 inches. The aura tapered evenly to 5 inches at the level of the lower extremities and was symmetrical. The distant border of the outer aura was 3 inches wide at the front and 7 inches at the back. The blue belt of a compound color had a dull, closer to ultramarine than blue, shade at the epigastric level. The right extension of the belt was lighter than the left. Closer to ultramarine than blue, a shade at the epigastric level. The right extension of the belt was lighter than the left. Closer to ultramarine than blue, a shade at the epigastric level. The right extension of the belt was lighter than the left. Fig. 20. Granular aura at the head and on the body of a woman. A spot of light color at the level of the left chest and lower part of the chest. Small dark spot near the navel. Fig underscore 20. Case 21. Fig. 20 and 21. New, 34 year old girl. Never differing in particular physical strength, she, nevertheless, did not suffer from anything serious. Recently, the girl went through difficult times that affected her health, she was depressed and felt exhausted. Complains of pain in the left side of the head, shoulders, and chest. On examination, the occipital nerve major is very sensitive, along with the left side of the spine as a whole to the lowest vertebra. Particular sensitivity was manifested in the location of the nerves, as well as at the corresponding points on the chest and abdomen. She was examined in June 1908. When she stood facing the observer, it was noticeable that her aura was wider on the right than on the left, and at the level of the body directly, the difference in width was 3 inches, but on the head this difference was minimal. On the side, the aura did not have any disturbances, that is, it was the same as one would expect in a healthy person. The blue compound belt was lighter on the left side of the chest. The demarcation line ran along the border of the midline of the body, and the transition from one side to the other was gradual. The yellow compound belt was altered. At the level of the abdomen, the color was uniform. When examining the back, its left side was lighter than the right, the vertebrae served as the demarcation line. In November 1909, another survey was carried out, her health condition remained satisfactory. When the patient stood facing the observer, her internal aura was wider at head level and over the body by 3 inches, and in other places it was just over 2 inches. The outer aura was uniform on both sides, 11 inches wide around the head, 10 along the body, and 5 around the legs. When viewed from the side, the aura from the front was 5 inches, at the waist it was 7 inches and further down, 4. Despite the fact that the outer aura was the same width at the sides, it had an interesting detail, its right outer edge was much sharper outlined than the left, which at first glance seemed to be a constriction. We will return to this feature later in the story. Her health condition remained satisfactory. When the patient stood facing the observer, 
her internal aura was wider at head level and over the body by 3 inches, and in other places it was just over 2 inches. The outer aura was uniform on both sides, around the head it was 11 inches wide, 10 along the body, and 5 around the legs. When viewed from the side, the aura from the front was 5 inches, at the waist it was 7 inches and further down, 4. Despite the fact that the outer aura was the same width at the sides, it had an interesting detail. Its right outer edge was much sharper outlined than the left, which at first glance seemed to be a constriction. We will return to this feature later in the story. Her health condition remained satisfactory. When the patient stood facing the observer, her internal aura was wider at head level and over the body by 3 inches, and in other places it was just over 2 inches. The outer aura was uniform on both sides, around the head it was 11 inches wide, 10 along the body, and 5 around the legs. When viewed from the side, the aura from the front was 5 inches, at the waist it was 7 inches and further down, 4. Despite the fact that the outer aura was the same width at the sides, it had an interesting detail, its right outer edge was much sharper than the left, which at first glance seemed to be a constriction. We will return to this feature later in the story. Elsewhere it was just over 2 inches. The outer aura was uniform on both sides, around the head it was 11 inches wide, 10 along the body, and 5 around the legs. When viewed from the side, the aura from the front was 5 inches, at the waist it was 7 inches and further down, 4. Despite the fact that the outer aura was the same width at the sides, it had an interesting detail. Its right outer edge was much sharper outlined than the left, which at first glance seemed to be a constriction. We will return to this feature later in the story. Elsewhere it was just over 2 inches. The outer aura was uniform on both sides, around the head it was 11 inches wide, 10 along the body, and 5 around the legs. When viewed from the side, the aura from the front was 5 inches, at the waist it was 7 inches and further down, 4. Despite the fact that the outer aura was the same width at the sides, it had an interesting detail. Its right outer edge was much sharper outlined than the left, which at first glance seemed to be a constriction. We will return to this feature later in the story. That the outer aura was the same width on the sides, it had a curious detail. Its right outer edge was much sharper outlined than the left one, which at first glance seemed to be narrowing. We will return to this feature later in the story. That the outer aura was the same width on the sides, it had an interesting detail. Its right outer edge was much sharper outlined than the left one, which at first glance seemed to be narrowing. We will return to this feature later in the story. Fig. 21. Granular aura at the head and body of a woman, side view. Fig underscore 21. In addition to the abnormal contour of the aura, other changes were diagnosed. The inner aura on one side of the side of the head and up to the last rib was granular, although on the other side it was not transparent, there were no other variations. On the blue compound belt, there was a huge spot on the front left, which was lighter than its right side. It covered both breasts and the rib cage below. The demarcation lines were sharp and clear, the upper one was above the mammary gland, the middle one was at the level of the middle of the sternum, and the lower one ran parallel to the costal cartilage, not reaching their lower edge by half an inch. On the abdomen, the belt was uniform, with the exception of one dark spot in the hypochondrium just above the navel. She complained of pains in this place, although they were of an extremely superficial nature. The belt on the back was even, the same color, on which two small spots were found, one of them is lighter than the main color. The spots were just below the shoulder blades. A darker spot was located above the sacrum. When touched in the area where the light spot was located, there was sensitivity. It was extremely unexpected that the edges of the belt were uniform in shade. Can healthy people have an aura that is not symmetrical on both sides? The most important question in the study. Perhaps it would be better to formulate it as follows, if the aura is not symmetrical, then can a person who looks healthy outwardly be so in reality? 
Or is there some kind of violation or constitutional latent disease in that place? Unfortunately, we are not able to answer this question due to the lack of sufficient data to allow us to draw a definite conclusion, since so far we have had to deal with only two such cases. A careful search for such characteristics was carried out, after which we came to the conclusion that this feature should be very rare. It is important to keep in mind that even a small difference in the width of the aura is very difficult to notice in men and girls of the prepubertal period. Even if, as is often the case, there is a blurring of the boundaries of the aura on one side. Accordingly, we are actually obliged to observe women in such an experiment. In each of the examples given, the patients had average, if not high, mental abilities, which is usually the case. In no case was there any bodily defect that could give a similar contour of the aura. All the women studied were well built, with a proportional body. Their health was good throughout their lives, almost never once did any of them suffer from the usual diseases that are most typical for all people. In one of the women, the aura on the smaller side did not have such a clear border as on the other, with normal dimensions. Even after considering various assumptions about the causes of this phenomenon, there was not the slightest hint of a health problem. Case 22. K.N., a tall, healthy woman, age 29 years old, had a stomach ulcer several years ago. It was the only serious illness in her entire life. She was examined in September 1908. Facing the observer, her aura was seen as a blue mist, white on both sides of the head and body, reaching to the middle of the thighs, where it abruptly broke off and merged with the contours of the body. For some unknown reason, the fog was wider on the right, reaching 12 at its widest and 3 inches at its narrowest. On the left, it was no more than 9 wide. When the patient stood sideways, the fog was 5 inches wide and 3 inches along the lower extremities in front. At the back, it was wide up to the middle of the thighs, after which it merged with the contour of the body. Case 23, E, a young girl, almost 20 years old, in good health, except for the presence of a cyst in the left breast. She is strong and has never been sick. Her family's medical history, however, is flawed. Her older sister is a little neurotic, her third sister had three seizures, and her brother's intelligence is slightly below normal. She was examined in December 1909. When she was facing the observer, the external aura measured 10 inches to the right of the head and down the body, to the left, one inch less, the aura at the feet on the right was four inches and on the left 3.5. Seen from the side, the aura measured four inches from the front, six inches at the waist, and approximately four inches along the legs. The size of the inner aura throughout the body is three inches, but no stripes were visible. When the patient turned slightly to the left, the location of the cyst was seen on the inner aura, where the auric fog had a denser and more granular structure. At the same time, it looked like a ray that came out from there, but it did not extend beyond the boundaries of the aura. The blue compound belt was uniform throughout the entire aura, except for the cyst area, there was a spot of a lighter color. Also, the belt was slightly darker above the genitals, which indicated the imminent onset of the menstrual period. The yellow compound belt included a spot at the level of the cyst. After we have taken into account the asymmetry of the aura as a whole or most of it on the one hand, the next issue that needs to be discussed is the local change in the aura. In five cases, there was a decrease in the aura and in none of the cases, an increase. Unfortunately, four of these patients were examined before we learned to distinguish between the external and internal aura, however, some of the features can be explained in accordance with our knowledge obtained in the future. Case 24. Fig. 22. H.H., a 10-year-old boy who suffered from herpes zoster for five to six days before the examination with us. The rash was located on the right side of the abdomen, at the level of the lower lumbar spine. Several spots were located in the region of the kidneys on the back. She has reached the stage of drying out. The patient's aura was usually delineated, 
measuring 6 inches around the head and 2.5 on the sides of the body. Fig. 22. Aura of a boy with a conical break on the right side. Fig underscore 22. The aura was typical of a boy his age, with the exception of a feature located at the level between the sternum and the iliac crest. It curved up from the sternum towards the twelfth rib and from there straightened again to the iliac crest. This gave the impression of a conical depression in which there was no aura at all. There was a feeling that the base of the cone directly touched the body, and at the same time, the adjacent areas of the aura remained completely unchanged in texture or color. When examined with a blue composite color transversely, the right half of the body was darker, and, accordingly, the left half was lighter. With the same method of examining the back, the color remained the same until the 11th dorsal vertebra, and below it became darker, the transition from one color to another was sharp. Whichever side, except the front, no examination was carried out, there were no signs of the aforementioned peculiarity of the aura. During the lateral examination, the patient's aura was excellent both in front and behind. Case 25, 10 days after examining a previous patient, we were given the opportunity to investigate another case of herpes zoster, thanks to Dr. Merrick. In this case, the patient was also a boy of the same age, his rash was at an earlier stage and appeared three days ago. The place of its localization was the lower part of the chest in front. When the boy was facing the researcher, the left side of his aura was perfectly normal, about two inches wide, and six above his head. The right side of the aura in the area just below the armpits curved inward to the sixth rib, where it apparently came into contact with the body. Just above the iliac crest, the aura curved first inward and then outward until its edge seemed to touch the body at a distance of one inch in the middle of the outer curve, leaving space without an aura at all. Before the study was completed, Two false beams were found exiting at the edges of the bends, one on the outer bend and one on the inner bend. These rays blurred the boundaries of the aura in those places, since they were coarser and lighter than the rest of the aura. As soon as the boy turned sideways, no anomaly was found. When using a blue belt, the right side of the body was transversely darker than the left. We could not find anything else, because the boy's mother was in a hurry about her business. When using the blue belt, the right side of the body was transversely darker than the left. We could not find anything else, because the boy's mother was in a hurry about her business. When using the blue belt, the right side of the body was transversely darker than the left. We could not find anything else, because the boy's mother was in a hurry about her business. In this case, the lighter and denser structure of the false rays towards the edges of the gap was similar to the granular tissue of the aura, which is often observed in the inner auras and does not go beyond its limits. It was just that the aura was interrupted and it is likely that the external aura was also affected. Case 26 This is a very interesting case involving a little girl, N.H., 7 years old, who in May 1908 began complaining of pain in her right leg. She was diagnosed with early tuberculosis of the hips. Calmet's test, tuberculosis ophthalmic, showed a reaction. She was urgently sent to the children's hospital, where she remained until January 1909, after which she arrived at the nursing home. We examined her in February of the same year, a few days after returning home. She looked great and her hip could do any kind of movement. Her aura was quite well developed, gray-blue in color, two inches wide. The aura was visible all over her body, as expected for a girl her age. However, when she faced the viewer, she could see a funnel two inches long at the level of the hip joint. It was so clearly visible that her mother saw it immediately. The edges of the aura, instead of curving, were straight, as if someone had cut out a whole piece in that place. This feature was visible only when the girl was facing the observer, there was no such thing on the sides. The blue compound belt was uniform throughout the body, while there was a spot of a lighter color in the problem area when viewed from the side. Unfortunately, her family moved to Scotland, so further testing was not possible. 
On the problem area there was a spot of a lighter color when viewed from the side. Unfortunately, her family moved to Scotland, so further testing was not possible. On the problem area there was a spot of a lighter color when viewed from the side. Unfortunately, her family moved to Scotland, so further testing was not possible. This was an example of another interesting case, different from all others, in which an unusual change in aura was detected using a light crimson screen. Case 27. FD, a woman in her 30s, single, who had all the symptoms of a duodenal ulcer. She was examined in August 2010. The aura around her head and body reached 9 inches when she stood facing the observer, and, gradually tapering towards the knees, was then unchanged. The inner aura, 2.5 inches wide, was so clearly visible that it could be observed without the use of special screens. In the region from 6 to 10, the costal cartilage of the chest, the aura was coarser in structure, granular and very distinct. This property was also expressed from the front, which we observed when the woman gradually turned sideways. However, no change was visible either from the front or from the back if she was facing the observer. When the examination was carried out with the light carmine screen B, the internal aura completely disappeared at the level of the 7 to 9 costal cartilage of the chest, but when viewed against a black background, it seemed like an empty black space with granular upper and lower edges. And the outer aura seemed to be unchanged, having a sharp proximal edge and the same distance from the body as the peripheral edge of the inner aura below and above. When examined with a dark carmine screen A, the entire outer aura became darkened, leaving a hole in the inner one. At the level of the compound stripe in the dorsal region, a narrow stripe was visible on the left, slightly lighter than the rest of the area, near the third dorsal vertebra. In front, there was a small dark spot in the center, which was stretched more to the right than to the left. On the midline of the body, the belt became a darker shade on the right side, but the colors changed so smoothly that it was impossible to distinguish the boundaries. This incident almost proves that the two auras have different origins. In the above cases, we have examples of voids in the aura that are not filled with anything. These voids can only be observed under favorable circumstances and in parts. Until now, none of these voids have been found anywhere other than on the side of the body. The reason for this is obvious. The aura is not so deep in front and behind when the patient stands sideways to the observer. The density of the aura in front and behind, or only in one place, hides any traces of voids, except for changes in the density of the structure. In the same way, an increase in the density or brightness of the aura will make the voids undetectable. One of the prerequisites for detecting them is a proper background. The best background for these purposes is a rich black color, and light colors are absolutely useless. In Chapter 3 it was shown that the auric forces emanate from the body in straight lines at right angles. If, for some reason, a limited part of the aura is disturbed to such an extent that no auric rays come out from there, then around such an area the healthy part will emit radiation in the usual way, and in that place a cylindrical void with long axial lines directed at right angles to body. Often, instead of a distinctive demarcation line separating the healthy and diseased areas of the aura, one can find a zone whose radiations are changed or equal to zero, while they are restored depending on the distance from the diseased area. The result of this will be the formation of cone-shaped structures in the aura, however, with an increase in the size of the structure, the void will be less saturated. Cone-shaped structures are quite difficult to detect due to their structure, except for cases such as described in example 25, where such a structure had a large volume. The impact of structures on the compound belt has already been described above. In this regard, let us consider another example, case 28, which today is both unique and interesting. This is a case of shingles, the damaged surface was so extensive that there was a high probability that there was no aura in that place. We were ready to discover some kind of anomaly, but we did not know what form it would take. Unfortunately, the aura of this patient was poorly defined, its size was barely medium, but it was easily visible. 
when he extended his arm to the side, the aura corresponding to the side of the lesion had a distinctive appearance, in structure like a honeycomb, with vacuoles, underhand, and next to the body. At first, this phenomenon was difficult to explain, then, when we remembered that the auric radiations go at right angles to the body, it became clear to us how the cells were formed according to the type of honeycomb, in this case, the radiation came from the hand, body, armpits and crossing in a vacuum, gave such a pattern. This effect could be enhanced both in front and behind the pathological area, depending on the degree of health of the examined aura. Case 28, FF, 22 years old, shoemaker. At the age of 7, he suffered from a hip joint disease and for several years suffered from an abscess caused by a splitting of the femur. He was operated on several times, but for the past five years he has been in good health. He has not complained about anything. Last week, he noticed a rash on his chest, armpits, and the inside of his arm. There was also a stain on the back. Examination revealed a herpes patch about an inch and a half below the right collarbone. The entire right armpit and three quarters of the space under the arm, as well as a small area on the back near the spine in the region of the third spinal vertebra were covered with the rash. The bubbles were enormous, some up to an inch and a half in length. There could be no doubt that this was a severe case of shingles. Examination of this patient revealed a blue-gray aura of below average transparency. When he stood facing the observer, it was normal on the left side, the outer aura was three inches wide, and the inner aura was two and a half. There were no differences in the front and back compared to the aura of a healthy person, its width was also the same. The reason that no changes could be detected was obviously that the healthy part covered the sick part. When he again turned to face the observer, the aura around the head was normal, but as soon as the patient raised both arms, the structure under the right arm and slightly below along the body was changed, granular. Although not to the same extent as is usually the case with this defect in the aura. Against a black background, the aura seemed like a fog with a structure of dark honeycomb. The visible effect is very difficult to describe, and the structure of the granular part can be explained only by the fact that the aura has lost part of its substance in that place. In addition, the inner and outer aura seemed to be completely mixed, because there was not a single sign of their difference. Below the area with the altered structure, the aura regained its healthy properties for a short period. Opposite the ilium, at the level of the iliac crest and towards the lower body, a section, about 5 inches long, had a similar painful structure to that described earlier, only the section was less pronounced. He was in the area of a previously diseased joint. Because not a single sign of their distinction was found. Below the area with the altered structure, the aura regained its healthy properties for a short period. Opposite the ilium, at the level of the iliac crest and towards the lower body, a section, about 5 inches long, had a similar painful structure to that described earlier, only the section was less pronounced. He was in the area of a previously diseased joint. Because not a single sign of their distinction was found. Below the area with the altered structure, the aura regained its healthy properties for a short period. Opposite the ilium, at the level of the iliac crest and towards the lower body, a section, about 5 inches long, had a similar painful structure to that described earlier, only the section was less pronounced. He was in the area of a previously diseased joint. Case 29. Fig. 23. D. Unmarried woman, 47 years old. Housewife. She is now in the climacteric period. She suffered from poor digestion for many years. In the last few months, she has been suffering from a feeling of tremendous discomfort and pain after eating, which usually begins an hour and a half later and lasts an hour and a half or more. The abdomen is distended and full of flatulence, the patient is constipated. At the end of July 1908, she underwent the first examination. The aura on the left side of the head and along the body had a normal structure for a woman, 
and somewhere in the middle of the thigh it sharply contracted to the very minimum. At its widest point, the aura was 7 inches wide. The aura on the right was unusual. In the head region, it was no different from the previously described aura on the left, but reaching the nipples and being 6.5 inches wide, it suddenly curved inward, almost to the level of the navel. Fig. 23. Painful aura. Incorrect aura size with gradual recovery. Dark spot on the right side. Fig underscore 23. When the patient stood sideways to the observer, the features of the aura were not visible either from the front or from the back. When a complex blue stripe was applied transversely in the hypochondrium, a square dark spot was observed. It began at the level of the midline of the body, its upper edge was in the region of the xiphoid process. This space was several shades darker than the rest of the strip, the demarcation lines of the spot are very clearly defined. Palpation revealed tenderness of the liver, as well as tenderness of a spot two inches above the navel and the same distance to the right of the midline of the body. It was particularly responsive to examination. Despite suspicions, no malignant tumors were found. The patient showed significant improvement after the treatment. In October 1908, she was examined again. The aura was unchanged except for the right side. It no longer bent as much as before, and gradually began to expand where it reached constant constriction. The final narrowing occurred at the same level as before, as on the left, at the level of the thigh. Six months later, the bend of the aura on the right at the level of the thigh could still be observed, but its degree was less, no other changes in the aura were distinguished. As the aura seemed to be regaining its correct dimensions, another examination was carried out in October 1909. The patient again suffered from indigestion in the last six weeks before the study, within three weeks she received treatment and felt much better. The contour of the aura when examined facing the observer was almost symmetrical on both sides. The altered part of the aura began at the level of the xiphoid process and reached the area just above the pelvis. Here the aura looked dull, was rough in texture and not as blue as in the healthy part when examined without color screens or using their light range. This place had lighter borders extending from the body. Beams borders differed in transparency from other beams of the aura. When using the dark carmine screen, an internal aura measuring 2 inches was visible. It was well defined, as was the ethereal counterpart, presenting a darker outline 1 slash eighth of an inch wide. In the altered area, the inner aura was narrower, had no stripes and had a rough texture. This showed that even if the aura regained its size, the texture still remained the same. When the blue stripe was applied, a square-shaped spot was again found in the hypochondrium, differing in color from the rest, but the difference was no longer as pronounced as before. On the right side, the shade was darker than on the left, but here, too, the color became more even. In Fig. 23 shows a gradual improvement in the aura over time. Several months later, this patient was examined again and her health was normal. The aura has acquired a natural size throughout the body, including on the sides. However, the texture on the right never fully recovered. It was again rough and opaque, but it still showed stripes, although the lines themselves seemed to be unhealthy. The upper and lower borders of the diseased aura were, respectively, in the region of the xiphoid process and extended to the pelvic bones, they were visible better than the rest of the area. With the compound blue belt, the huge patch on the belly was still visible, but not as clear as before. It continued in the back area. A compound belt was immediately applied, and we found a pronounced dark spot without specific boundaries in the lumbosacral region. The patient said that the day before she had pains in this place, on palpation, there was a sensitivity of this area. Until now, Changes in the aura have been taken into account only when the observer was facing the observer. This is how you can compare the left and right parts of the aura. They should be the same in width and ideally symmetrical. If inconsistencies are found, the healthy part of the aura acts as a standard for research. If, 
However, the subject stands sideways to the observer to examine the aura from the front and back, then there is a great difficulty, since we do not have natural standards for measurements in the case of decreasing or increasing size. In the future, it is necessary to put forward hypotheses in relation to the variety of auras encountered in healthy people and rely more on experience, mentally compare the aura that is considered healthy with the examined one. Generally speaking, we have no problems in studying the auras of prepubertal men and young girls, because these auras are the same throughout the body. The study of women and girls aged 14 and over is more difficult and requires standards. One of the best standards we can offer, although there is some objection to it, is to use the widest part of the aura around the body as the unit of measurement, and correlate the width of the aura from the front, back and side to give a fractional proportion. In a healthy adult woman, the proportion for the aura in front of the body will rarely exceed two-thirds, and we have not seen cases when the ratio was one-half. The dorsal aura of a woman without neurotic tendencies rarely reaches two-thirds of the pleural aura. Naturally, any other proportion of the above will be pathological. For girls with a transitional aura, the difficulty increases significantly. It will be necessary to make assumptions about the progress of the growth of the aura. Until now, we have not yet observed a decrease in the aura, which can be defined precisely as a decrease, in front or behind, but we expect at any moment that we will be able to encounter this. It will be necessary to make assumptions about the progress of the growth of the aura. Until now, we have not yet observed a decrease in the aura, which can be defined precisely as a decrease, in front or behind, but we expect at any moment that we will be able to encounter this. It will be necessary to make assumptions about the progress of the growth of the aura. Until now, we have not yet observed a decrease in the aura, which can be defined precisely as a decrease, in front or behind, but we expect at any moment that we will be able to encounter this. Almost without exception, the external aura does not show pronounced growth either in general or in large areas on the back, except in cases with neurotic patients. However, we have had patients with a neurotic tendency who did not show an increase in the dorsal aura. There are two main types of changes in this aura. While this classification may seem artificial, it includes very different cases. In the first case, the aura goes down from the head and is wide from the back, without contracting in size, at least to the lower part of the middle of the thighs. In the second case, it begins to expand below the shoulders, reaches a maximum in the lumbar region and bends sharply inward just below the buttocks. It is necessary to fully realize that the growth of the aura refers to its lateral regions, the ratio being more than two-thirds. In about 10 cases of hysteria, all surveyed women and girls showed a special type of aura of the second type, without any exceptions. It seems that the second type is inherent to a greater extent, if not completely, precisely in this temperament, and in the future we will consider that this form is a special feature of the hysterical aura. Auras of the first type are the least common compared to the second, and can be observed in the case of several specific diseases. We have only a few examples at our disposal. 1. Surveyed in 1908 B, a married woman, 42 years old, from whom both ovaries were removed 16 years ago. When she stood facing the observer, the aura was 7.5 inches wide on the sides. When turned sideways from the back, the size of the aura was the same, and from the front it was 4 inches. She showed no neurotic tendencies. 2. A 29-year-old woman, casually mentioned in case 15, comes from a highly neurotic family, although she herself does not seem neurotic at all, was examined with the following aura sizes, lateral, 7 inches, dorsal, 6, and frontal, 4. 3. An epileptic girl who has not had a seizure in the past 3 years had an aura 10 inches wide at the sides, 7 inches on the back and 4 inches in front. 4. See case number 21. 5. A girl of almost 19 years old who had only 2 menstrual periods. Lags behind in development. When facing the viewer, her aura is 7 inches at the sides, 
and when viewed from the side is 5.5 inches wide at the back and 3 inches at the front. It is possible that in this case the difference in width is temporary and will become normal when it reaches adulthood. It was also observed that in patients with an abnormally wide dorsal aura, the frontal one was also wide. The next question to be considered is the study of partial aura enlargement. This phenomenon always occurs in pregnant women and is of a temporary, purely physiological nature. In fact, as will be shown later, an increase in the aura in the chest and abdomen is one of the signs of pregnancy. With the exception of the state of pregnancy, such a partial increase in the aura does not seem to be frequent, we have observed only one pronounced case. The shape of the investigated aura was so unusual that at first we thought that we were mistaken and repeated the experiments a few days later with the same result. Case 30, Fig. 24. A woman of 58 years old, of a fairly strong constitution, prone to bouts of bronchitis with a cough that disappears for a while, was examined in March 1909. She suffered from poor digestion, constipation, and bloating. No organic disorders were found in her. Symptoms disappeared with treatment. Fig. 24. A highly abnormal form of the aura. Fig underscore 24. Her belly was enormous, and due to the fact that she was plump and plump, the impression was created that she was allegedly six months pregnant. The aura was blue-gray in color. When the patient was facing the viewer, the aura at the sides was 7 inches, tapering to 2.5 at the level of the lower thighs and along the legs. When turned sideways, the aura on the back in the area of the shoulders was 2.5 inches and the same length from the middle of the body and below, and the middle part between them had a convex appearance and size of 6 inches. The side view of the aura from the front was even more unusual, as it was 2 inches wide opposite the rib cage and increased sharply to 6 inches at the level of the protruding abdomen, returning again to 2 inches below the hips, no further change. We are unable to explain the phenomenon of this particular aura. Since both classified types of aura have different structures, we expected to find that sometimes they can also have changes in size and substance. This turned out to be a correct assumption. Investigating the inner aura at the beginning, we found that in most cases the change in the size of the aura was accompanied by a modification of the texture, so these two must be taken into account together, in which case, it would be appropriate to make a few comments regarding the variations in texture that may be exposed to inner auras. It should be remembered that a healthy inner aura consists of a very fine granular haze, and seems to be perforated by some force, which gives it a streaky color. This aura hardly changes in width at any point in the body, so it can be considered a product of auric force number 1, described on page 101, meaning p. 101 of the original 1911 edition, emanating from the body and acting on the ether. This force is obviously sufficiently constant in its tension and is capable of pouring out its energy over short distances. Its nature is unknown, but it is quite possible that it is different from that which generates the external aura. When there is any deviation in the state of hell, general or local, this force is influenced, which, accordingly, changes the aura. Illness always provokes a change in the texture of the aura, this can be seen as when applied spectra auronine screen, and without it, however, for full clarity of observation requires the use of a dark carmine screen. The very first, easily noticeable change is the loss of the aura bands, if not complete, then partial, with their simultaneous fading and attendant difficulties in detecting them. Along with the presence of stripes in the aura, a healthy structure also presupposes the presence of incredibly thin granules in its texture, which in case of illness are replaced by coarse and opaque ones. Obviously, new coarse structures are formed by mixing several small ones. The sizes of such granules are very different in each case, although we have found a dominant size, giving a distinctive appearance to the affected part. Granules can be classified as fine, fine, medium, and large, coarse, depending on the case. When such granules appear, 
the entire structure is lost. The force that distinguishes the aura is usually present and does not change its action, which can be seen from the constant value of the width of the aura. Once a granular structure appears, it may take a long time for the aura to return to its previous state. An example would be a woman who had this feature seven weeks later after finding stiffness in her neck. The patient was examined approximately five months after the discovery of the pathology. The base spot was 1.5 inches wide and 2 inches high. The distal border consisted of a number of points, one higher than the other up to the highest point. On the other side, the points gradually decreased in position in the same way. Under the light red spectroronine screen, the spot had fine granules, although they were previously rough. When using compound color belts, blue and green were darker on the right side of the aura, and yellow was the same on both sides. It has been found that the internal aura of people of strong constitution and good health is usually more extended than that of people of thin constitution, and it is very unlikely that it is different on the sides. A larger margin is evidence of an anomaly. However, it is quite rare that there are difficulties with diagnostics, due to the fact that such changes are visible directly, or using a complex color screen. It will be found that any contraction in the inner aura will lead to changes in the outer. This rule does not work in the reverse order. See cases 20 and 21. It is worthy of mention that when the inner aura is changed, the patient will always suffer from some serious illness. Examination of patients with epilepsy shows that the entire left side of the inner aura will be narrower, and on the right it will retain its healthy appearance. The changes in the aura do not end there. There will also be coarse texture on the left side or granulation, and the stripes are hardly distinguishable or completely absent in some cases. Such a one-sided narrowing of the inner aura on the left is more characteristic of epilepsy than changes in the outer aura, which are always striking and were discovered earlier. It is more than likely that the changes in the aura begin from the midline of the body, both front and back. However, we have not found any way to confirm this assumption. Cases in which the internal aura is changed locally are more common than those in which the whole or most of the aura on one side is modified. As you might expect, there are places that are subject to change more than others. One of these is the lumbar spine and sacrum area. The location is slightly different from woman to woman and includes the usual granular structure when examined with a dark carmine screen. When this site is affected, the common complaint of patients is back pain during menstrual periods. Because menstruation occurs regularly for short periods, the aura does not have enough time to recover before another pain attack. We noticed for a long time that we can diagnose a change in the structure of the aura and that the use of a compound belt very often gave out a dark spot in that place. We could not understand where it came from. This dark spot in the compound belt does not form in either prepubertal girls or postmenopausal women and disappears during pregnancy. As additional evidence, a young woman recently reported that she never had lumbosacral pain during her periods and the composite belt showed no color change. However, it had a bright spot, one and a half inches in diameter, above the first lumbar vertebra. When asked if she had pain or sensitivity in that place, she replied that in the last two weeks she had not, although she had experienced severe pain before, and once she was so severe that she had to go to bed. This is another case in which the aura took a long time to return to normal after granulation. Can the inner aura increase locally? This is one of the questions, the answer to which is in the case of pregnancy and is due to physiology. Whether the inner aura changes during illness is another question that does not have an easy solution. First of all, when the inner aura becomes granular, and this is revealed through the dark carmine screen, the diseased segment of the inner aura increases in width compared to the healthy one. But does granulation occur only in the inner aura? or is the outer one also subject to changes? The structure of the external aura must be taken into account. In a healthy state, the part of the external aura that begins immediately after the internal one has a more granular structure than its other, distant boundaries. Granules of various sizes merge imperceptibly into one another. When a local health disorder occurs, 
granules adjacent to the inner aura seem to be affected, but not to the same extent. As the inner aura becomes different, simultaneously changes occur in the outer one, which is often determined by chromatic changes in the compound belt above that area. They are similar to those in the inner aura. It seems impossible to decide whether the increase in one aura occurred at the expense of another. Fortunately, the answer to this question is not practical. Case 30 is very interesting in connection with this argument because it is an example of an apparent increase in granulation of the inner aura. The change was easy to see when compared to the adjacent striped part of the aura. However, it does not shed light on the first question posed, since it arose under the influence of various circumstances. Initially, there was a physiological increase here, which, later, due to its mild local action, became pathologically granular. Sometimes there is a decrease in the strength of the inner aura, accompanied by its local contraction. Under certain conditions, the auric forces can cease their action altogether, which leads to a complete interruption of the aura. These changes have been documented elsewhere. Summing up, we can say that the inner aura does not change its size or shape to a large extent, the main smooth changes appear in the texture variation. With the exception of these cases, it is obvious that changes in the shape and size of the external aura are more common and deeper, and structural, either barely noticeable or delicate and almost undetectable. It is impossible to say much about the color of the aura, because preparing the eyes for mechanical observation of the aura does not allow one to appreciate the extensive changes in the color palette. Basically, the colors are reduced to blue and gray, or mixing them in different proportions. Temperament and mental ability, more than any temporary change in bodily health, seems to be represented by an aura tinge. For research purposes, we have classified the shades into three groups. The first contains people with a blue aura, the second, with a mixed aura of blue-gray color and the third, with completely gray. The classification was obtained from the study of the first hundred people. It would be correct to note that the ratio of healthy people is greater than our subsequent studies contain. 1. The aura is blue. 40 people. Individuals with above average intelligence, none below average. 2. Blue aura with varying degrees of gray. 36 cases, including one case of hemilogia, two epilepsy, and one meningitis. The mental capacity of the patient with meningitis appears to have recovered after three years. 3. Gray aura. 17 cases, including two eccentric people, six cases of epilepsy, one general paralysis, and three mentally retarded. In the seven remaining cases, the color of the aura was not detected. It can be seen from this table that the owners of the blue aura are the most mentally developed people. A gray aura appears to be a sign of mental deficiency if it is congenital, although it remains unclear if the aura becomes gray due to mental loss in the event of illness. That's quite possible. It should be added that when the aura is called blue, or other colors, then, as a rule, other bright colors will not be observed in it, because the auric haze is light and almost colorless. Human Atmosphere Chapter 6 Composite Colors in Case of Illness Chapter 6 Composite Colors in Case of Illness The theory of the complementary colored band, here in after CC band, has already been described in another chapter C. Chapter 4 Approximate trans. At present, it remains to consider the practical use of this band both in the field of health and in relation to diseases. As with most other scientific research methods, it also requires a certain amount of skill. Even after the technique of using CC stripes has been mastered according to the instructions already given above, it will still be difficult to understand the meaning and cause of any changes in color shades of CC stripes on a large or small part of the body. It is very important to acquire speed in perceiving the change in shades of the CC bands, not only to save time, but, as far as possible, to prevent excessive eye strain. 
and also because the light passing through the color CC strip is constantly changing in tones and shades. It is during this period that the changes are most obvious. It takes a long period of hard work and so many cases that go far beyond our capabilities and resources to get a complete solution to various problems. All we can hope for is providing a little help to other workers in this area. It is generally impractical, if not impossible, to examine the entire body in one sitting with this method, especially if several CC stripes are used, as the observer's eyes become tired and unable to appreciate small differences in shades of CC stripes. For the same reason, if the patient's history is known to a certain extent, more attention can be paid to those parts of the body that are most likely to be affected by the disease. Again, when the shape and general characteristics of the aura are examined, it is often possible to find an anomaly that will indicate the position of some disorder. The following notes, unless otherwise noted, apply to the blue optional CC color bar as in the previous chapters. When the CC stripe is used vertically on the chest and abdomen of healthy men and children, the color will remain uniform along the entire length, unless there are age spots on the skin. This statement does not apply to girls older than puberty, or to adult women, because in these cases the CC band will have an evenly distributed color along the entire length, while elsewhere it will be darker at a short distance below the navel. The place where this change is most noticeable is at a distance of 5 to 6 centimeters above the pubis. This CC stripe color change will be found to coincide with female sexual function. One of the three things is marked on the belly of women with a vertical CC stripe, which is monochromatic. The most common reason is that a woman has finished her last menstrual period at least two or three days later, and that she is not expecting it for the next four or five days. If a woman expects her period to begin during this time, it will most likely be delayed. The second cause is amenorrhea, and the third is early pregnancy. As the menstrual period approaches, the CC band will darken, slightly at first, but gradually more as time approaches. The color will gradually transition from lighter to darker, without any specific demarcation line, so comparison is best made between the distant parts of the strip. This gradual shading is important, as it often serves to distinguish between the shade of the aura due to sexual function and the shade that is characteristic of the abdominal organs. The darkening of the CC band in the lower abdomen also depends on other reasons, therefore, of course, this will be an insurmountable obstacle to the calculation of the menstrual period. If the patient is the mother of children, it is often necessary to make some corrections for pigmentation in that part of the body, but usually no major difficulty arises if precautions are taken. An interesting case related to this subject is the case of a 38-year-old woman who began to darken the CC band just above the pubis. When told that she could expect the next month period in about six or seven days, she replied that this should not happen within two weeks. This was flagged as an erroneous prediction. However, two months later we saw this woman again. Suddenly she said, remember you said that my period will go away in about a week? Well, they came seven days later, that is, a week before the appropriate time. In another case, a young woman expected her period in three or four days. She did not show any changes in the CC band above the pubis. In the end, it turned out that her period was a week after the correct date. The knowledge gained from CC stripes in relation to sexual function when applied vertically to the chest and abdomen will be useful preliminary data for other observations, since with this method we can determine if there is any color modification in different parts of the CC. Stripes, whether it is a transition from one shade to another gradual or sharp with a clear line of demarcation, it will also show the upper and lower bounds of the aura in which the change took place. It will be found that the CC band is in most cases wide enough for the observer to see if there is any difference in the color of the aura on the two lateral halves of the body, and to roughly determine their position. Subsequently, the cross CC band can be used to clarify all the details. This latter strip has a great advantage over the vertical strip because during most of the observation time only the central zone is used, 
which is less difficult to see and more free from observation errors than when using the ends. Case 21 is instructive and exemplary. When the SS band was used vertically down the midline of the chest and abdomen, the left side appeared lighter than the right, over a considerable length of the CC strip, since its upper edge was in the upper part of the nipple. While the lower border of the CC strip coincided with the lower part of the sternum, the vertical stripe also showed that the two shades of CC stripe color were separated by a clear demarcation line that corresponded to the midline of the body. Below the belly was a small patch of a different shade on the far right edge just above the navel. This provided useful information for further cross CC band research, the results of which have been described elsewhere. When the observer begins to examine the spine with the SS strip, he will consider it appropriate to divide the examination into two parts, since the strip is not long enough to cover the entire space from the neck to the sacrum at the same time. It is also advisable to note, in particular, the color of the skin above the spine, since often these parts have a different shade from the adjacent part of the body. This could be completely natural pigmentation, or the change in color could be caused by pressure from the clothing. When the observer looks at the spine directly, then he is likely to detect some change in the shade of the CC band, if there is any deviation. The most common abnormalities found by the CC stripe on the back are spots on the spine itself, lighter or darker depending on the circumstances. They can be located on any part along the entire length. However, the most common place is just below the lower vertebrae and sacrum in women, where the CC band is constantly darker. The reason for this has already been indicated. Two other very likely positions for CC stripe color change are to be found above the last dorsal and first lumbar vertebrae, as well as above the seventh cervical and superior dorsal vertebrae. With the exception of the sacral spot, they are often both light and dark spots, and it is not uncommon to find one or more areas of each of their species occurring at the same time. Another fairly common anomaly is the appearance of a light or dark streak on the lateral surface of the spine, while the spine itself remains normal. Spots are invariably associated with pain or sensitization, not necessarily only at the time of examination, as it may even take several weeks for these pains to completely disappear. The same case mentioned had a small light spot above the second and third lumbar vertebrae and nowhere else. The patient stated that she had had no pain for two weeks, but had previously experienced rheumatic pain in this area for a short time. Once it was so serious that she even had to lie down. A spot on or near the spine, which has a lighter shade than the rest of the CC band, convincingly shows that there is no organic harm and that the cause is temporary and most often of nervous origin. Darker spots usually occur due to a more chronic cause, in addition to being often the result of rheumatism. The following case is interesting as an illustration of the above remarks, as well as the kind of aura of the hysterical type. Case 31, figs. 25, 26, 27. S, a married woman in her 20s, without children, has complained for the past six weeks of an illness that was aggravated by any kind of anxiety. Within three months she lost weight, had regular periods, and sometimes suffered from hysterical bladder. Her rib cage has a peculiar shape, she is straight, a chest notch at the level of the nipples, although her breasts are not hanging at all. She has soreness in the epigastrium, and the pressure causes pain between the shoulders. When she stood facing the observer, her aura was 25 centimeters wide around her head, the same width on the sides of her torso. But her aura suddenly curved inward, reaching a minimum just below the level of her pubis, from where she went down evenly. The outer edge was not very clearly marked. When she turned to the side the aura swelled in the lumbar region to a width of about 20 centimeters and quickly curved inward below the buttocks, where it squeezed and continued to descend evenly downward. Down the front of the torso and limbs, the aura was about 10 centimeters wide. The inner aura was about 6 centimeters wide throughout the body. Weak rays emanated from each shoulder, and another ray outward from the lower right ribs. The inner aura over the lower lumbar vertebrae and sacrum was granular, 
and the adjacent part of the outer aura was similarly affected. When the SS band and from the lower right rips outward, another ray. The inner aura over the lower lumbar vertebrae and sacrum was granular, and the adjacent part of the outer aura was similarly affected. When the SS band and from the lower right rips outward, another ray. The inner aura over the lower lumbar vertebrae and sacrum was granular, and the adjacent part of the outer aura was similarly affected. When the SS band was used when examining the chest and abdomen, its color was uniform. On the back, the CC stripe showed a long, lighter colored patch next to and parallel to the spine. This spot ran from the third to the ninth dorsal vertebrae. It had a clear outline and was about 2.5 centimeters wide, but it was dark in color. We considered this clinical case to be a consequence of the patient's nervousness and treated her accordingly, as a result of which she recovered quickly. Fig. 25. Hysterical aura in a woman. Wide along the body and narrow at the legs. Fig 25. Fig. 26. Hysterical aura in a woman. Side view. Large bulge in the lower back. Fig 26. Fig. 27. Two colorless spots on the side, visible with the CC band. The upper spot is light, the lower ones are dark. Fig 27. The observer should not expect to see lighter or darker spots in the CC band in all the painful areas that the patient complains about. Precise proportions are invisible. Some of the colorless spots are so clearly marked that they can be detected by a very superficial eye, while others are so poorly distinguished from the rest of the CC band that they require keen vision and a trained eye to see them. It is difficult to understand why some local disturbances must cause a sufficient change in the aura to induce a chromatic change, while others, seemingly similar in every respect, give negative results. The intensity of health impairment is certainly not one of the main factors affecting auric changes. It is instructive to note that these light and dark spots in the CC band when projected onto the spinal column are extremely rare among men and most numerous among hysterical, nervous, or excitable girls and women. When the direct verification with the vertical CC stripe has been completed, and after the position of any local anomaly has been determined, the transverse CC stripe will complement all the information that can be obtained using the CC stripe method. This will allow the observer to examine the two sides of the body and at the same time notice if one of its extensions has been affected. Typically, it will be found that the CC swath is wide enough to cover the entire affected area, but sometimes two observations are required. This stage of testing is one in which it is determined whether the discolored spot extends over the entire width of the body or only over a part of it. You also need to determine if the spot is on one side of the midline or intersects it, or it is just a small spot surrounded by an unmodified CC. Band. When a chronic case affects a large area of the aura, there is usually a deeper shade, but exceptions are not uncommon. For example, see case 21. Although any part of the body may have a large discolored spot, this occurs more frequently in certain cases than in others. A common situation is a hypochondriac with half the epigastric regions. The following case is a very good illustration of the above remark. Case 32. A childless woman in her 30s who has been married for several years. For over 12 months she suffered from abdominal pain that worsened after eating and was often relieved only by vomiting. She is constantly ill, suffers from heartburn, but has never vomited blood. The fear of pain prevents her from eating the right food, as a result of which she becomes emaciated, weak and anemic. When analyzing these and other symptoms, we thought that there was a stomach ulcer, but with treatment it gradually began to get better. When she was examined in April 1909, her aura was found to be blue and there were no abnormalities in shape, except that she was rather small. Around her head, the aura was slightly less in width than her shoulders, and when she stood facing the observer with her arms raised, located behind her head, her aura was 20 centimeters wide on the sides of her torso, 
dropping to about mid-thighs before it finally narrowed down to 7 centimeters. From there it continued down unchanged. When she turned sideways, the aura was about 8 centimeters from the body and limbs. Behind, it was just over 5 centimeters wide at the level of the shoulder blades, and the same width at the most prominent part of the buttocks, from where it continued downward unchanged. There was a slight bulge between the shoulders and buttocks, extending up to 13 centimeters at its widest part. The rays came from different parts of the body that were brighter than the rest of the aura. There were two beams, one on each side, going up the sides of the head, one on each side, going up and out, and on the right side, the other down. All these rays were visible when she stood facing us. When she was examined with the SS strip, nothing abnormal was found behind her aura, that is, there were no spots of a lighter or darker shade. When this CC strip was applied vertically overlooking the ribcage and abdomen, a darker shade appeared, gradually starting about halfway between the navel and pubes. There was also another patch on the epigastric region. As soon as the CC strip was used in the transverse direction, it was seen that this last section had its upper edge in the sternum region, the lower one was about 5 centimeters above the navel, and the inner border represented the midline of the body, forming a rectangular space from the midline aside. As far as it was visible, there were several spots with shades darker than the rest of the CC band. Extensions outside the body. Unfortunately, after recuperating for several months, on January 11, 1910, she had a relapse, and since she could not properly treat him at home, she was sent to the hospital for gastric ulcer treatment. She walked out of the hospital, recovered from all pain, and was able to eat solid food without discomfort. She was re-examined in March 1910. The outer aura remained the same as described above, while the inner aura appeared to be about 5 centimeters around her body. When she stood facing the observer, the internal aura was lined up on the right side, but to the left of the level of the nipples to the iliac crest, it was roughly granulated, and when she turned sideways, the granules were visible all over the surface of the left side of the chest and abdomen between the same levels. When the CC stripe was applied across this body part, the large spot was clearly visible, but it may not have been as noticeable as it was before. There was a slight change in the shape of the lower edge from the midline curved outward along the curved costal cartilage. The left extension was still darker than the right. Two discolored spots were visible on the back, one to the right of the third and fourth dorsal vertebrae. Here she experienced a little pain, but only recently. One to the right of the third and fourth dorsal vertebrae. Here she experienced a little pain, but only recently. One to the right of the third and fourth dorsal vertebrae. Here she experienced a little pain, but only recently. Another spot was on the second and third lumbar vertebrae. Here she always experienced discomfort during her period. This is a fairly typical case in regards to the shape of the discolored part of the aura. It seems curious that a part of the aura that has a changed shape should be rectangular and have an edge so straight. Several similar cases have been seen. Sometimes, however, there is a change, consisting either of an irregularity of the edges, or otherwise so that the edges follow the contour of the abdomen. It would be superfluous to go into the details of the case of an unmarried woman in her twenties brought up by Dr. Merrick, as it is so similar to the previous case. However, it can be noted that when she was examined with the SS strip, then in the area of the aura that seemed to be affected, then it was almost identical to the area of the aura of the previous case, but there was one very important difference, since the color was lighter, not darker, than in the rest of the strip. Based on our previous statement that light spots were usually temporary, we were of the opinion that this patient's illness was only minor and were pleased that our diagnosis was correct. We deliberately did not investigate the case in the usual manner as was done by Dr. Merrick. Here we have two instructive cases where the CC stripe gave a diametrically opposite color, although the observation point was in the same part of the body. The reason for this difference is certainly difficult to establish, 
but it must be assumed that there was some change in the auras of the two patients, too weak for normal perception, which could affect the range of the CC band, and the only assumption we can make is that the change was in color. As explained in Chapter 4. In the latter case, whatever the illness, it is likely that the patient had severe nervous stress at work, and it is very likely that his nervous disorder was fully functional. In the first case, there was chronic gastritis with corresponding tissue changes. Another case, interesting to compare with these two, is that of a young woman under 20 years of age. She was slightly anemic, suffered from constant illness, and vomited immediately after eating. She also suffered from heartburn. She considered herself pregnant, which, unfortunately, turned out to be correct. When viewed with a transverse CC band, there was no color change in either the epigastric or hypochondrium regions. This indicated that a structural change in the stomach was unlikely. When the strip was used vertically, the color of the lower abdomen did not change. This would be expected from a woman halfway between two monthly periods, or from a woman suffering from amenorrhea, or from a woman in early pregnancy. When her back was examined in the same way, the SS strip, used vertically, turned out to be uniform all the way down. This fact will be mentioned later. Since this woman was a foreigner, she returned home and was confident of pregnancy. Instead of discoloration found on the left side, it can be found above the right hypochondrium. Here, the hue change can be either too light or too dark. The spot in this place most often has the median line of the body as its inner edge. Its upper edge is flush with the line of the sternum, while its lower edge is approximately at the level of the costal plane. These boundaries are only approximate, and deviations from them are not uncommon. When a discolored area is visible in this position, it invariably indicates liver tenderness, often associated with superficial hyperesthesia. As a rule, the condition of the gastrointestinal tract is more or less disturbed, and in two cases we strongly suspected a duodenal ulcer. Another place where discoloration, light or dark, is very common, most often the latter, is in the groin area. It's strange to say that we only saw this once in both groins left and right at the same time. Color changes can be very slight and subtle, or they can be significant and easily noticeable. Fields of spots rarely have clear outlines and, as a rule, gradually become shaded, turning into the main color of the strip. Spots indicate that the patient is sore and often in pain in these areas, while the darker the shade, the more intense the pain can be. It should be borne in mind that soreness in the groin is not always accompanied by a color change in the CC band. In addition, these spots often appear when the patient has no changes in the aura in other parts. For example, we should refer our readers to cases 34 and 13. Instead of these large discolored areas, only small ones can be seen. In this case, the spots usually indicate that the lesion causing the change in hue in the aura is completely local and often reveals a situation in which pain occurs, which may be accompanied by increased sensitivity. One striking example of the accuracy of the above observation is seen in the following incident. Dr. Merrick wished to see the aura in this case and brought his patient for examination. Knowing that the patient was suffering from a gastric ulcer, we stated that it was highly likely that the CC band could detect either the most painful site or the position of the ulcer. No questions were asked. Dr. Merrick could see the aura quite clearly, but not a discolored spot, as he was not used to using the CC stripe, and therefore could not hold it in the right place, since, as practice shows, the colored CC stripe must hold onto a limited plot. Case 33. T, a married woman in her 30s, suffered from a stomach ulcer for a long time. She was already in the hospital, and she was recommended to RICO for treatment, for surgery. She is severely emaciated and anemic due to constant vomiting of blood. The examination showed that her aura is well-defined, bluish-gray in color without any admixture of abnormality. On examination with the CC strip, a macula was found, slightly larger than a shilling, 
on the left side approximately 7 cm from the midline, slightly below the level of the intestinal cartilage. This spot coincided with the most painful spot on the body, so that the patient could hardly bear to touch it. The entire epigastric region was very sensitive, but not to the same extent. Further examination could not be done. This case presents two interesting features. Firstly, the stain not only took on a different shade of the CC stripe, but completely changed its color. Whatever its origin, we see it as an example of a colored ray emanating from the body. See Chapter 4. The second is that there was not a large discolored area as one might expect. In March 1910, she was examined again. She was not in the hospital as recommended, but gained significant weight, gaining weight, but was still anemic. Now she has very little pain and only a slight soreness in the epigastrium. The vomiting has stopped, although she takes the usual solid food. For more than a year, there was no return of vomiting with blood. However, she complains of pain in the lower part of the right hypochondrium, where soreness is also observed. When she stood facing the observer, her outer aura extended 23 centimeters around her head, and when her arms were raised equally at the sides of her torso, the aura gradually narrowed until it reached its smallest width of 10 cm at the bottom of the thighs, from where it continued downward with a uniform width. The inner aura was 7 cm wide throughout the body. When viewed through a dark carmine screen in the area from about the level of the nipple to the very crest of the ilium on the left side, the aura was granular, very coarse, and if it was on the side, the granules could be seen. Occupying the same space on the ribcage that looked light when the SS strip was draped over it. Moreover, in the lower part of the right hypochondrium there was a granular spot of the aura. As soon as the patient turned on his side, it was seen that the aura extended 10 centimeters down the entire front of the body, and in the widest part at the back by 18 centimeters. On the CC band, a lighter spot was visible on the left side of the chest, starting from the midline of the body, with the upper edge at the level of the nipples, and the lower edge following the contour of the costal cartilage. This bright space was even brighter, exactly coinciding with the yellow spot seen during her first examination. There was also a small spot on the right, where the aura was grainy. The CC band showed a lighter spot on the left side of the chest, starting from the midline of the body, with the upper edge at the level of the nipples, and the lower edge following the contour of the costal cartilage. This bright space was even brighter, exactly coinciding with the yellow spot seen during her first examination. There was also a small spot on the right, where the aura was grainy. The CC band showed a lighter spot on the left side of the chest, starting from the midline of the body, with the upper edge at the level of the nipples, and the lower edge following the contour of the costal cartilage. This bright space was even brighter, exactly coinciding with the yellow spot seen during her first examination. There was also a small spot on the right, where the aura was grainy. Below is another example of how a small discolored spot was observed exactly where pain existed in a woman who complained of pain in her right breast. In this place, a malignant tumor was found and subsequently removed. During the examination, she said that she felt pain in her back, but did not say which part. When she turned around, the SS stripe immediately showed a light, almost round, coin-sized spot above the lower corner of the shoulder blade on the left side. It was here, and nowhere else, that pain existed. Since this spot was light in color, it was predicted that the pain in this spot would not last long, judging by the color. In a few days this pain completely disappeared. We have nothing more to say about the application of the CC band on the right breast, as we have not seen sufficient cases from which any conclusions can be drawn. When considering the shape of the aura in poor health, it was noted that in cases of hysteria, the external aura takes on a characteristic shape very different from that found in neurotic people, while the internal aura remains unchanged. Because of its great constancy, this unusual shape aura can at first glance be taken as evidence of illness. When examining the CC strip, 
Discolored areas are found in different parts of the body, more often light than dark. An exception should be made in the three cases mentioned below. In each case of hysteria studied, we found a discolored spot in one or more of the following places, groin, usually on the left, sacrum, vertebral column near the lower dorsal vertebrae. These spots are usually darker than the main part of the CC stripe, but they are by no means a sign of hysteria as they are constantly found in other patients. The most common areas of light spots are in front of the abdominal cavity and lower chest, as well as in the back on any part of the spine, also near, but not touching it. In the latter situation, they are invariably one-sided. In short, it can be said that although the CC band can provide a lot of information about a clinical case, it does not show any diagnostic signs of hysteria. Moreover, this streak sometimes does not cause any changes when they seem to be expected. The next case is typical for a hysterical aura. In the latter situation, they are invariably one-sided. In short, it can be said that although the CC band can provide a lot of information about a clinical case, it does not show any diagnostic signs of hysteria. Moreover, this streak sometimes does not cause any changes when they seem to be expected. The next case is typical for a hysterical aura. In the latter situation, they are invariably one-sided. In short, it can be said that although the CC band can provide a lot of information about a clinical case, it does not show any diagnostic signs of hysteria. Moreover, this streak sometimes does not cause any changes when they seem to be expected. The next case is typical for a hysterical aura. Case 34 c 20 years of age married woman with three children she was delicate all her life and prior to her marriage her family considered her a hysterical person in august 1909 she was thin anemic very nervous and weak and in a few days she had to go to the convalescent home her aura was well defined she was a blue tint with a little gray when she stood facing the observer the aura was about 23 centimeters wide around her head and to the side of her torso. Its aura contracted sharply below the level of the pubis and its width did not exceed 5 centimeters. Faint rays emanated from each shoulder, also one leaned up and out from the left side at the waist, while on the right side there was a slight patch running parallel to the body. When she turned sideways, the aura in front was about 7 centimeters wide but compressed to 6 centimeters down the limbs. Behind, the aura was 5 centimeters wide from the shoulders, protruded to 13 centimeters in the lower back, and then narrowed to 5 centimeters in the most noticeable part of the buttocks, from where the aura continued down unchanged. There was a very clear, but curious ray, apparently emanating from the navel, going up and out, this ray crossed the entire visible aura and went into space at least 23 centimeters in length. When the patient was viewed from the front with the CC strip, the color of the aura was uniform until it reached halfway between the navel and the pubis, where it became darker as it went down. This darkening of color was due to the fact that she was having her menstrual period. When the strip was used across, there was a darker patch on the left iliac region starting about 3 centimeters from the midline of the body. No other spot showed any color change. The extension on the right side at the waist level was a regular color, while the left side was darker and had a peculiar brown tint, impossible to describe. As expected, the patient experienced slight pain on the left side, just above the inguinal ligament, and even more painful on the right side. It was curious. When her back was examined with the CC strip, three distinct areas were visible along the spinal column, lighter in color than the main portion of the CC strip. The upper spot was located above the seventh cervical vertebra, its length was about 3 centimeters, the second spot was about 5 centimeters in length above the lower dorsal vertebrae, and the third spot was above the sacrum, about the same size. The spots on the dorsal vertebrae were painful, but not as tender as on both sides. The sensitive part was exactly in the area of the bright area, as it was seen on the CC band. 
The sacrum spot was also painful and the patient was in constant pain. The cervical spot was the most interesting, as the woman said, she had no pain or complaints in this place, after which her mother immediately exclaimed, why is this where you always complain of pain? The answer was, she has been free of pain and complaints lately, and she thought this was the right thing. This case was noticed at the time when we tried to carry out experiments to separate the outer from the inner aura, which was only partially successful. If we made these observations a little later, the light area on the right side, which lies parallel to the body, would most likely be a granular state of the inner aura. It is interesting to note that although the aura on the sides of the body was quite typical of hysteria, it was not as white at the back and front as usual for this complaint. There was more blue in the aura than you might expect. Why the CC stripe should show a dark spot above the left iliac region, where pain and tenderness were less than on the right, while there was no color change in the last position, is a question that cannot be resolved at present. However, the following explanation is a likely solution. The patient experienced pain and complaints in the left groin for a much longer time than in the right, so there was a noticeable change in the aura that made him lasting, while the pain on the right side did not last long enough. The main objection to this assumption is that hue changes often appear even when the duration of pain is very short. The light area visible on the neck is an example of nerve pain. A hysterical aura occurs in women and girls who are hyper-emotional, even if they have not had a severe outbreak. So in most cases, she can be seen as a product of temperament, and therefore, it is extremely unlikely at any time in her life to adopt the type that is seen around ordinary women. It is quite reasonable to assume that the auras of neurasthenics take on a form that is closely related in character and form to that which is perceived in hysteria. However, this does not seem to apply to a person who has had a nervous breakdown due to excessive stress of the mind, if in the previous case there was no tendency to excessive emotions. In some, and perhaps in most cases, the aura will retain its natural shape. The following case is a very vivid illustration of this. Sometimes, however, this attachment leads to a change, and case 21 is a very good example of a woman having an uneven outer aura without a corresponding change in the inner aura, neither in size nor in shape. Case 35, S. K.H., a young lady of 25 years old. When she was between 18 and 19 years old, she began visiting a disabled relative for 18 months, during which she did not have a single good night, although she worked hard all day. The consequence of this was that after the death of her relatives, she had a nervous breakdown. Before that incident, she was an unusually bright girl, but then she became nondescript. By nature, she had a friendly disposition, and, fortunately, this part of her character has not changed. Outwardly, she was a well-formed woman, but she had an undeveloped uterus and she menstruated only three times in her life. She underwent some internal surgery, the nature of which could not be determined. Around her eyes, the skin is deeply pigmented, a deep purple hue, at a short distance, two black eyes are visible. When we first saw her, she was suffering from functional hemiplegia on the right side, with almost complete loss of sensation from the collarbone downward, and she managed to walk only a few steps without the aid of a stick. As a result of the treatment, she soon regained her limbs, and their sensation gradually became natural. One of the features of her case was that the affected thigh was almost 5 centimeters larger in circumference than the healthy one, the leg was also larger, but not to the same extent. This enlargement disappeared a few months after her recovery, when both of her lower limbs were symmetrical. A year later, she had a slight relapse, but it did not last long. During her illness, she always sought to recover and did her best to help, and never showed signs of excessive despondency. She looked pretty good in January 1909, save for a little indigestion and weak mental retardation. However, she stated that she had pain in her right abdomen and lower back. On examination, she showed an aura much larger than average. It was well noted, the color of the aura is gray-blue. 
It stretched 25 centimeters at its widest part and descended from the head to the lower third of the legs, before finally contracting almost in the shape of an egg. On her ankles, the aura was about 5 centimeters wide. There were rays, two in number, emanating from her waist at right angles, one on either side, but they did not reach the outer limit of the aura. When she turned sideways, the aura in front was about 7 centimeters wide, tapering very slightly down the thighs and legs. Behind the aura was about 5 centimeters at the shoulders, in the lumbar regions it was 10 centimeters, and it reached the lower thighs before the aura contracted in full, being 5 centimeters wide there. Irregular skin pigmentation made the CC test almost useless. However, two well-marked areas could be seen, one in the front and one in the back. The first was a dark spot above the right hypochondrium with the upper marginal level in the center of the xiphoid cartilage, while the lower one followed the contour of the costal cartilage. This place was sensitive for the patient. The spot on the back was on the last dorsal and first lumbar vertebrae, which were also painful. One at the front and one at the back. The first was a dark spot above the right hypochondrium with the upper marginal level in the center of the xiphoid cartilage, while the lower one followed the contour of the costal cartilage. This place was sensitive for the patient. The spot on the back was on the last dorsal and first lumbar vertebrae, which were also painful. One at the front and one at the back. The first was a dark spot above the right hypochondrium with the upper marginal level in the center of the xiphoid cartilage, while the lower one followed the contour of the costal cartilage. This place was sensitive for the patient. The spot on the back was on the last dorsal and first lumbar vertebrae, which were also painful. Another interesting form of aura to consider. This is the case that could almost be foreseen, and it is characteristic of hemiplegia. Unfortunately, we were only able to check two or three cases, so we cannot say too much about them, as it is very likely that there could be many minor changes. Nevertheless, the following description is typical of the auras that we have considered. Case 36, Fig. 28. B. A very tall, thin man, 56 years old, was paralyzed for 31 years. Paralysis was an extension of a particular disease. His right arm is slightly injured, but he is able to carry out his job as an upholsterer, albeit with difficulty, due to this weakness, which is exacerbated by poor eyesight. His right leg is the most affected limb and is shorter in length than the left, so his walking is difficult. He is completely blind in one eye from neuritis, and the other suffers greatly for the same reason. He is currently in good general health. He is married and his children show no signs of a hereditary disease. Fig. 28. Aura of a man. Narrower on the left side near the head and on the right side near the body. Fig 28. It was first examined in 1908 and then again in 1910. The two observations closely matched, but the auras could be separated. When he stood facing the observer, the inner aura was the same width on both sides, about 7 centimeters, but there was a big difference in texture, since it was more clearly aligned on the left than on the right side of the body. At first glance, it looked as if the aura was ending, but this illusion arose due to the fact that it was dimmer than the body on the corresponding parts of the opposite side. The aura was most affected on the right side of the head, where it was 5 centimeters wider than the shoulder, and on the left by 10 centimeters. When he put his hands behind his neck, his aura was only 9 centimeters wide down on the right side against 10 centimeters on the left. The color of the aura was gray. Examining it with an SS strip, the shade was uniform throughout the body, except for one on the right side of the head, where there were many shades lighter than the left. We've hardly ever seen such a color difference on both sides. In this case, we think that the change in the aura does not occur under the influence of the motor nerves, but because of the changes usually accompanying this complaint. Since chest diseases account for a significant proportion of cases observed in everyday practice, they can be expected to be a good field for studying the aura. As we speak, 
it may seem odd that chest complaints did not help much in our aura studies. There are several reasons for this. One of the very important is that when a patient, suffering from an acute illness, he had to stay in bed if necessary. For obvious reasons, in addition to the complexity of the background and the location of the light, etc., in most of these cases it would be undesirable, if not completely wrong, to disturb the patients with the examination, which of necessity must be lengthy and tedious. While in our current state knowledge benefits would be very illusory. Chronic cases that can be examined without problems will show changes in the aura, but none of them have diagnostic value. Although the study of the aura of these patients is very interesting, we nevertheless preferred to turn our attention to others who, we thought, were more likely to give results that could be useful for diagnosis. One of the goals of our study was to use the aura as a diagnostic tool. We will, however, provide one or two cases below that will give an idea of what changes can be found. The next example is very interesting. One of the goals of our study was to use the aura as a diagnostic tool. We will, however, provide one or two cases below that will give an idea of what changes can be found. The next example is very interesting. One of the goals of our study was to use the aura as a diagnostic tool. We will, however, provide one or two cases below that will give an idea of what changes can be found. The next example is very interesting. Case 37. T, 43 years old, a married woman, complained that one day, when she got out of bed with a cough, she saw some blood. Although very thorough research has been done, we have not been able to find it organic. Two days later, her aura was examined before a routine medical examination by auscultation, etc. The aura was of the usual shape and size for a woman of her age, and her aura did not show any abnormalities until the CC band was used on her chest. Immediately, a bright spot the size of a coin was visible on the left side, in the second intercostal space and about 2 centimeters from the sternum. As soon as a stethoscope was placed over this place, a strong crepitus could be heard deep in the chest, and we believe that this was where the blood was coming from. Even if we didn't see this bright spot on the CC band, we don't think we should have missed this inflamed area, and believe that this discolored spot was caused by local inflammation and that the CC band would not show any changes. If it had been used two days ago, immediately after hemoptysis, this was the only part of the lung in which we could detect disease. Of all the chest complaints, the only benefit or a review can help is in onset tuberculosis, but we do not currently have any special cases to put forward the evidence, and in fact we were disappointed with the cases that were reviewed. Of course, with bronchitis or emphysema, when all the lungs are affected, one cannot expect only local changes in the aura, but if there were any changes in the aura, they would be the same throughout the chest, and any slight changes that might be present would be too subtle to distinguish. The following case can be taken as a typical example, and it shows how little can be learned at the present time from the state of the aura with complaints about the chest. Case 38. BL, 60 years old. For many years she suffered from asthma and emphysema with rare bronchitis, and she also suffered two or three bouts of pulmonary pneumonia. On examination, there was nothing unusual about the shape of the aura. But in the lower part of the chest, the internal aura was fine-grained, although gross linearization could be seen. The left side was more affected than the right, but this was due to the fact that recently she had been suffering from an attack of bronchitis, which, as always, affected the left side more than the right. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The limitations of the aura as a diagnostic tool are great and are amplified due to a lack of knowledge about its origin, so that all our work was conditional, and reasoning did not help us to say for sure in which cases the study of the aura could be useful. However, hints can be obtained from the examples already given. We do not currently know which body tissues generate and control auric forces. One thing is certain, the nervous system has a very large effect on the aura. One proof of this is willpower. The 
very fact that by an effort of will it is possible to achieve an extension or shortening of the rays emitted from the fingertips has already been mentioned above and can be demonstrated at any time. Mesmerists, who naturally have a strong will and are dedicated to developing this ability, can modify their aura, through which they can influence other people, subordinating them to their willpower, is further evidence that the will can and does control the aura. Temperament, or the totality of an individual's mental and physical powers, can be noted as an aura modifier, and it is obvious that this modification is more extensive when the subject's mental powers are great. This applies not only to the area of the aura, but also to its substance, which is illustrated by the aura of dull people who have a more gray color of the aura and the corresponding roughness of its consistency. The changes caused by will and temperament are purely physiological effects. Since will and reason are high attributes of the brain and are capable of influencing the aura as a whole, one can, of course, expect that any violation of the organ of the head will somehow change the aura. Most likely, there is a change in the entire aura, but these changes are so subtle in nature that they are invisible to our senses, nevertheless, we are able to detect gross changes. The apparent gross changes can be so bizarre that even the most resourceful person cannot anticipate them. For example, a hysterical aura. And the more we reflect on it, the more incomprehensible it seems to us. Among women, the oval shape, fig. 11, of the external aura is obviously the highest form, and the more the aura approaches this form, the more perfect it is. The main feature of the hysterical aura is that it is disproportionately wide at the sides of the torso and in the lumbar regions at the back, as well as in the width of the hips and legs. The botanical term spatula can be used to describe this aura when looking at the patient facing the observer. We cannot say how this form arose, but we believe that it is possible that development was delayed below the torso, which retains an infantile form, because this type, together with the adult female aura around the head and body, will give the special shape observed in hysteria. Another confirmation of this point of view is the fact that the aura bulges out in the lumbar regions, but contracts at the same level as on the sides. In our current state of knowledge, it is useless to speculate why this particular configuration occurs in hysterical women. The only other practical question that needs to be resolved is whether an aura, if it is of normal shape, can change to the above type. We personally feel that this is extremely unlikely, since we have never seen a single case in a transitional state, not a single case that would lead us to assume that such a change could take place. It is curious that in cases where this form of aura arises, there has never been any change in the shape or size of the internal aura, although there are often local changes in the substance, perhaps in a greater variety of situations than any other single disease. In epilepsy, there is a completely different change in the aura. Here, by far, both parts of the aura are most affected, as in hysteria. The outer and inner auras will be seen accordingly altered, as they diminish unilaterally to a much greater extent on the side of the head than below. We cannot give any explanation as to why this decrease should take place, and we still cannot understand why the left side of the aura is usually affected, we ask our patients if, during the attack, one side was more affected than the other, or if the head was turned to one side. If the seizures were more severe on one side than on the other, then light could be shed on this issue. These questions did not provide satisfactory answers as, with one exception, everyone said they were too upset at the time to notice these symptoms. One girl's mother said that the child always showed more spasm on the right side, we saw that one of the patients was in a seizure, but neither side was more convulsive than the other, so there was no help with this method of investigation. When these aura changes are considered, they seem to confirm our previous assumption that the forces that generate external and internal auras are different, since the latter never seem abnormal over a large space without some change in the former. On the other hand, the outer aura can be changed, but the inner aura remains unchanged. There is not the slightest doubt that the aura is affected locally when there is some kind of local nerve disorder, but whether the change is a direct consequence of a nervous disorder, similar to a functional disorder of an organ, 
or whether it is an affected organ causing a change in the aura is currently unclear. Most likely, both could be the cause, and in many cases they both are related to each other. One fact stands out, namely that local indignation affects the internal aura with a much higher frequency than the external one, and when the latter is affected by the former, it rarely avoids the disorder. Cases 23, 24, 25 are cases where the external aura has become locally altered. This is the opposite of what usually happens when all or most of the side of the aura is affected. A case of neuralgia can be taken as an example of the way the nervous system primarily affects the aura. Case 21 is a very good example. When he was seen at the end of 1909, it was noticed that the entire internal aura adjacent to the painful parts had been changed, as it had lost all streakiness and acquired a rough grainy appearance. The outer aura also showed signs of distress, as the distal portion was less clearly visible than usual, giving it the aspect of losing some of its substance, as one might argue otherwise. The auric force was not so great, the patient seemed to be healthy, but at the same time there were no changes in his general character. If the power were even less, the aura would be less than usual. This was the condition of the aura first seen in 1908, and obviously, in an acute case of neuralgia, a 13-year-old girl had a 5 cm spot to the right of the third spinal vertebra, where she suddenly developed bouts of pain that often lasted for several hours. The most common time for the onset of pain was at night, sometimes just before she went to bed, or shortly thereafter, and at any time the pain would wake her up. There was no painful sensitivity in this place, and no reason was found to explain it. This condition was very difficult to treat for several weeks, but improved slightly when she developed appendicitis and immediately the pain disappeared and never came back. Her aura was examined and was found to be completely natural throughout her body, except for a small spot on the painful area, which became fine-grained. Only in the inner aura can any changes be detected, since the area of the affected aura had to be very small. The outer aura is unlikely to show any change, as the surrounding healthy part must have overshadowed everything that happened. In this case, the blue CC stripe showed a dark spot, while in the latter case, the affected aura produced a lighter shade. The person suffering from sciatica found similar changes in the aura throughout the thigh. When a nervous disorder causes a local organic tissue change, it is likely that the modification that occurs in the adjacent aura is due in part to the nerves and in part to the diseased tissue, but it is almost impossible to determine the proportion that depends on each of them. Shingles is a very good example of these combined causes leading to noticeable and interesting changes in auras, but so much has been said about these changes that the reader is referred to cases 24, 25, and 28. Since these cases show that the nervous system causes changes in the aura, both with and without corresponding changes in local tissues, it can be assumed that the change may be entirely due to the influence of the nervous system, and that the altered tissue has nothing to do with its occurrence. The only way to refute this hypothesis is to find a case when changes occur in the aura that cannot be attributed to the action of the nervous system. Fortunately, we have three noted cases where it was highly unlikely that any nerve agent could be present. All of these cases are breast tumors, two fibroadenoids, and other cystic diseases. There was no pain in any of them, and they were only discovered by accident. In no case could any change in the external aura be detected, but each incident disturbed the internal aura. With the fibroadenoid disease, we saw in the inner aura a semblance of a small ray, no more than 4 centimeters long, making up slightly more than half the width of the inner aura. This beam was finely granulated. When viewed with the blue CC stripe, this spot appeared lighter than the rest of the stripe, especially due to color fading. With the yellow CC stripe, this spot was darker. The second case of fibroadenoid disease was almost identical. The remaining case was also very similar, as only the inner aura affected its entire width, and the change consisted of a coarse granular state covering the normal aura just above the tumor. When this spot was examined with the blue CC stripe, it was lighter compared to the general tone, 
and when viewed with the yellow CC stripe, it was darker. From the above remarks, it can be taken for granted that although the nervous system has very great, possibly predominant, control over auras, other tissues, when in an unhealthy state, also affect them. In connection with this subject, it will be interesting to compare case 83 with case 81. In the first case, the patient had a stomach ulcer, as a result of which part of the CC band was changed in front of him, in addition to the fact that there was a good space around, this place will be lighter than the rest of the strip. Also, both auras were roughly grainy in the stomach area. It should be noted that there was no change in the shade of the streak at the dorsal vertebrae. In the latter case, although the woman suffered from constant vomiting, there was still only a slight grainy appearance of auras in the stomach area, and the CC band did not show any color changes in the front of the body. But there was a narrow band at the back lying close to the spine with the left side, from the third to the ninth dorsal vertebra, which was clearly lighter than the rest of the stripe, and had well-defined margins. In the first of these cases, it looked as if the affected organ was almost entirely the factor causing the changes in the auras, while in the latter case, indigestion only slightly affected the auras, but the main change in the streak was due to the nervous system. While it seems to be fairly certain that some diseased organs do indeed produce some kind of change in auras, there are still times when we have looked for it without any success. Two or three cases of kidney disease were examined, but none of them showed any changes in aura. One of these patients suffered from this complaint for many years, and the examination took place shortly before he became a hemiplegic patient with a fatal result. It is possible that the reason why the auras showed no change in these cases is that the depth of the healthy tissue cancelled the influence of the diseased organ, as well as the fact that the change in the kidney is more a degeneration of the passive than the active type. Human Atmosphere Chapter 7 Aura During Pregnancy Chapter 7 Aura During Pregnancy It often happens that the patient asks the doctor if she has missed one or two months of pregnancy. The answer that doctors usually give, wait a little, is not always acceptable. The difficulties in arriving at the correct conclusion at a very early stage of pregnancy are very great, so any new method that can help in diagnosis will undoubtedly be appreciated. It should be understood that alone, not a single sign of pregnancy can be mistaken for absolutely correct, but when several signs indicate the same phenomenon, the likelihood of a correct diagnosis increases many times over. There are three hallmarks of pregnancy associated with some change in the aura, two were found by examination with the CC band, and the third was a slight change in the shape of the aura and its structure. Such a diagnosis will be considered correct. When examining a woman in the early stages of pregnancy, it is first of all recommended to find out whether her aura has a normal shape and size, not only on the sides, but also in front and behind. In almost all pregnancies we have investigated, the external aura in front of the patient appears to be wider than normal in general, but never exceeds normal. It is currently impossible to tell if there is any absolute increase in the aura, or if it is an illusion of its increase due to the tendency of the aura to be slightly altered in structure. Regardless of whether this is the case or not, there is usually some slight increase in the external aura in the very lower abdomen when the patient stands sideways to the viewer. In addition, if the patient has not turned around so much, but enough to allow the contour of the breast and nipple to appear against a black background, the aura in this place may also be slightly enlarged. At the same time, in both of these places, the inner aura will appear denser and brighter, creating a grainy looking effect. This is especially noticeable in front of the nipples, where it is more noticeable than around other parts of the breast. A small ray sometimes forms in this place. One of the most important facts to remember is that the inner aura is not grainy but remains striated. This line shows that no pathological action occurs, but only an increase in the physiological action is observed. After the patient has tested her aura directly, a color test should be started. To do this, it must face the viewer when the SS strip is used vertically. In this case, 
a uniform color will be perceived along the entire length of the CC strip, even if it is pregnant and in good health. But you need to pay special attention to the color of the aura in the lower abdomen near the pubis. The full significance of this test is that the patient does not show any signs that the act of menstruation has been interrupted. When the CC stripe is used across the breast, the color in women who are not pregnant or who are not breastfeeding or suffering from mammary glands is naturally even, except for the areola and nipples, not only on the breast itself, but also on adjacent body parts. During pregnancy and lactation, there is usually a CC band on the chest, which has a lighter shade. The lighter shade is due to a change in the aura similar to that discussed in Chapter 6. This change in hue is meaningless in itself, but is a good confirmation of the change that has taken place in the aura surrounding the breast. When the transverse CC band is targeted to the epigastric and hypogastric regions, discoloration will not occur, although the patient may suffer from nausea and vomiting indicating that gastric disturbances are not as dependent on local disturbance as some nervous influence. Case 31 is a similar case where stomach problems were associated with pregnancy. If the patient has previously suffered from gastric lesions, this statement, of course, cannot remain valid. No other help can be obtained from CC bands when used on the front of the body. It has been mentioned that in a large number of women, a more or less patch can be seen on the lumbosacral back, resulting in the shade of the CC stripe becoming darker than the remainder. This was primarily associated with sexual functions, and directly with the kind of granular state of the aura. It is strange to say that in no case of pregnancy have we seen the aura be grainy and hence the darker spot has disappeared. We believe that the presence of this dark spot is putative proof of pregnancy. The absence in a woman known to have this discolored spot, or if she has a habit of suffering from significant back pain during her menstrual cycle, is a very important, if not absolute, sign of pregnancy. When the CC stripe is used in the lower abdomen, when the patient is standing to the side, the color may be different. When this is the case, the front is likely to be lighter in shadow, which confirms the change in aura in this section as discussed above. To summarize, we can say that the signs of early pregnancy shown by the aura are as follows. 1. A slight increase in the external aura in the lower abdomen and in front of the chest. 2. The inner aura increases, but remains striated. 3. The CC band shows no discoloration in the lower abdomen. 4. No discoloration over the stomach, even if nausea is present. CC stripes are often more transparent on the chest. 5. Absence of a dark spot on the lumbosacral region. The following two clinical cases are illustrative of this topic. Case 39. LK, at the age of 20. She has been married for almost two years and is hoping she can be pregnant as she missed one period and is currently almost the second. When viewed, when she was facing the observer, her external aura was 25 centimeters wide around the head and torso, then gradually diminishing to 13 centimeters at the ankles. The inner aura was 8 centimeters wide throughout the body. When she turned sideways to the observer, the outer aura at the back was 10 centimeters wider, expanding to 15 centimeters at the lower back. In front, in general, the aura was about 10 centimeters wide downwards, but in front of the chest there was a slight increase and a slight bulge in the lower abdomen. In these two places, the inner aura looked coarse and therefore more distinct, but it was striped. When the SS band was used on this part of the body, the lengthening of the aura in front was more transparent than in the back. When she turned to face the viewer again, the SS stripe, when used vertically, was completely in front, except for the small parts on the chest. When used transversely over the chest, they were lighter in color than the adjacent parts. There was no change in the shade of the stomach. When examining the back, the color of the aura did not change in any place. The lessons to be learned from this case are, firstly, that the woman did not have any signs of impending menstruation. 
Then the aura revealed the fact that physiological activity was taking place in the chest and part of the abdomen, just above the pubes. There was no doubt that this was a case of pregnancy. When used transversely over the chest, they were lighter in color than the adjacent parts. There was no change in the shade of the stomach. When examining the back, the color of the aura did not change in any place. The lessons to be learned from this case are, firstly, that the woman did not have any signs of impending menstruation. Then the aura revealed the fact that physiological activity was taking place in the chest and part of the abdomen, just above the pubes. There was no doubt that this was a case of pregnancy. When used transversely over the chest, they were lighter in color than the adjacent parts. There was no change in the shade of the stomach. When examining the back, the color of the aura did not change in any place. The lessons to be learned from this case are, firstly, that the woman did not have any signs of impending menstruation. Then the aura revealed the fact that physiological activity was taking place in the chest and part of the abdomen, just above the pubes. There was no doubt that this was a case of pregnancy. That in the chest and part of the abdomen, just above the pubes, physiological activity took place. There was no doubt that this was a case of pregnancy. That in the chest and part of the abdomen, just above the pubes, physiological activity took place. There was no doubt that this was a case of pregnancy. Case 21, addition to the case described in Chapter B. In this case, the woman considered herself pregnant, having missed two monthly periods and being next to the third. However, there were no changes in the aura around her right breast and abdominal enlargement just above the pubis, and there was no discoloration at this location when the CC band was used. On the back there was a dark spot above the sacrum, as seen with the CC band. In this case, the only sign of pregnancy was the absence of discoloration of the CC band above the pubis. The diagnosis was made, pregnancy is out of the question, that menstruation will not occur within four or five days, but when it will occur it cannot be indicated. In fact, her period began seven days after the examination. As pregnancy progresses, the size of the aura in front of the mammary glands and the abdominal cavity increases, but not equally. The part of the aura adjacent to the chest does not increase to the extent corresponding to the front of the abdomen, and has a variable size. It is not only the outer aura that expands, but in many cases the inner aura also expands. Even when the inner aura has not increased, it will become more distinct than the adjacent parts, indicating that the mammary gland is ready to perform its special function. As a rule, it is not difficult to determine whether this aura has increased in front of the chest, because it is so easy to compare it with that of the neighboring parts above or below the body. Although the aura may appear fine-grained without the interference of the light screen, nevertheless, the screen with carmine will show a hidden kind of health. When the aura in front of the belly is examined after the woman reaches her fifth month of pregnancy, it will be seen that it has become wider than in earlier stages and may continue to increase until the baby is born. The auras of pregnant women after the fourth or fifth month can be divided into two classes, which, although they are not very different, have a difference that is by no means artificial. In one group, the aura is not as much increased as in the second, in addition, the shape is more correct and follows the contour of the body with greater accuracy. When a woman stands to the side of the observer, and the auras are differentiated into internal and external along the carmine screen, it is seen that the former is slightly enlarged and retains proportional to the width of the external aura throughout. In the second group, patients have their auras that are wider and more distinct in front of the most prominent part of the abdomen than in less convex areas, as a result of which the aura becomes conical and gives the impression that it is wider than in reality. When the two auras are separated, the inner part will also tend to become tapered, being slightly wider in front of the most prominent part of the abdomen, but not to the extent of the outer. This is a good example of how the inner aura grows and subsequently shrinks as it regains its natural size shortly after giving birth. When the CC strip is used, the entire breast, except for the nipple and areola, 
will usually appear lighter than adjacent body parts, regardless of whether the patient is facing the viewer or sideways. When using the CC strip to examine the chest or abdomen, the color of the aura is sometimes uniform, while in others it is darker. If the woman turns sideways to the observer, and the transverse CC strip is directed to the abdomen, then in the second group of cases, when the aura is conical, the extreme point of the convex abdomen is usually lighter, and the front side is lighter than on the back. In the first group of cases, the CC band is uniform. The pallor of the aura color on the chest and abdomen, associated with an increase in the internal aura, indicates that some change in the aura is very likely to have occurred. And this is additional evidence that a change in texture in the aura can cause sufficient changes in the CC band to change her shade. The following case is extremely interesting. Case 40, MRS. T, at the age of 30, was pregnant for the fourth time. On examination, she was six months pregnant. The story she told was that she felt very good all the time, but three weeks ago she woke up in a frightened house in the house. From that time on, all movements of the child stopped, and the abdomen became smaller, although before this incident the child's movements were quite strong. She was depressed, thinking that the child was dead. Examination of the aura from the sides and from behind showed its naturalness in all respects. In front, when she stood to the side of the observer, the internal aura was approximately 8 centimeters wide down the rib cage to the lower limbs, except that it was slightly more visible in front of the nipples. Before the protruding belly, the aura was about 6 centimeters wide. The outer aura was 9 centimeters wide down the entire body, with the exception of the front of the abdomen, where it was conical and about 20 centimeters wide. Our main focus was on the state of the inner aura. Above the sternum and down the thighs and legs, the aura was thinly striated, as is usual in a healthy person. The part of the aura in front of the lower third of the abdomen was distinctly grainy, rough, while in front of the upper two thirds it was roughly aligned, but the lines were not well marked. She was in a transitional state between a grainy aura and a striated aura. Thus, it can be seen that her aura was normal throughout her entire body, with the exception of the part in front of the abdomen where she was pathological. The CC stripe did not show anything out of the ordinary, but it might be worth noting that it was lighter on the left chest and darker on the right than the rest of the stripe, while the colors of the two extensions were even. The explanation for this effect turns out to be quite simple, because the shade of the left breast is common during pregnancy, while the right breast was distinctly pigmented and, being healthy enough, did not affect the aura outside the body, where she was pathological. The CC stripe did not show anything out of the ordinary, but it might be worth noting that it was lighter on the left chest and darker on the right than the rest of the stripe, while the colors of the two extensions were even. The explanation for this effect turns out to be quite simple, because the shade of the left breast is common during pregnancy, while the right breast was distinctly pigmented and, being healthy enough, did not affect the aura outside the body, where she was pathological. The CC stripe did not show anything out of the ordinary, but it might be worth noting that it was lighter on the left chest and darker on the right than the rest of the stripe, while the colors of the two extensions were even. The explanation for this effect turns out to be quite simple, because the shade of the left breast is common during pregnancy, while the right breast was distinctly pigmented and, being healthy enough, did not affect the aura outside the body. We believe that in this case, the diagnosis of the deceased child was justified. Subsequently, when the uterus was palpated, it turned out to be softer than usual at the sixth month of pregnancy. No signs of fetal heartbeat were found. Two months later, she had a miscarriage of a stillborn male baby. In conclusion, let us say that we know our shortcomings and hope that our readers will not notice them, since the topic of viewing the aura through screens is completely new. At the same time, many unforeseen difficulties arose and from time to time features were discovered that it was necessary to start observations again and again. We will be quite satisfied that our work was not wasted if science, 
especially with regard to medical diagnosis, could advance even one iota, and we sincerely hope that more competent researchers will take up this issue, since there is a vast field for useful research. Finally, we must thank our friends, some of them who have put themselves at great personal inconvenience, for their kind help. Human Atmosphere Appendix Application It has already been described above, see Chapter 3, that the flow of the aura emanating from the fingertips can be lengthened or shortened according to the wishes of the wearer. For some time we were going to investigate the question of the influence of willpower on the aura, but until recently we had no opportunity to do this. Some basic elements are required for successful experiments. This means that the patient must have a well-defined aura, both external and internal, must be in good health, must show a reasonable interest in the subject, must have a sufficiently strong will and the ability to concentrate his mind and perseverance. Case 41 Finally, an opportunity arose during the examination of a young woman G. 2. See Table 2 and Note, just under 20 years of age, who was late in development. Her case is interesting because of the rapid increase in her aura over 18 months. In the spring of 1909, when she was examined, her aura was 18 centimeters wide at the waist, and now it is 23 centimeters. She was menstruating and looked healthy. At the last check, her aura was very clear, healthy in shape and appearance, and even in brightness throughout her body, without any signs of rays, in short, ideal for our purpose. Before starting any experiment, we showed her how the aura emanating from the tip of one finger can be lengthened or shortened at will, and we asked her to try to influence her in this way. She succeeded almost immediately, so we asked her to try to do the same in different parts of her body, with which she agreed. The first site chosen was the iliac crest, as this was considered a very suitable site because we never saw a beam emanating from it, although in theory this was a suitable place for a beam. About half a minute after the start of the influence of her will, her inner aura looked brighter and gradually expanded outward and upward to the border of the outer aura. When the beam thus formed reached this point, she stopped desiring, and the beam quickly retreated. Because we have never seen a ray coming from it, although in theory it was a good spot for the ray. About half a minute after the start of the influence of her will, her inner aura looked brighter and gradually expanded outward and upward to the border of the outer aura. When the beam thus formed reached this point, she stopped desiring, and the beam quickly retreated. Because we have never seen a ray coming from it, although in theory it was a good spot for the ray. About half a minute after the start of the influence of her will, her inner aura looked brighter and gradually expanded outward and upward to the border of the outer aura. When the beam thus formed reached this point, she stopped desiring, and the beam quickly retreated. The next location chosen was the lowermost part of the ribcage, while it stood in the same position, namely, facing the observer. It is not unusual to see rays emanating directly from this location, and it is also one of the most common places for first-order rays or highlights. The result was hardly expected, since instead of a ray going outward, the entire internal aura from the sixth rib to the iliac crest became bright without any expansion. Two shoulders, first one and then the other, were the next two points chosen for the will radiation of the rays. There seemed to be no difficulty here since the rays manifested almost directly, taking a direction upward and outward. Now the patient turned sideways and began to want the beam to come out of the tip of her nose. In this she was completely successful, since it appeared almost immediately and stretched out to 18 to 20 centimeters. This ray even went beyond the outer border of the visible outer aura. When she was obviously tired, the experiment ended with a beam emitting from her breast nipple. It happened instantly, she began to show will, but at the same time, the entire inner aura in front of her chest became brighter. It has already been shown that the aura adjacent to the protrusions of the body is more susceptible to external influences due to the fact that the auric potential is greater on protruding points than on flat surfaces. For the same reason, 
It is only natural to assume that willpower will be able to exert its influence more easily and powerfully on the aura in front of the bulges of the body than anywhere else. The first experiments mentioned in combination with other similar experiments prove this to be the case. But, having come to this conclusion, one should not forget that focusing the mind on a given place to be influenced is much easier when this place is a separate part of the body than when it is in the middle of a large flat surface. In addition, during these experiments, we notice that when the patient is tired, the strength of concentration decreases, the effect on the aura decreases, and at the same time spreads over a larger area. In the example above, when the beam was about to emanate from the nipple, it was seen that the internal aura surrounding the breast was similarly affected, albeit to a lesser extent. If this effect were limited to a single instance, it could be assumed that fatigue was the cause, however, the experiment was repeated, always with the same result, although the patient was quite cheerful. This phenomenon is most likely due to the close physiological connection between the gland and the nipple, which prevents exposure to one person's mind without correspondingly altering the other. Once it was established that willpower could cause the inner aura to expand in the form of rays, it became natural to expect that color changes could be caused by the same means. This, if it could be done, we considered extremely important, since it provides a solution to the most difficult problem, and at the same time proves the truth of the theory previously put forward in Chapter 4, namely, that changes in the color of the aura were often the cause of the origin of lighter or dark spots in the CC bands. For this we hired a professional model posing for the artists. Case 42, D, a married woman of 28 years of age with two children, was examined in October 1910. At first, her aura was examined in the usual way. It was clear that her aura was blue-gray. When she stood facing the observer, the external aura around the head and torso was about 25 centimeters wide, but her aura sharply narrowed below the level of the pubis. Where it became only 10 centimeters wide dot the internal aura was 8 centimeters from the head and torso and slightly less on the sides of the lower half of the thighs and legs. When she turned sideways, the external aura was visible from the front 13 centimeters at the level of the trunk and 10 centimeters at the extremities, behind it was 10 centimeters at the shoulders, expanding from this point until it reached about 20 centimeters at the waist. Suddenly contracting just below the buttocks to about 10 centimeters, keeping this width down along the lower limbs. The inner aura was 8 centimeters wide from the head and body and slightly below. The CC stripe showed only one area on the sacrum that was slightly darker than the corresponding shade of the stripe. Otherwise, the color was even all over the body. The elongations of the band on the sides of the body were the same both in the standing position with raised arms and in the spaces between the body and arms. She was in excellent health, but, as you might guess, due to the shape of the aura, she had a hysterical temperament. Since she was not familiar with the process of the influence of the will on the aura, we considered it expedient to begin by trying to receive rays from different parts of the body. This she did without much difficulty, but since the experiments differed from the experiments in the latter case by only minor variations, they will not be indicated. However, it is worth mentioning that the first beam caused the longest time, while each successive beam was faster, until the last beam flashed almost instantaneously. Since she could easily see the aura, she could also perceive the rays quite clearly, sometimes even earlier than the observer. By this time, she turned out to be a conscientious student, capable of voluntarily trying to cause a change in the color of the aura. Since it would be useless to have just an abstract idea of color. Experiment 1. She stood facing the observer with her hands on her hips and elbows extended so that there was a space completely bounded by her torso and arms. It was suggested to her that the aura in the left space between the arm and the body should become the same color as the book cover. After about a minute, she said that she saw Aura change her hue, being scarlet, but could not make the same color as the book. After that, she indicated scarlet as the color that her Aura assumed. It seemed to the observer that this had happened. 
At first there was no change in the aura. Both sides were similar. Then there was some vague and indescribable change. Eventually the entire aura seemed to disappear, painting the space between the arm and the torso black. Then they appeared and disappeared in turn, two or three times, when the space turned gray-red, then bright red, instead of being at first gray-blue. Only the inner aura was affected. The part of it closest to the armpit was clearly redder and denser. The woman was asked to remain alert while the black background was changed to white so that the CC strip test could be performed. The right CC elongation remained exactly the same as observed before the experiments, but on the left side, the extension was much darker with blue and yellow CC stripes, while with red it was darker at first, and when the patient is a little tired, it it became brighter. To eliminate any errors due to uneven lighting, she turned her back to the observer. The blue and yellow CC stripes showed that the left extension was darker, while with the red CC stripe it was lighter. As far as possible, with the same tint that was felt in the first position. It is interesting to note that another observer, on another inspection, saw the disappearance and return of the aura in the same way as just described. Experiment 2 now she wanted the space next to the torso to be blue, which she did relatively easily. Blue had the darkest shade. Raising his arms and placing his hands behind his neck, the aura on the right side remained blue, while on the left side it still retained a red tint, even on the thigh and leg. Of course, it was a strange sight to see the haze of a red man on one side, and blue on the other. Experiment 3 while she was still standing with her hands up, she tried to get a yellow aura on the left side. She said that she could clearly see this color, but to the observer, the hue, although changed, did not become true yellow. The closest color we have is the darkest shade of Roman ochre. These color names were taken from the G. Brownie and Co. Color sample. Of the colors red, yellow, and blue, the latter is the easiest to understand, while yellow is the most difficult. Interestingly, these experiments, of course, we consider them only preliminary for the next important experiments, which, although not as effective, are more valuable. Our main goal was to get a colored ray coming from the described area, part of a large flat surface, and not from any projection of the body. Moreover, some other conditions are absolutely necessary for our purpose. Firstly, that the aura surrounding the ray should not be influenced at all, or at most very insignificantly. This means that the patient must be able to concentrate willpower on a very small spot. The second condition is that the beam must go outward at right angles to the body and go straight towards the observer. In all likelihood, this will cause the beam to be invisible in the usual way due to the skin creating a bad background. Finally, the patient can keep the beam unchanged long enough to be viewed with multiple CC strips. Since we were aware of all these difficulties, we were pleasantly surprised by the results of the first tests, which were in no small measure associated with the painstaking efforts of the patient, who was already beginning to lose her willpower from fatigue. Her ability to perceive colored rays was very helpful as she could tell us when to look for them. Experiment 4 For the first test, a small area was selected, half on the right breast and half above the breastbone, and she was asked to have a red aura at that location. After a minute, she said that she saw a red spot, while it was completely invisible to the observer. However, when viewed with the CC stripes, a dark spot could be seen when the yellow or blue stripe was used, and a light spot when the red CC stripe was used. Experiment 5 The next test was that a small area, not exceeding 3 cm in diameter, somewhere on the abdomen became red, only it should not determine the position of the spot. Directly she said that she can see the stained area. We examined the abdominal cavity with a blue CC stripe and almost immediately found a darker small spot, slightly above and to the left of the navel. We put our finger on it, the exact center of where she wanted the aura to turn red. Experiment 6 Then she tried to superimpose an aura on an unknown place on the chest, choosing yellow. 
As soon as she said she was ready, we looked for a spot with a blue SS stripe. Examination revealed a dark spot about 5 centimeters in diameter, not very well defined, on the upper half of the left breast, and we placed our finger in its center. The place we indicated almost coincided with the place she wanted, but not in the center, but on its edge, which amounted to a deviation of about 1 centimeter from the true center. The difference in color change was due to her fatigue, so more experiments of this kind were not possible. End.